What's up guys? It's your boy Omni Sensei. Welcome to Star Wars, Reborn as Anakin Skywalker, Part 10. Like, share, and comment on the video. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't subscribed. Remember to check out the original story, link in the description. With all that out of the way, let's get into it. I have you now. Mundi's eyes flash the Sith colors of yellow and red for a split second, before jumping towards Anakin and swinging his saber towards him, trying to take his head off presumably. Anakin dodges this strike and successfully pushes Mundi back. We are all alone now. What are you to do? Anakin asks, taunting the Jedi to see just how far Mundi may go. Now that we are alone, I am to finish you once and for all. Mundi exclaimed, having now the ability to actually try and take Anakin down. And how exactly are you going to do that? Are you unaware of your limits and my own as well? Anakin asks, for he truly started to question Mundi's mental capabilities. Limits. I knew it. Only the Sith deal in absolutes. To think you are infallible. Mundi exclaimed and seemed to be making a point. I think you have gone a bit crazy there. Anakin pointed out the obvious to Mundi. However, this only seemed to activate his anger even more so than before. I think not. Mundi replied, going in for a swing of his saber, intending to kill Anakin. But just like before, his saber is unable to make contact, and instead, Mundi is pushed back through a telekinetic force push. You will never be able to get me. Give up now? And you may be able to survive, unlike your friends you had brought along. Trying to kill me within my own home turf is kind of a bad idea, don't you think? Anakin asked after pushing Mundi back to further sow dissent within the Jedi Master. You are truly arrogant, aren't you? Mundi paused for a second to try and poke his own holes into Anakin. Arrogant? How so? Anakin asked a question of his own as the two started to slowly circle each other. Mundi is prepared to strike again, but it would seem like a dialogue with Anakin is more important to him for now. Maybe Mundi even believes that he could somehow take down or turn around the way Anakin thinks. What Anakin believes in or other such thoughts is Mundi may still have an inkling that Anakin may very well be the chosen one. Mundi never disputed this fact much. But that didn't mean he didn't have his doubts, especially now that Anakin is the way he is. Even after information brought to light by Qui-Gon before he left very recently as well, stating that the Chosen One may not even be someone that would destroy the Sith. The Chosen One is only someone meant to bring balance to the Force, and this could be achieved through many means. The first thing to do to have a balance, However, would be the destruction of the Jedi first, and then the destruction of the Jedi. With no Jedi and no Sith, there is only the two sides of the Force left over. I have studied your people, your Emperor, its culture and religion, Mundi said as he looked directly at Anakin as he said this. Mundi may not be a very emotional person, like at all, but he does have something he attests to above everything else. That is the Jedi Code along with the Jedi religion in general. And, what have you discovered? Anakin is intrigued as a perspective outside of the Emperor, regardless of whether it is from the Jedi or not, is something he is not too often exposed to. Discovered it's a revelation. What I have discovered is of the utmost importance, which the rest of the Jedi don't seem to have taken any interest in whatsoever. Mundi explained before continuing. They know of you and your academy using the dark arts, the dark side of the Force. The Jedi, even Grandmaster Yoda knows of this, and yet they still do nothing. Then there is your people, supposedly your people for their entire culture and religion heavily depends on you. Your economy and entire governmental structure, absolutely everything is under your control. And I dare say you are not too dissimilar to the Sith Lord, Darth Sidious. Not too dissimilar to Sidious. You are comparing me with Sheev Palpatine. Anakin questioned Monday. Mundi responded. Yes. You and he may be different, yet you are both the same as well. Your goals of taking over and controlling people is the same. Don't think I have been unable to come to a conclusion regarding your antics. Mundi seemed to have calmed down during this talking. However, this wouldn't last long for Kai Adi Mundi believed above all else that the Jedi are the only forces of good within the galaxy. Not that there aren't others within his mind, it is just that if there are those that are not buddy-buddy with the Jedi, 
then they would be considered enemies. Not that Mundy has any deep regard for those around him, as on more than one occasion he wouldn't mind sacrifices in the name of the greater good. In fact, the supposed death of his comrades may also come under the facet of Mundy's mentally, that the Jedi that came with him would die valiantly because they died for the Jedi. Even though Mundy's reasoning is different, specifically wanting to end Anakin, but that doesn't remove the fact that he is delusion in a sense. Being both so devoted, delusion, but also sociopathic in nature, it only makes sense. What is it that you saw? You believe me to be a Sith? Or do you think I am something else? Anakin asked, wanting to know more of what Mundy thought of him and his subsequent rule over his people. You are a tyrant. A tyrant over the minds of your people and those around you. Not only that, you are even worse than the Sith, for you are more powerful. Mundy answered, So being more powerful makes me more of a threat to who exactly? Anakin asked, I think that is enough talking. You are no god, no divine being. And you are most certainly not the chosen one. You have not brought balance, peace, or have even made any attempt to destroy the dark side of the Force. No attempt to curb the Sith in their tracks with your power where you won't even get involved with the current situation as well, Mundy said. Mundy continued, For this, I see you as a threat greater than the Sith, as not only your power is more, but so is your influence. Mundy was done, over with this conversation, but he did have one last thing to say. You are no god. Mundy leaped once again to exchange Anakin in a duel between a Jedi and someone that didn't really have a factional name to call himself as. You are wrong. Anakin is able to deflect the blows using his hands in on themselves. He negated the energy generated by the saber Mundy has and is easily able to absorb such energy. You, you are evil. Mundy tried his hardest to strike Anakin down, but no matter his attempt, everything is useless in the face of Anakin's power. Kai Adi Mundy was a Force-sensitive male Serian Jedi Master of the Jedi Order, who served on the High Council in the twilight years of the Galactic Republic, and played a major role in several battles during the Clone Wars. Born around 70 years ago, Mundy was discovered at age 4 by the Jedi Anyakuro and became one of the few permitted by the Jedi Order to be trained starting beyond infancy. After more than two decades as a Padawan to Master Yoda, Mundi was named a Jedi Knight and returned to Seria to liberate his home village from a gang of raiders. Assigned the Jedi Watchman of the Serian Sector, Mundi was granted a rare exception to the Jedi Order's ban on marriage. Due to his specious low birth rate, and had a polygamous family of five wives and seven children, although he tried to avoid developing emotional attachments to them, like many Serians of his generation, Mundy favored his homeworld's isolation from the galaxy, speaking out against off-worlder technology, and encouraging Seria to maintain their independence from the Republic. Mundy was held in high regard by members of the Jedi High Council, on which he occasionally sat in during the absence of Master Mikajiyat. He was eventually offered a permanent seat on the Council, despite not yet having obtained the rank of Jedi Master. Mundy could be described as a person of faith in the Jedi, the Jedi Code, and the light side of the Force. He is also someone with the least concern or care for life, his compassion being almost next to none. At least he is skilled and powerful in his own right, for he is a fierce opponent to face off against. Anakin can attest to this fact right at this instance, for Mundy is trying his hardest to try and take Anakin down. No matter if Mundy is right or wrong in the now, Anakin can still respect the determination, skill and effort Mundy has put into his craft. His lightsaber combat abilities are definitely above the norm, and so too is his ability to calculate things as well. He is definitely someone whom could be considered smart as well, even though his decision to come after Anakin now could also be considered emotional in nature. It most certainly isn't, but it is definitely fueled by something. Something within Mundy that he has been without for a long time. Yoda had finally made it to the hole, as it seemed like some of the ground is still open within the throne room. This is done on purpose and Anakin has set things up waiting for the right moment. Where is everyone? Yoda thought within his mind before deciding to trust his gut feelings and his feelings within the Force as well, that are guiding him somewhat towards the tunnel system underneath Sky Palace. Danger. I sense Yoda thought to himself as he started to actually see just where he is in contrast to other emotions or feelings he is also picking up on. Specifically, he is feeling himself in proximity to the location Anakin and Mundy is currently at. The energies within the Force were rampant, and it seemed as if something was being strained, pushed to the very limits, and Yoda decided that he should continue to make a move but this time faster than he was before. The Force had come to a standstill as if some major and grand moment is taking place. K-9 
Coming closer and closer, Yoda finally happened upon a scene that would shock him to the very core. He could not believe his very eyes. Anakin and Mundi stood there. Or more specifically Anakin stood over Mundi on his knees, kneeling before Anakin as Anakin had a lightsaber within his hand. More specifically he has Mundi's lightsaber within his hand, and it is currently raised above his head, starting a motion that seemed as if Anakin is going to chop off Mundi's head and sever it from his body. Reaching deep within the Force, Yoda started to push and pull, wanting to save his student from an inevitable death. But no matter what he did, he was unable to use the Force against Anakin. Not because he is powerless or anything like that, but because every time the energy field within the Force interacted with Anakin and his physical form, it would rebound. In slow motion, the lightsaber within Anakin's hand ignited severed Mundi's head from the rest of his body. Yoda closed his eyes, not daring to see something so tragic happen, as this was kind of something he didn't want to see. The look within Mundi's eyes were that of acceptance but also of cold resolution and the next second everything went up with a boom. Yoda also sensed this situation, for it started to tickle his own danger senses. He protected himself despite the situation, and instead Yoda wanted to know more about just what was going on. Too much, this is. Yoda thought to himself as he is now blinded by whatever light went off. However, even after that light, there didn't seem to be any big rumble. Nothing to indicate an explosion of some sort had just happened. But there was also no noise to indicate anything else as well. It seemed as if everything had returned to nothingness, silence. And even the force itself seemed to be at a standstill as well. Count Dooku. Mace approached Dooku, alongside Mace is also Qui-Gon. Mace Windu. Qui-Gon Jin. Dooku responded and greeted both of the people before him. Qui-Gon stayed silent himself, knowing that his input within this situation isn't needed, due to Dooku and Mace now being two people from differing factions in the ensuing conflict. Qui-Gon now a part of the Emperor and would probably only act as some sort of intermediary between the Jedi and the Separatists, still under Count Dooku, his former Jedi Master. I am intrigued to know of why you are both here. Dooku continued, implying he wished to know why they were here. Well yes, I myself am here as a representative of the Jedi Order, and as such wish to discuss things on behalf of the Order. The Jedi may have no more sway within the Republic due to recent events. But I do believe that we could still try and do something. Mace stated, making sure he made himself and his intentions here known. And here I thought you would still hold some grudge against me trying to kill Jedi, as I have successfully done so before Dooku replied. Just because I am here on behalf of the Order, does not mean that the Order forgives you for your transgressions. Mace also had to make it clear to Dooku that his actions are subject to punishment, or at least would have been because right now that doesn't matter anymore. It isn't like the Jedi has the power to capture Dooku anyway, in the political and diplomatic situation they are. The Jedi would have to survive first before trying to do anything else. Right. Then I assume you have brought along my former apprentice as a sign of peace then. Dooku replied with a question of his own. I am here of my own volition. You are my former master now, and am acting as a sort of mediator. Qui-Gon gave his own input on this situation, for he didn't play too important of a role right now. You and I should speak some more later on, Qui-Gon. Dooku made sure to input this last piece of askance towards Qui-Gon, for he missed his apprentice greatly. Dooku, an aging human male who had light skin, brown eyes, white hair, and a height of 1.96 meters. Mace Windu, a human male who had brown eyes, dark skin, a strong build, and a height of 1.92 meters. His head is completely bald, although in his youth, Windu had black hair. Lastly is Qui-Gon Jinn, a human male who stood 1.93 meters tall and had light skin, blue eyes, and long, brown, now graying hair, along with a brown and graying beard. These three men were of great significance, power and even influence, as they have all had a role to play within the galaxy at large. Whether this be from training young Anakin Skywalker, future Emperor and Emperor, or having their own roles within the fate of the galaxy. The Separatists' leader, Master Jedi's, strength within the Force, teaching the Force and other such factors. Enough of this. We should discuss some more important things right now. Mace wanted to hurry along and start heading off wherever he needed to go to. As a Jedi Master, Mace Windu was both disciplined and steadfast, as well as unwaveringly committed to the doctrine of the Jedi Order. A clever and senior member of the High Council, Windu sought to protect the Order from the corruption and unrest within the Galactic Republic, 
Although he firmly believed in the Jedi's role as servants of the Republic, the relationship between the Order and the Senate made him uncomfortable. Noted for his grim demeanor, Windu held corrupt politicians and rebellious Jedi in low regard. He had very little patience for the failures of the Senate, and was disdainful of Jedi who disobeyed the will of the High Council. However, this would all change because of Anakin, as despite still having similarities to what was described, Mace could be described as more chill now. Right. And what, pray tell, are we to discuss? Asked Dooku, wanting to know the specifics of what they are going to do. The Jedi wish to. And the discussion would begin between the two, Mace and Dooku, along with Qui-Gon, adding in his own thoughts on the situation as well. The Jedi wanted to immediately start an attack against Palpatine heading straight towards the capital of Coruscant in some sort of surprise attack. They had no need more more ground or land as the Jedi fully expected Anakin to allow them safe passage within the Emperor. Anakin had already given the Jedi some safe passage. However, what the Jedi didn't realize is this is a mistake. Anakin's loved ones, family, friends along with other employed or devoted to the Emperor and the Emperor Academy's code, were already making efforts to convert the stranded Jedi here on Tatooine, or even in other outposts, for this is the best way to ensure the survival of the Jedi, without having hundreds, thousands of people do not die. Anakin may be considered weak in a sense for still wanting to save people, but it is only a part of his inner nature to do so, even being as selfish as he is. Anyway, with the Jedi safe in the knowledge that they would be able to stay within the Emperor and defend themselves here, only made it all the more easier for them. Dooku, a commissar of wine, and favored technique over brute strength in lightsaber combat. Dooku was once a respected Jedi, and during the Separatist crisis, he was viewed as a political idealist by his former peers. During his time in the Order, Dooku chafed at the Jedi's disdain for technology. After meeting her, Dooku secretly kept in contact with his sister Jenza, and grew close to her. His independent spirit helped push him away from the Jedi Order. By the time he was a Sith, Dooku had come to believe the Jedi had wasted their powers, but that he had not squandered his own. However, Dooku became increasingly disillusioned with the Galactic Senate's corruption, and the arrogance and apparent complacency of the Jedi Order, eventually coming to desire the downfall of both institutions he'd once served. After Sidious exploited Dooku's anger at the Republic to turn the Count to the dark side, Dooku, having become the Sith Lord Darth Tyrannus, was a menacing, intelligent, powerful, manipulative, arrogant, and immoral, yet charismatic statesman whose methods included torture, assassination, and even genocide. What Dooku wanted right now from the Jedi is a change in the system, but even though he might want some change, he knows that it would probably all revert back to the same state as is when Palpatine is charged. No matter if the Jedi and himself win, the Republic would still be corrupt due to the years and years of decadence. No, Dooku now had more plans or desires in his grand scheme of wanting to end all of the conflict, bureaucracy and everything else that he deems as negative. Because the Order served the Republic, Dooku believed the Jedi were dishonored and were not to be trusted. Dooku also protested the failure of the Republic, bringing numerous systems to the Confederacy. Yet his true motives remained hidden. The Count truly wanted to rule a new Sith Empire at the side of Darth Sidious, whom he believed would bring order back to the galaxy. Of course, this is just before meeting Anakin Skywalker, someone that he now believed to be truly the Chosen One, whether the Jedi believed in it or not. Dooku had decided to do his own research, as he didn't immediately believe in false prophets and superstitions. He however started to become swayed in his few months of having been connected to Anakin, and has decided to once again switch his allegiance. Anakin had already done so much in the Outer Rims, so what would happen if he managed to get his hands on the rest of the galaxy? Dooku has a plan. That plan involves becoming a part of Anakin's trusted aides, and then influencing Anakin to become not only the Emperor of the Emperor as it is now, but also to try and take over the entirety of the galaxy. Dooku was already exposed and numb to the actions he had taken, for he believed it all to be for the greater good, but now that he has something to show for it in Anakin, it only further encouraged some level of loyalty and trust for Anakin. If one could believe or not, Anakin had inadvertently saved Dooku from killing his own sister of course for Anakin. His actions were planned in this sequence for Dooku to fall so deep into the dark side as something he didn't want. As Dumbledore-esque as he is, Anakin had uses for Dooku as well. 
But Dooku also wanted to push Anakin to do things as well. To take over the galaxy, with Anakin at the forefront instead of Palpatine. The last person in this discussion had to take into mind everything being discussed between Dooku and Mace, whilst at the same time trying to come up with good compromises between the two. Holding the Jedi teachings as sacrosanct, Windu was suspicious of anyone he perceived to be a threat to the traditions of the Order. He often debated the maverick Jedi Qui-Gon Jinn, but neither of them enjoyed such discussions. In contrast, Qui-Gon and Dooku had a special relationship between the two of them as well. Qui-Gon really had to consider many things in what is happening now and what could happen in the future as well. Not knowing the full extent of the two of their intentions, Qui-Gon can only make guesses even as inaccurate as they could be for this situation. The future is not set in stone, meaning that anything could change anything. Anakin is something that completely messed up the entire time frame and history of events that have happened, is happening and will happen. Jin was known to disobey the Jedi Code if he felt he needed to, and was willing to rebuff the Jedi Council. Furthermore, Jin was different in his view of attachments when compared to other Jedi. He believed you could still love others as long as you were not possessive, whereas other Jedi feared any attachment could lead to that. While he knew the Force could often present more questions than answers, he nevertheless trusted in it and its guidance. It was definitely a surprise to him about what Anakin had done, but for some reason, he didn't absolutely abhor Anakin's actions to have many loved ones. He did dislike that Anakin seemed to be somewhat possessive, as anyone could tell around his loved ones, but that trait didn't seem to influence him all too much as well. If anything, this made it so he could bring even further peace to the Outer Rim territories as well. Qui-Gon didn't just come here because he likes his former student but because he truly believes in him and what he has accomplished is accomplishing and will accomplish. Is that it? Dooku asked, having come to terms with many of the things said here today. Yes, I believe the terms you have given is fine. Mace replied, the Jedi needed some forces other than themselves, and having such a powerful and influential backer like Dooku, would make it all the more easier for the Jedi to raid Palpatine. Really? Is that all the Jedi wants in this? I thought there would be some more arguments about the government and things like that. Dooku replied, saying his thought out loud. Stuff like that can be decided upon in the future. The Jedi are not politicians. Mace does have a distaste for politicians after all. But he also said this making a jab at Dooku's current status after all. Right. Dooku said, whilst internally thinking about how he could manipulate this situation into having the Jedi accept Anakin as the new ruler of the galaxy. He knows that some if not most would disagree with this statement, but he is also aware of the changes within the Jedi as of late as well. There is a chance that they could accept something like this. That is all then. Qui-Gon got up himself, and everyone said their goodbyes, or more like Qui-Gon said his goodbye to both Mace and Dooku. May the Force be with you Master Windu. Qui-Gon first said towards Mace, and then turned towards Dooku. May the Force be with you as well. Master Qui-Gon still couldn't deny Dooku was his master. Qui-Gon also had a special attachment to Dooku he couldn't deny as well. They were friends, but right now things would seem to indicate otherwise. Yes, may the Force be with you as well. Jin. Mace responded to Qui-Gon first before starting to head off. We must talk some other time. Not now, but some other time. Dooku said this to Qui-Gon before leaving off himself. And may the Force be with you, my apprentice. Interesting. Palpatine has discovered some interesting things that is currently happening within the galaxy. Specifically in regards to the Yuuz and Vong and their moves within the galaxy. It all started with the Yuuz and Vong announcing themselves unintentionally through their actions. From what Palpatine could tell, the Yuuz and Vong didn't exactly want to expose themselves so soon, and instead wanted to start taking over some territory secretly at first. It was the only thing they could do as of this moment after all, not including other things they could have done that is. No, they needed a way to sustain themselves and start building up their armies, faster than what was planned. So, they started to look towards areas that were both contested and had high densities of agriculture. Especially agriworlds where entire planets are the most important part for their sustainment, and then after resources came the need to destroy machinery. Yu's Hen Vong culture was centered around sacrifice and their gods, although warriors in particular were centered on the philosophy of pain. They tended to glorify pain, not as a motive for action, but rather as a state of living. This was because they believed that, just like their gods had sacrificed their bodies to create the galaxy, the Yu's and Vong themselves were to sacrifice parts of their body for a greater purpose. As such, they believed that, by remaking their own bodies, they were becoming closer to their deities. While this was the case, 
they never maimed their bodies in a manner that would permanently hinder their ability to function. This resulted in individual Yu and Vong having mottling or scarring and sweeping tattoos. The more elite individuals were even known to graft organs from other creatures into their bodies. Devotional practices to the gods called for bloodletting at prayer times. Shamed ones were forbidden from attending religious ceremonies. The Yuzhen Vong made sure to continue such practices for themselves, where a lot of their men-at-arms, from received reports, had organs from other species from this galaxy grafted into them. Palpatine is most interested in them, just as he was interested in Anakin for his unique nature, where the Yuuzhan Vong were also an academic interest as well. Of course, he saw the Yuuzhan Vong as more of a threat than he ever did the Chosen One, something that he is coming to regret more and more as time passes. As the Yuuzhan Vong grew more successful in their life, they began the process of sacrificing body parts and replacing them with organs from another creature, thus enhancing their abilities. This was done so during the Escalatia ceremony, where an engineered organism related to an implant began to make cuts and incisions and place the implants. At times, the implant was accepted into the body, and the Yuuzhan Vong was promoted to a higher rank. However, there were occasions where the implant failed to be accepted into the body. This resulted either in death or the individual becoming a derided shamed one. Such failures were believed to have been the work of the Yuuzhan Vong gods. Though there were times that such a happenstance was due to the failure of the Shaper in charge of the escalation ceremony. Palpatine had made use of these shamed ones efficiently as he could to try and extract information from them. As the Yuuzhan Vong focused their efforts against himself and others in this conflict. The Yuuzhan Vong had excluded the Emperor and territories outside of their current viewpoint, something with which Palpatine disliked. He needed more and more distractions, not only for the Jedi, Emperor and other forces working against him. He also wanted to distract the Yuuzhan Vong as well. And what better way than turning his enemy into an ally? My enemy's enemy is my ally. Palpatine thought to himself as every so often people would come into his new headquarters of his empire. The Jedi Temple now remodeled for himself and his own desires, reveling in the destruction of the Jedi. Palpatine has also discovered more and more interesting things about the Yuuzhan Vong, and how he could use these things to his advantage. He is already aware of their hate for technology not like their own, but he needed more to convince these beings. Family was noted as being a strong element within their society. A member of the Yuuzhan Vong was typically associated with a family group known typically as a domain. Some domains were more powerful than others. In addition to this family structure, the Yuuzhan Vong also employed a caste-based system, which included respective castes for warriors, shapers, priests, intendants and workers. Love affairs between two different castes was considered forbidden. In fact, domain loyalties ran deep and went far beyond simple likes or dislikes. There were a series of ritual statements that a Yuuzhan Vong was required to utter as part of protocol from a member of lower ranks to a member of a higher rank. While this was the case, members of one caste were not obligated to salute a superior from another caste, which was the case with intendants to higher ranking members of the warrior caste. Yuuzhan Vong children were raised in caste-specific creches by designated caretakers and likely did not know their biological parents until they were older. Their creche parents named them. Deformed children were killed at birth, but if the deformity was mild enough the child was spared. A useful survival trait for these children in order to live through such a harsh and competitive environment was paranoia. Twin births were uncommon events, only a handful of cases were known to the New Republic, in which each was thought to be a portent of a great event. In each case, one twin killed the other as a prelude to a great destiny. Funeral processions were typically carried out in a way that did not preserve the dead, and Yuuz and Vong mortuaries often consisted of Yuuz and Vong mourners who met with assigned priests. During such conditions, priests were involved in removing various body parts of the dead in order to dedicate them to the various gods. His empire and the Yuuzhan Vong had some elements that were common to one another. These included the need for strict discipline and the obedience to one's superior officer. However, at the time of the invasion, it was believed that their ultimate goals were completely different, with the Yuuzhan Vong desiring to change the way of life of the inhabitants of the galaxy. One of their goals was the destruction and removal of all forms of manufactured technology, which is one of the key strengths of this current empire but the Galactic Empire is not the strongest in this aspect. The strongest would be considered the Emperor. This great belief in discipline and obedience in one's superiors meant that subordinates never contradicted their leaders. They were capable of subverting or altering the will of their commanders, but did not point out errors in that will. They were ultimately highly skilled warriors who never retreated in the face of defeat as they feared this would insult their gods. 
While this was largely the case, it was known that certain Yu and Vong were capable of cowardly actions. For actions like this, they became shamed ones. Yu and Vong beliefs highly influenced their actions and personality. According to their religion, life was suffering, and death was the ultimate release from that suffering. As such, the Yu and Vong felt that nothing could be learned unless it was purchased in pain, and were resigned to and willingly went to their deaths. Some amongst their race, such as Domain Shai, went as far as to inflict pain on themselves to the point that they enjoyed it. Such groups felt that the infliction of pain was a means of earning the favor of their deities. Furthermore, it was believed that the greatest glory was death in battle. This fixation on death varied depending on the circumstances, as dying in the cold void between galaxies was considered a disgraceful death. Consequently, this meant that most Yu and Vong fought to the death, and thus also meant that other empires had very few opportunities of exploring the extragalactic aliens' organic warships. In addition, the priests claimed that they did not ask of others what they themselves did not accomplish, meaning that they equally sacrificed their own numbers, as well as infidels. This was an act of service to their deities, who were believed to have sacrificed their body parts, in order to create all of existence. The species also greatly believed in honor, with that subject ranking quite high in the beliefs of certain members of the race. Even under interrogations, the word of a and Vong was high, and, if they promised respite to their victims for revealing information, they typically kept their word. Furthermore, the denial of the right to honorable combat was seen as a disrespectful act, worthy of scorn from the warrior caste. In fact, warriors would even consider a single worthy opponent of fighting a single Yu and Vong warrior at a time worthy of respect in regard to their bravery, as well as their fighting skills. There also existed a similar concept to the Wookiee life debt, which was known as Usrock. This was a display that showed eternal gratitude and loyalty to another for something they had done and meant that the Yu and Vong in question would fight to the death on that person's behalf. In regards to food, the Yu and Vong held no great joy of eating, and thus felt indifferent about gastronomic tastes. The only exception of this was if the enjoyment came from an event, such as the slaying of a great beast during a ritual. Now the most important part was what the Yu and Vong would do during times of war. Of course the Yu and Vong would fight during this conflict, but it would seem that if Palpatine manages to make them see the Emperor as a worthy opponent, it would change everything happening now. The psychology of the Yu and Vong during wartime engagements was based around attack and involved the use of high levels of aggression. This made them dangerous, though at times their actions were somewhat predictable. The Yu and Vong were often encouraged by an enemy's resistance to them and tended to see such foes as being worthy of fighting. The Empire would just have to not resist and instead embrace what the Jedi do instead, as low as Palpatine may be to admit it, the diplomatic and peaceful approach is the only thing that would help him here. It makes it all the more easier as well that he is but a simple, ordinary old man with not physical prowess whatsoever, and instead pointing towards the very powerful opponents of the Emperor would create an incentive to work together with him. He could also fake claims of destroying technology as well. Internally, the Yu's and Vong greatly believed in the concept of competition as a means of breeding strength. They also believed deeply in the concept of revenge, and had no reservations to the use of aggressive emotions, unlike the Jedi. This often meant that the Yu and Vong engaged in suicide attacks or ritual suicides when facing defeat in order to attain glory, which was a source of pride of the warrior caste. This aggressive and warlike nature meant that they did not have any concept of peace or remorse. In their language, peace meant the willing submission to a conqueror. This is something I could agree with these savages Palpatine thought to himself, but still held a certain level of derision over these creatures, for he never considered them truly sentient beings. They didn't even hold a presence within the Force, so of course he didn't even consider them properly living. Furthermore, within their society, the use of profanities meant that the individual in question was capable of calling out a blood challenge to his opponent, the two would fight in a battle to the death. In addition, the use of particular insulting words, such as calling the other a fool, meant that the wounded party was perfectly within their rights, and even expected by their comrades to kill their opponent. This meant that an attack on a Yu's and Vong's pride was the grounds for demanding satisfaction, which was also capable of being accepted as a sacrifice to their gods. Again, Palpatine could see so many flaws within the culture and society of the Yu's and Vong that could be used against them and benefit himself. The Yu's and Vong had a fanatical hatred of machines, believing them to be abominations and an affront to their gods. According to their beliefs at the time of the invasion, they believed that combustion, 
the creation of fire through a machine, was the first abomination. This was because the Yuzhen Vong believed deeply in life, but also felt that all life ended as in the wild. One type of life form was eaten by another, who in turn was devoured by another predator until it died, which replenished the ecosystem. This meant that death was prevalent constantly but allowed new life to grow while machines did not die, meaning that they were capable of replacing organic life, which was something the Yuz and Vong would never allow. Pathetic. They are not even living beings themselves. Palpatine may not be a believer in a lot of things, but he did have a certain amount of faith himself. In the power of the Force and his own power that isn't his trust within his capabilities, also leads to him trusting his senses. On more than one occasion, his Force senses has helped him out immensely, just as they should now as well. Bring them in. Palpatine gestured in his office towards someone, whom immediately seemed fearful. I yes, sir. The person didn't question Palpatine's orders, and instead went out to greet the guests. In walked the Yuuz and Vong. Move, move, move. A voice was heard, speaking out towards the distance. Within the space that was once considered under the Republic, now a part of the great and grand galactic empire, were beings exchanged in combat. An explosion happened. Shouts of pain and despair were heard throughout the place. Great and grand fires were spreading throughout the buildings, with a lot of the native flora being destroyed by the invading forces. The Yuz and Vong, upon their living planet of Zanama Sekhet, with whom had agreed to coexist with the Yuz and Vong, in exchange for better protection and other such things. Zanama Sekhet didn't exactly have much choice in the matter, if it wanted to start going after those that had wronged it. Traveling to the Outer Rims or more specifically escaping to the unknown regions after being attacked, was the only choice it had back then. Now with all of its children being destroyed in the process because of some destruction done to itself, it wanted to find those that has wronged it and punish them. Kill them. Fight back those monsters. A voice called out. A distinctly human voice for they were under threat and siege of the Yuz and Vong. A planet had appeared so suddenly towards them which resulted in their sky being blocked up completely. The Emperor would not like these beings being here. Another voice called out during the destruction, trying to make sure everyone here knew of the consequences if this situation is discovered by their current leader. Another creature, another Yu Vong, came around the corner of a building, and immediately hopped onto one of the soldiers, completely eviscerating them in the process, through the use of their biological weapons. Ugh. Retreat. There are too many of them. Go. 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 This was a mythic paradise world enshrouded in the dark side of the Force, located within the isolated and nearly inaccessible Deep Galactic Core. It was situated at the end of the Bis Run, a heavily guarded artificial hyperlane kept open by hundreds of non-mass S-thread boosters, connecting the planet to the Core Worlds. The planet was otherwise nearly impossible to reach safely through hyperspace, due to the high density of stars in the deep core, and the constantly shifting patterns of the region's natural hyperlanes. This was the fifth planet of the Beshkek system, and orbited the star Beshkek. It was one of two habitable planets in the system, the other being Rilas. The planet was orbited by five small moons, which had little influence on its tides. The Yuz and Vong, along with the help of the living planet they saw as a child of their home planet, and divine being itself, invaded this place with haste. Not wanting to waste any time at all, the Yuz and Vong immediately attacked this place, in spite of another meeting taking place right as of this moment between Palpatine and one of their representatives. It is only through manipulation and maybe some dark side force influence, that Palpatine was able to set up such a diplomatic move between himself and these beings. Bathed in a blue-green sunlight, this was originally a lush and fertile world. A natural conduit of force power, it invigorated force users in a flood of force energy. This was corrupted by dark energies after Emperor Palpatine made the world his personal retreat, and began leeching force energy from the immigrants he lured there. Over time, the planet was transformed into one of the most powerful nexuses of dark side energy in the galaxy. The planet was dotted with chains of lakes and rivers where microscopic life forms dwelled, as well as windsmooth plateaus and canyons. Its isolation from much of the galaxy allowed for its natural islands and pre-expansionist era ruins to remain untouched for thousands of years. After its corruption, the planet's soil lost much of its natural quality and produced little more than ferns and lichens. No intelligent species ever evolved on Bis, and what wildlife there existed was largely nocturnal and harmless. Bis was also devoid of any rare elements or heavy metals. The planet's calm, balmy climate and mild seasons, ranging from clear to rainy, were primarily caused by its minuscule axial tilt and stable geologic foundation. Violent phenomena, such as storms and volcanism, were extremely rare. 
The Yuz and Vong of course did their research, and had decided to go after this place exactly, as despite their nature for direct conflict, they are aware of their current militaristic level. It would not be enough to stand up to and against the Emperor and Empire, which is their targeted goal. What the Yuz and Vong wanted to do is try and manipulate the Manipulator, the Dark Lord of the Sith, Darth Sidious to their goals. No matter if the guy listened to them, agreed or anything else, as long as they are able to get this person to allow them to do what they wanted. The Yuz and Vong didn't care. However, that didn't mean they are just about to just allow Palpatine go and run rampant without some backup plan of their own. Politically, this was ruled by three major galactic powers. The planet was controlled by the Rakuten Infinite Empire. For nearly 5,000 years before its collapse, and thousands of years later, the planet came under the rule of the Galactic Empire where it served as Emperor Palpatine's resort world. A towering citadel was built using non-human slave labor at the heart of the ruling city, along with ornate buildings and resort complexes, and soon an entire continent, the Imperial Control Sector, was covered in city. The planet was ruled as a dark side theocracy, led solely by Palpatine and his dark side adepts, something that he had been planning on and doing ever since his discovery of his now former apprentice, Darth Tyrannus, now known by and gone back to Count Dooku. Under Imperial rule, this became one of the most reclusive and heavily guarded worlds in the galaxy. Most natural routes into the deep core were mined, and the rest were covered by the Imperial Hyperspace Security Net, a system of gravity well projectors and hyperwave transceivers designed to monitor and control traffic into and out of the deep core. As a fortress world, comma left bracket bis was guarded by a number of security forces and technologies, all of which were overseen by bis security itself. The BIS security zone, a restricted area of space around BIS, was guarded by a ring of star destroyers, while an entire sector fleet was additionally spread throughout the Beshtek system. It also included the BIS defense fleet. A Metis, or message to spaces was broadcast to all travelers entering the system as a warning against trespassing. Gargantuan hunter killer probots were responsible for patrolling the skies above BIS and were used as capture and detainment platforms for unauthorized ships. The planet itself was surrounded by a planetary shield controlled by BIS security, and a system of gauntlet scanner stations were used to monitor traffic around the planet. All of this however is currently being overrun by the Yuz and Vong quite easily, especially because of the conflict Palpatine is currently dealing with elsewhere, including the Jedi, Separatists and various independence factions within his own newly restructured and formed empire. The gauntlet scanner stations comprised of many Golan 3 space defense Novaguns orbiting BIS, where security personnel would coordinate space traffic with the scanner satellites spread over the planet. Officers stationed aboard these platforms typically oversaw the daily operation of the BIS security zone, by monitoring if transponder codes, security codes, and other forms of authorization used to control traffic to and from the surface of BIS. If any traveler was found possessing forged documents, the Star Destroyers guarding BIS, had authorization to use lethal force against them. The gauntlet scanner stations additionally served as orbital defense platforms for BIS, boasting firepower equal to some capital ships, and also housed squadrons of TIE fighters and other defensive forces. On the surface of BIS, surveillance and a heavy military presence was commonplace. Soldiers that were recruited and trained are stationed at every street corner, each landing pad was guarded by a TIE fighter and undercover Imperial Security Bureau agents were present at most of the planet's public areas, to watch out for any potential traders. Additionally, shipyards, fighter bases, and military barracks large enough to hold an entire army, were present all across the Imperial Control Sector. All of these complexes were camouflaged behind colorful plazas and public buildings, themselves armed with the latest defense turbolasers and shock fields. A Yuz and Vong caught up to a soldier that had fallen down, before pressing their enhanced leg into the down trooper. No, E, please don't kill me. The soldier begged for his life, but he was just as bad as the Yuz and Vong if not worse for working under Palpatine here on this planet. The Yuz and soldier bent down, grabbing a hold of the man's head wrapped in armor made out of metal material. A material that the Yuz and Vong absolutely appalled and threw in grasping motion. This particular Yuz and Vong soldier grabbed on and pulled. Pulled and pulled and pulled. Palpatine's soldier didn't even have the ability to vocalize the pain he is currently feeling as the next moment, the cracking of one's bones was heard. The tearing of the skin was also starting to be heard, before a head was separated from the body. Reveling in the blood, the Yuz and Vong absolutely marked themselves with the blood of their enemy. Not a particularly powerful enemy. 
but still an enemy nonetheless. The Yu's and Vong then proceeded to take off the helmet, then also rip out the eye of the human underneath. It would seem that this Yu's and Vong in particular wanted the eye of the human for itself. The head and helmet were both thrown to the ground, where next the Vong joined up with some others, as the planet of Bis is now under the control of the Yu's and Vong. All of the planning and time, energy and effort put in by Palpatine, has now come to and end on this planet. Greetings. Welcome. Welcome to my humble place of current residence. Palpatine had gotten up off of his seat, moving towards a position of power, defense and other such factors. He wouldn't put himself at danger after all, to meet with these beings, and would instead want to have a way to better protect himself. With very little planning and timing, Palpatine has been able to arrange this meeting after a very arduous process, including having to find someone to translate the language and communicate for him. The Yu and Vong representatives were quite quiet, and instead opted to stay quiet and await for the current language translator to convey Palpatine's words. And here, I had thought they would be a bit more antagonistic. Palpatine thought to himself, as he watched in morbid fascination the creature's repulsion to anything that remotely showed off technological advancement. From this point on, Palpatine and the Yu's and Vong representatives would understand each other through the translator. Yes, you have called us here because you wish to discuss some things. The representative of the Yu's and Vong asked, I wanted to inform you and your people that I am not the person you are looking to attack. Palpatine took an almost lingering and hidden passing glance towards the Yu's and Vong representative's physical features. We are well aware that your empire is not the main enemy of our people, and instead it is that emperor and empire on those outer skirts of the galaxy instead. The Yu's and Vong representative said, This surprised Palpatine, for he didn't know that they knew of the emperor. So you know of these despicable people. Do not try to fool me or my people. Your heresy and use of the metal technologies is a spy on my people and the gods. The representative seemed to be able to see through Palpatine's scheme, if only for this thing in particular. Either that or Palpatine was not as prepared as he thought he was, but this wouldn't matter for Palpatine would now start implanting the seeds he needs to plant. Of course. Of course. I wouldn't ever dare to suggest such a thing. Palpatine would then go on to say some placating words that his translator had a hard time translating for the Yu's and Vong representative. However, it still managed to win this particular representative over with his ego boosted. He was now much more pliable for Palpatine's taste. You are quite the nice human. I think that you would do fine as a slave for myself indeed, the representative said, which lead to Palpatine having to conceal some of his anger at such a comment. Things are going accordingly with his plan after all, and messing up now due to some temporary anger, would do him no good. Your words are too kind. However, I must tell you some more about the Emperor and just how they like to disrespect your people's gods. Palpatine, playing the flatterer, continued to say words that appeased and inflated the representative's ego. Thus, this was the birth of an alliance, with Palpatine making false promises, and the representative being none the wiser about his ways. Why would the representative worry anyway? They had after all just captured the hidden planet of importance from Palpatine, and this could be used against him in future endeavors. With both Palpatine and the Yu's and Vong none the wiser about each other's goals, objectives, intent and hidden cards, they would prove to be rather unlikely allies. Is everyone ready to leave yet? Mace asked another person, that person being Obi-Wan Kenobi as he had come back with that other woman and rejoined the current Jedi task on a mission. A very special and important mission that is. I think so. I don't think I have seen Master Yoda around however, Obi-Wan said out loud his thoughts to Mace, given that Yoda is important to everything happening right now. Or at least that is what the Jedi still believed. For Yoda at this point of time only has but a few more years to live. His physical body may be able to go against the old and decaying Palpatine. However Yoda would never win in that conflict. Even if the Jedi took Yoda with them, there are doubts about what Yoda would do exactly. We have no time to wait around for Master Yoda. What we are about to embark on will hopefully be an end all mission to Darth Sidious. Hopefully by taking him down, we also take down all of his plans as well. Mace replied, What about the rest of the people that actually agreed with Palpatine and went along with his goals and desires? His allies in the matter are also important, don't you think? Obi-Wan questioned back, taking into account that just taking the head off of the snake won't work in this context. Palpatine is more of a Hydra than a snake, thus meaning he could make a return in spirit through his successes. 
No matter how unstable everything is now, going off of other things and events that have happened, it would only make sense that Palpatine has someone planned some sort of plan for every contingent circumstance. We can only hope that Palpatine is not well prepared for such a scenario. And this is also why we have allied ourselves with Anakin. Mace continued, assuring the doubts that Obi-Wan had. Those going on this mission were a lot of people, considering that Palpatine has a lot of forces behind him. Hopefully, with the aid of Dooku, we will be able to hold back the militaristic forces of Palpatine, and go straight for the source of this conflict Mace thought to himself. Right, I guess that we can only trust in the Force and its plan then. Obi-Wan was still his old self, and his new self and that he trusted the Jedi Code a lot more with time. Personality-wise, Obi-Wan is kind of like Qui-Gon in his stubborn nature, but their thoughts differ on the Force. Even with Qui-Gon having brought up many times balance and stuff like that even going so far as to be influenced by Anakin, in the ways of the Force and what is taught. Hurry up then, head on board, and we will be leaving immediately. Communication lines has been opened up between Dooku and ourselves, patched through thanks to the advanced take here on Tatooine. Mace was slightly impressed with this transformation, whereupon it is influenced by Anakin. While Anakin may only be supporting the Jedi and remainders of the Republic very loosely, it was still more than enough, especially indirectly as well, by upgrading their devices and even allowing them to get some rather useful upgrades. Of course, Anakin didn't just allow stuff like this for free after all. Okay, I am assuming that there will be some command dash Obi-Wan started, only be interrupted and then physically pushed by Mace into the starship. Enough. Just get on board already and we will head off. Mace didn't want to speak more in this instance, and would instead lay out the plan as they travel discreetly as possible into the Core World territories. The people chosen for this mission really just consisted of every single adult Jedi possible, excluding everyone under a certain age. This was not really the Jedi's decision, but more like a forceful demand made by Anakin, in that he would stop supporting them, if they allowed children to go out and join the war. Of course, there needed to be some sort of cutoff point, so the arbitrary number of 18 years of age was chosen. This really only applied to more short-lived races like humans, while with other races that matured differently, had to be taken into account as well. Anakin didn't want to be sending children off into war, of course, some would also point towards the fact that Anakin's Emperor and Sense are in fact younger than the age that he set, for they have only existed for a certain time frame. Again, that is why the age of consent to sign contracts, join the military and other such things is considered arbitrary. There is no perfect number, but a certain level of maturity in terms of physicality was taken into consideration. Okay, 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 you don't need to push me. Obi-Wan said, finally having Mace let go and stop pushing him. Good, now get your head in the game, for what we discuss next is going to be important. Mace replied, making sure that Obi-Wan turn on his serious thought process. Jedi initiates, younglings and Padawans excluded. Well, Padawans that are not of a certain age were excluded, and those that are on their way were Jedi Knights and Masters. With Yoda being strangely missing from their time of departure, the leadership role defaulted towards Mace Windu. With Mace in charge, there should be some progress made especially in a context like this. War, battle, blood and fire and if the Jedi have any say in the matter, it would end in the death of Palpatine. But a lot of them had a feeling that things were not going to end as easily. There was this undercurrent within the Force that foretold and predicted a massive change within the galaxy, representing something on a larger scale, is also taking place as well. Like some sort of divine precedence was happening, and the will of the Force was being executed in this manner. For all of those involved, with the Jedi going off towards to fight Palpatine, it is very likely they would die due to a many number of reasons. We're often called a militant order, but do you know one of the principal differences between the military and the Jedi order? Mace started as he started to speak to everyone, trying to increase their morale. There was silence as everyone was expecting for Mace to continue. The military are expected to follow orders, even when they feel those orders are not what's right. The Jedi are expected to do what's right, even when the course of action runs contrary to orders. Mace continued and finished here. The right course of action is what we are doing today. We will head into the core of this new galactic empire, and put an end to the Sith uprising. Mace's words seemed to have had an effect as the Jedi had their spirits rejuvenated, if only a little bit making the overall overall mood and morale better. In times of war, especially when Sith forces were involved, Jedi would sometimes assume military ranks and govern armies of Republic military units, as was seen in the Mandalorian Wars. The Jedi Civil War, 
the new Sith Wars, and the Clone Wars. So Jedi indeed became soldiers, not just keepers of the peace. During the new Sith Wars, the Order created the Army of Light, a massive military branch that consisted of the majority of active Jedi. Jedi Commanders, a Padawan serving as a commander in the Grand Army of the Republic, the Jedi Commander was assigned to a Jedi General until knighted. Once a full Jedi, the Padawan was then referred to as General. Jedi Generals, Jedi Knights or Masters who had been placed in command of a Republic Army were dubbed Generals. Jedi Masters could become Senior Jedi General, leading one of the 20 Sector Armies. Out of the 12 High Council members, some became High Jedi Generals, not only commanding their own system's army, but also supervising all other ranking Jedi. The last but not least the Jedi Lords. A Jedi who served as a commander in the Army of Light during the new Sith Wars. The Jedi Lord assumed this title mainly out of political motivation. The rank was abolished after the war. Right now everyone has their assumed roles and are heading off into a war that is most certainly their own. Maybe even a war of their own making, brought upon them through some level of complacency and their own incompetence. We are going to start here. Grievous couldn't be any more happier than he was now, with everything that has been done and accomplished. Of course. There are things, regrets that he would have liked to change in a previous lifetime. But he could only do so much then, and only do so much now as well. Everything is going well for him now, and he had learned some time ago that lingering on the past, an unchanging thing was not good for him. It is also not good for those around himself as well, meaning that he needed to be prepared and ready for stuff that could happen outside of his control. No matter how much power he had received and how much power he had developed himself, there is still a limit even with being given a brand new body with which he could now indulge himself properly, with the now new love of his life. Talzin was not the first woman he had loved. No, there was another during a time that he would look back upon as bad or negative. He had done a lot of bad things, with a lot of bad things also being done to himself as well. Grievous is built for war, and rebuilt for it many times over through many of his transformations throughout his lifespan. Right from his birth to his installation in a mechanical body, and then towards his rebirth within his new but still dying and old body. Because of this, one could say that he is a perfect general, especially when it comes to learning tactics or strategies. Anakin didn't want him to be some flimsy general, with no ability to logical lead troops within an army as he would be. It would seem that his skills and training would be tested as well, given that he needs to teleport to hut space, due to a little sign of an oncoming star fleet. What the hell is going on now? Grievous grumbled to himself, having gotten used to his new body now with some intense and some not so intense, but still relevant exercise. E General, sir, we have a massive fleet of unknown origins heading in this direction. It would seem that they have already taken out a few stations already, and are heading directly towards Nalhutta. Sir, an Emperor soldier said as Grievous arrived on base, not much could be done to immediately reverse the damage done to the places inhabited by the huts. But there are people working on it. People especially passionate in their work to restore planets and all moons to some greater level of healthiness. Status report. Grievous replied with a question, wanting the soldier to give him information on the armies approaching. When I had woken up today, I didn't think the Emperor would be getting attacked now, even if Hut Space isn't really a part of the Emperor. Grievous thought to himself. The soldier would tell Grievous of how many fleets were coming their way and information extracted through the stations destroyed. The Yuz and Vong are coming now, why are they coming after the Emperor now? Do they think they can do anything? Grievous was puzzled, for it was not within his expectations for these beings to come after the Emperor. Maybe Anakin had an idea of what was coming or happening, but he had not told anyone else about this. Either Anakin did know and didn't tell anyone, or he didn't because of a multitude of factors. There were actually quite a lot of ships coming their way, and they needed to start getting some militaristic armies together to fight off this attack, and then start other operations. Stuff like espionage and intrigue-related things to discover just what is going on. Thankfully, Anakin had made use of his abilities, and stored the Yuz and Vong's language into the database, so they would be able to extract information from captives if need be. Sir, what is really strange about these Yuz and Vong are their ships? The soldier said. What is strange? Grievous would admit that he didn't have a lot of knowledge about these beings, so he would immediately read up on any and all information possible. A massive assault force of dark ships, shadowy figures, and weapons of great power, based on organic technology of a sort we've never seen before. We believe these far outsiders, as we call them, already have a foothold at the far edge of the galaxy, 
and even now have scouting parties seeking information on worlds and peoples to conquer. The soldier said some basic information about this situation. Great, not only is there the emperor and his genetic fascination, but also these beings as well. I don't have a good feeling about this. Grievous said more to himself rather than this soldier and surrounding men-at-arms. Prepare for battle, Grievous ordered. Kai Adimundi, Jedi Master and member of the Jedi High Council is dead. Yoda couldn't believe his eyes, for what he had just witnessed is something that he would have never guessed would happen. No. Yoda called out, seeing Anakin decapitate the Jedi Master, Kai Adimundi. But Yoda was also blinded as well, not knowing just what is going on. A bright light encompassed whatever place the three. Now two living beings were within. Anakin, Yoda and the now dead Kyoti Mundi would be blinded by said light as if something of great importance was taking place. After the light show was over, what appeared before Yoda was an endless expanse that seemed to converge across the entirety of everything. From one point to another, there was this endless nothingness alongside stars littering the surrounding view. Yoda looked around trying to sense through the Force, and maybe even rely on his good old natural sensory organs of the eyes and ears as to ascertain just where he was. Is this some kind of illusion? Yoda thought to himself as he regarded this place, for it is quite beautiful to view. But it wasn't a beautiful goodness that Yoda sensed. It was instead a grim beauty that came from this place. Something that said this was the end of all things, yet also at the same time the only natural conclusion of how things were supposed to be. The stars in this expanse started to go out one by one, and Yoda still had no idea about what is happening. Nor did he even try to understand what is happening, as there are much more important matters on his mind, that is distracting him from the core of the problem he is in. Find a way out, I must. Stars going out, seem not a good sign, it does. Yoda thought to himself as he observed the changes happening. One by one the stars were extinguished, leaving Yoda all alone. By himself, left to stew in his thoughts while his fears for what was to happen in the dark did not come true. That grim setting and grim beauty he sensed and maybe even appreciated should have told a different story. However, nothing like that has happened so far, thus leaving Yoda to only one conclusion. An instinctive feeling that he knows may be wrong, but also can't help but feel as if it is right. Skywalker. Yoda called out, his voice still being able to be heard, even in space where it is impossible to hear anything. This only further went to confirm to Yoda that he is within a separate space or frame of mind within an illusion of sorts. Skywalker, show yourself, you will. Explain yourself, now, you must. Yoda may not hold any actual bargaining chips right now, in the face of such a grand power. But Yoda still had this feeling there is some sort of purpose behind the event he had just seen. All of a sudden, the darkness of space was thrown away in exchange for the brightness of day. Dagoba, located in the sluice sector of the Outer Rim territories. Despite being located near the Rimmer trade route, it is reachable only by obscure hyperlanes. Anakin's voice was heard, as the place they were now in, both Yoda and Anakin, was a swamp of some kind. Dagobah was a harsh, humid, swampy planet, mostly covered in shallow marshland, interspersed with stifling forests and at least one cave. There were very few truly open bodies of water on the planet. The water supply was thinly invested throughout the planet's main habitat, swampland, although there were vast expanses of mud fields. Skywalker, brought me to this place you have. Reason, have, you must. Yoda for now put aside the fact he had witnessed the death of Kai Adi Mundi, as obviously what is happening right now is of greater importance. Not that he would put that behind him forever, but would instead indulge just what Anakin is currently doing. Knowing all the things that he does, Yoda knew that he should probably take a step back from his current emotions, whatever they may be, and instead proceed with caution. You know of this place. A place you have decided to come to if the worst case scenario were to ever happen. Anakin responded as he looked at the diminutive, wrinkly green alien. You know of this how. Yoda was now intrigued. Seen visions you have as well. Brought this not to anyone's attention. Why? Yoda is still confused about why he is brought here, if only as a illusion. I have brought you here to point out some things. That's all. Anakin replied. Point things out. You may Yoda is response is intrigued still. Wanting to know just where this is going. See this cave here. All of a sudden, the environment where Anakin and Yoda was changed towards another. Specifically, they were still within a swamp. 
But there is a cave of some kind. This place Yoda seemed to hesitate a bit and take a few steps back from the cave, for it is steeped in the energies of the dark side. Why here? The Dark Side Cave, also known as the Cave of Evil, contains a powerful Dark Side manifestation of the Force. Anakin said, explaining what this place was, if Yoda didn't already know what this place is. A cave of limestone and dirt. The Dark Side Cave was located deep in the equatorial swamps and contained a vergence in the Force, as well as the apparition of a Dark Jedi. A focal point for the dark side of the Force, the cave challenges the perceptions of anyone who entered into its depths. Drawing visitors in, people will often experience visions of the past, future, or possible futures. Know of this place, I do Yoda responded. Hundreds of years before the Clone Wars, the Jedi Minch battled and killed a powerful Pfasi Dark Jedi leader and his energies absorbed into its surroundings, tainting the passage with the Dark Spirit. Yoda had a vision of the Dark Side Cave during one of his meditations. In this vision, Qui-Gon Jinn had survived the Battle of Naboo, and had taken nine-year-old Anakin Skywalker as his Padawan. He guided Skywalker into the cave to face his fears, telling Anakin that all that was inside the cave was only what you take with you. Yoda didn't exactly want to be here but it would seem that he is forced to come here. I am here to guide you into this cave, for you must experience something. You must see things, the force, balance and the fate of the galaxy yourself. This is no mere illusion. It is in many ways also a reality. Anakin said towards Yoda as he faced the cave. Guidance from the student I shall receive. Yoda asked Anakin. Student, I guess you can say that. Student that also just so happens to be a master as well, meaning that you are in good hands. Anakin replied as he walked into the cave. Come now, there is much for you to see. Yoda promptly followed after Anakin, and for some strange reason started to experience a whole host of emotions. Whether this be fear, doubt, or anything else related to emotions within the dark side of the Force. Okay. That is all for today. You may all leave now. Isla said as she gestured towards the children within the classroom they were in. Isla was kind of forced to not do anything that would be too strenuous in physical activity. By not only Anakin, but the other girls as well. It would seem that they care for the baby. Just as much as they would care for me Isla thought to herself. Miss. A voice called out to Isla, as she is not too surprised to find that some Jedi younglings were also in attendance. It didn't take very long to start integrating the young ones, especially since she had gotten good at her current job of being some sort of maternal figure. Yes, Isla often got Jedi children coming to her, and often hoed those that are currently teaching within the academy that the Jedi children seem most curious. It probably goes a long way that Anakin had already implanted the idea, since he was within the Jedi Order, which subsequently still survived within the younglings now. It hadn't even been that long since Anakin and the others had left the Jedi Order, only being a few months now. Time really does seem to slow down a bit. How did that happen? Isla thought to herself. I was just wondering you talk about the Force, both the dark and light sides of the Force, as if they are both meant to be equal in some manner. The Jedi child asked, which kept most if not all of the students back, as they were interested in hearing Isla's answer. Well dash, she was about to start on a lecture, something that the children would be interested in. However she is interrupted by someone barging into the classroom. Isla. Something has happened. It was Barris whom had just barged into the room and saw all of the children. Oops, oops. Isla responded but got over the intrusion rather quickly and said, Well, what happened? Isla asked, given that she wanted an excuse to not further delay things. As the days passed by, and due to her pregnancy, she couldn't help the side effects of such a thing happening. Mood swings, cravings and other things including all of a sudden not wanting to explain things to her students right now. Well maybe we should talk elsewhere. Barris moved her eyes over towards all of the children here. Yes, that would be for the best. Isla responded before she turned around to the children. Off you all go now. I will answer questions next time. But now I have to leave with this big sister here. The children responded in a positive. Isla and Barris went off in another direction. Somewhere where they would have some privacy to talk about things. So, what is it then? It's Ahsoka Barris started. What with Ahsoka? Isla questioned, not knowing where this is going. But knowing the brat, it would surely be something mischievous in some fashion. She has, uh, she has gone with the Jedi leaving towards Coruscant. Barris dropped the bomb, 
And it would seem that she had come to Isla first before anyone else. W what Isla is definitely shocked. What is she thinking? Isla continued to further question Barris to try and see if she had any idea why she had up and left with the Jedi. She did it secretly. She wasn't coerced or anything like that. She said something about seeing some sort of vision about Palpatine, the Yuz and Vong and some other mysterious presence similar to even her family. Barris explained. What about Arnie? Does he know? Isla further questioned. I have no idea where he is, and Siri is most certainly not telling me anything. All I know is that he is here, on Tatooine physically, but mentally he may be further away. Barris said, explaining that she had tried to get to Anakin first with this information. It would seem that the little one of our group is now being silly again. Isla said, sighing in exasperation for what Ahsoka is doing may be dangerous. Who knows what is going to happen to her if she goes there. Not excluding the fact she has gone there because of some visions she has received about a few things. Well, it isn't like this isn't within her nature, Barris replied. Whatever, I can't be going anywhere in my condition, so... You should gather the other girls to try and head towards wherever she has gone, and then forcibly bring her back. Isla said, referring to the others. Or maybe even sequester some troops from the Emperor to try and get some people to help them. And the Jedi Separatist Independence faction heading towards Palpatine. Right. That sounds like a great idea. Barris responded. Having started to go off in another direction to assemble the Avengno, not the Avengers. But the other girls, as they have gathered enough experience and training to be relevant in things to come. Things seem to be going awry Isla thought to herself. Space. Massive fleets of various kinds appeared on opposing sides of each other. One being that of the Yuuzhan Vong. Biological star ships that were made out of genetically engineered technology. With none of the usual markers of a metallic base starship. On the opposing side of them were the Emperor and fleet, decked out in their way with metallic markers and none of the usual things one would see as well. Both sides kind of represented two things, one being the Yuuzhan and Vong, and their way forward for their species, while the other is the Emperor and their way forward. Of course, the Emperor had started to incorporate things that include more genetic or biological-based materials into things. It is just still a majority focused on combining technologies of both kinds, metallic and biological. If one could hear, they would surely notice sounds of great destruction and death. Explosions, fire and a laser show of epic proportions is taking place, where the Emperor is quite fiercely defending a territory that isn't even really their own. The reason for this is the progress that has been made and is being made would go backwards if the Emperor pulled out of hut space right now. Not expecting things to go this way, or at least most of the people everyone didn't expect the Yuuz and Vong to become so brave as to attack the Emperor and defended territories. Hut space was an autonomous region of the galaxy on the border between the Mid Rim and the Outer Rim territories, near the entrance to Wild Space. It encompassed the Seclata Cluster and bordered on the Chon Hegemony. Hut space was named for the Hut species, who dominated the region. Differing accounts attributed different numbers of planets in Hut space but reasonable estimates ranged from a few hundred to a thousand inhabited worlds. For this very reason, Anakin would also agree with what the current Emperor and military station within Hut Space is doing. A lot of things had happened and changed due to Emperor and presence, with missionaries coming and going, further changing the culture here, with some subtle influences from the Emperor and mythology and religion as well. But that is only par for the course. A battle is happening, and both sides of this conflict seem to be of relative equal standing. There is no current decided winner, with a lot of even smaller skirmishes happening during this conflict as well. Small starships, not massive ones, were doing the small jobs of trying to advance upon their enemies. The Yuuz and Vong traveled in great world ships to come to the galaxy. When scouts located the galaxy, for what is now a few years before the beginning of the invasion, agents had been set up to provide a flow of intelligence to the Yuuz and Vong. The Yuuz and Vong naval strength to be at 1,000 capital ships, deployed in small groups of 25 to Seventa vessels, each consisting of analogues to warships, cruisers, destroyers, troop carriers, frigates, corvettes and gunships, along with starfighters known as coral skippers. The Yoriket was a bio-ship made from Yorick Coral. Since the Yuuz and Vong despised mechanical technology as an abomination, it was grown instead of manufactured, so no two Karolskippers looked alike. Despite this, every Karolskipper shared some basic features, such as a dark canopy and a triangular body. The Karolskippers' pilot could communicate with the craft via a special mask called a cognition hood at the cockpit. The Karolskippers' weapon was a Yarrett core, a small appendage at the front of the vehicle which released a searing magma rock, 
that could seriously damage enemy craft. The Karolskopa also possessed two plasma projectors at the front of the ship, sometimes referred to as rock spitters. The Karolskopa refueled and rearmed by eating rocks, small asteroids, and stellar debris. However, like any living organism, Karolskopas aged and died. Also, hidden beneath the front of a Yorikette was a small creature that resembled a heart called the Dovin Basil. Because it was living, it pulsed and shuddered constantly, similar to a human heart. The Dovin Basil was the most important part of the bioship, because it functioned like a miniature black hole, creating a powerful supergravity field when activated. This field could be used to overload the shields of an enemy starfighter, and could also act as the Karolskopa's own shield, by drawing laser fire and missiles into the yawning more of the miniature singularity. Like all classes of use in Vong spacecraft, the Karolskopa utilized the Dovin Basil as a means of propulsion, which became a weakness to exploit when destroying the Karolskopa. When propelling the craft, the Dovin Basil was not capable of defending the craft as efficiently as it could when remaining stationary. Karolskopas were strictly space vehicles and performed poorly in planetary atmospheres. Karolskopas were not capable of traveling for long-range travel in space and had to rely on a larger vessel to transport them across long distances, drawing parallels to the inhabitants and starships from the galaxy that the Yuz and Vong are currently invading. On the other side, the Emperor employed some seemingly basic, but actually much more advanced starfighter ships themselves as well. While not biological with special properties that the Yuz and Vong has access to, the Emperor and starfighter ships definitely had their own advantages as well. The majority of starfighters were piloted directly by living beings, although some were controlled either remotely or by artificial intelligence. These light craft were designed to carry out attacks on sensitive installations and targets that required immense precision. In fleet battle, starfighters worked in concert with capital ships, harassing warships, and striking once their weakened shields failed or were realigned due to enemy capital ship fire. Alone, fighters had little to no chance of penetrating the shields of capital ships, but most starfighters worked in squadrons and carried weapons like proton torpedoes and concussion missiles. These squadrons could take out a large capital ship with precision fire, directed at weak points that might otherwise be hard to target, such as a shield generator or the ship's bridge. Massive explosions were happening, with the loss of life being very large. There is a silver lining in this battle however, and that is the fact that the Emperor is smart enough to only make use of artificial intelligence rather than sacrificing the lives of the living. Even more so when the artificial intelligence is in fact Siri controlling all of the ships, while Anakin controlled droids to gather information so he could be somewhat all-knowing. Siri was kind of the physical sense, where she would act through actions rather than just taking in information, giving Siri, this artificial intelligence more agency in life than what she actually has or is. The Yuz and Vong having living ships, along with living pilots, only meant that the Emperor was not only killing the people within, but also the ship-like creatures as well. It is truly a horrific thing to think about. But the religiously zealous and mechanical hating species that is the Yuuzhan Vong started this attack on the Emperor for a few reasons. One being that the Emperor is their enemy. Two being the hut space could come under the Yuuzhan Vong, enabling them to use this place as their own setup point. The Emperor had after all done all of the work into transforming a few places, ridding this place of resistance, and giving most militaristic power to themselves. So, free settlements and planets within hut space may be left defenseless, enabling the Yuuzhan and Vong to not worry about any resistance. The machinery, mechanics and metallic presence would be purged by the Yuuzhan and Vong, and in exchange the people here could become a part of their culture. It wasn't like the Yuuzhan and Vong hadn't accepted others from outside their species before. It is just they are usually accepted as slaves, something that the Emperor most definitely dislikes. More ships, whether they be from the Emperor or the Yuuzhan and Vong, started to be obliterated out of existence. Debris and junk left out in space, where even some fire that would only appear for an instant before going out instantly for space, lacked the oxygen it needed to survive. Koros Strona, Yurikat, Mayad Roik, Kor Chok, Yurik Strongha, A Vek Yulunu, Yurik Vek Assault Cruiser, Yurik Tremors, everything the Yuuzhan Vong had prepared, even though fewer than what could have been if they waited, is more than enough to still fight the Emperor into a standstill. A lot of time had passed, and given that the galaxy has been in constant turmoil, for many losers over the years, it only makes sense that even the Emperor is struggling to further their own military, 
with how spread out their defenses are. Starships in differing systems, space regions, with even the teleportation devices created not of much use in diminishing this flaw. After Palpatine had finished discussing things with that Yuuzhan Vong representative, and having come up with a way to manipulate them, he could only cackle for this made things easier for him. While the Yuuzhan Vong would not help him in his defense against those going against himself, he would still benefit through the Emperor and taking some damage. I will not be the only one to lose military force through weakening the Emperor and the Yuuzhan Vong. At the same time, while I take back all of those that have defied my will, I will be ready to face off against whoever wins between the two of those factions. Palpatine thought to himself, thinking he is brilliant. No doubt, Palpatine's manipulations and mind is very advanced in the sense that he can work things in a way that it would benefit him. Meditating within the Force, the dark side of the Force that is Palpatine, is able to relax himself. Soothing and relaxing but powerful and dangerous undercurrents were felt within, and Palpatine could sense that things seemed to still be going in his direction, going accordingly with his plan. Of course, declaring himself as the new Safari years ago was all a part of his plan, and for his plan to come full circle, he would have to do what the Safari is meant to do, destroy the Sith, and then remake them better than ever. In a way, prophecies can be applied to just about anyone that has some connection to such things. For Palpatine, how he destroys the Sith is through the complete death of his master, as Sith Lord. But that doesn't necessarily mean he is now the great Sithari. Especially not with the presence within the Force that was much, much more powerful than his own, and that is Anakin Skywalker. The Jedi's previously and sometimes even still chosen one. He had discovered it some time ago, that Anakin was the presence that he felt within the Force. This is especially more so of a reason for Palpatine to not only be worried about Anakin, but to also try and kill him. Maybe before Palpatine could ponder any more and meditate within the Force, he was interrupted by a hurried knock at his door. He is currently not within the Jedi Temple, and had instead decided to go back to his original seat of office. He would soon be trying to construct a ship meant to be used as an end-all, the all device against everyone and anything. What is it? Palpatine is currently frustrated as well because despite things now going back on track, he was also still angered by events that have lead him to his position now. He thought he had more time before the Yuuzhan Vong showed up, but it would seem that there was some sort of greater force at work. Emperor, sir, an intelligence officer walked in, or more like briskly made his way over towards Palpatine. It is Biss. Biss. Palpatine was intrigued now, not really worried about that place, for it is well protected and hidden. Even if this officer before him was panicked, Palpatine would not be panicked himself, fully confident that this place is completely and totally secure. Yes, Emperor. Biss has been attacked by those those creatures. The intelligence officer said, not to sure what to call them. Attacked now Palpatine is most definitely surprised as one thing goes right another goes wrong. Yes, those creatures have overtaken your sacred land and have already started to fortify there. The officer reported, but just as all things happen with tyrants receiving bad news, Palpatine did something they would all do. Palpatine raised his hands and started blasting, specifically started blasting force lightning towards the officer, no longer needing this person or even needing them at all. Replacements are sure to fill in the leftover position, and Palpatine is able to relieve some pent-up anger from the situation and this new event. Damn it, Palpatine exclaimed internally as he stared outside the window into his empire that he had worked so had to create being on the verge of collapse. I will not let this happen. I have worked too hard for this. Master Jedi, come back to this planet you have. The Jedi had come to Coruscant, that is currently under a very strict lock and key. The Jedi were here undercover, as most of the army brought here is not in fact here within the Coruscant system, and is instead being hidden away. Yes, you have come here hidden, correct? The one whom replied is Obi-Wan Kenobi, as he was sent here to speak with an agent that stayed here, hidden on Coruscant. The Jedi had been able to go undercover, stay hidden, and make sure they are not discovered by any of the forces within Palpatine's new galactic empire. Of course. Of course I did. I would not allow that Sith to discover myself, and so too the others have gone into hiding as well. Not all of the Jedi had escaped after all and some had to make due with their new situation. Obi-Wan talking this one random hidden member of the Jedi Order, despite all of the new restrictions in place to seek and destroy Jedi in place by Palpatine, is just another hinge in Palpatine's plans. While Palpatine has completed his goal, his plans have not come to an end just yet. 
With the Jedi Order still in existence, even with smaller numbers, along with the Emperor and now the Independence War going on, Palpatine still has a lot of things to deal with. Again, another factor is the Yuuzhan Vong as well, which the Jedi Master Obi-Wan Kenobi is just about to learn about from this Jedi informant he is speaking with. That is good. Obi-Wan sighed with some relief, knowing that some of the Jedi Order's members survived outside of the temple. I need you to try and inform anyone and everyone possible. That safe haven can be found with the Emperor in the Outer Rim. The Outer Rim? The Emperor? I never would have thought that the Jedi would go there. Did you guys ask for help from the Chosen One? The informant asked. I don't know what or how things have gone, but one can assume that yes, the Emperor's Emperor has decided to help the Jedi. Obi-Wan confirmed, not really knowing the political situation himself. That must mean that we are going to win then are we going to get any other assistance from the Emperor? The informant said the first part to themselves. No. You seem to have misunderstood something. From what I know the Emperor will defend themselves, and defend those that take refuge within the Emperor but will not be taking any aggressive actions against anyone at this time. Obi-Wan replied, What? The informants seemed a bit disappointed, for if they had the help of the Emperor, they would surely be able to at least win this fight against Palpatine. Anyway, there is some rather pressing and imminent news. What is it? Obi-Wan seemed to sense the seriousness of the situation. There are these creatures, an entirely new being foreign from the galaxy and have come to make some kind of talks with the Sith Lord. There are rumors going around about their people, culture and all sorts of other things as well. The informant said, There are some reports taking that they are vicious, unrelenting and extremely powerful. What is even more disturbing is the fact that some Jedi Order members have gone up to them, not exactly faced off, but at the very least seen them, and they could not be sensed through the Force. The informant continued, What? Creatures that can't be sensed through the Force. How is that possible? This is definitely a shock to Obi-Wan, and he most certainly would be bringing this information back to the Jedi Council. Hopefully this species wasn't about to ally themselves with Palpatine in some way, as this would mean things are about to become even more dangerous. Especially for Force sensitives that rely on the Force to sense things. We don't know yet. However, it would seem that they are from outside of the known galaxy, possibly even outside of the undocumented regions of space, and from another outside galaxy themselves. The informant replied, There is very little information on these creatures, their origins and what they want, but they managed to gather some very basic information themselves. Soon enough, there may be a wave of information concerning these new beings and what they want. This is getting more complicated. I am not sure if we should continue our attack now. Obi-Wan thought to himself for a moment as he started to assess the situation. And if Darth Sidious had not done much with them, they should still have a chance. This all hinged on the fact that Palpatine has no idea that the Jedi are coming to him right here and now. Thank you for this information. The Council wants everyone else to escape from here if possible and to get the message around that everyone should take refuge within the Emperor. There is where you and others will find safe haven. Obi-Wan reasserted that the Emperor is where they must go. There are things to do here as well, but only the more powerful of Jedi should stay and meet up at the predetermined locations ahead of time. There we will be doing something that will hopefully put an end to this farce once and for all, and if not, then it will at the very least hit Darth Sidious hard. Obi-Wan continued, Okay. I will tell everyone that. One last thing however is that this species has an army of their own. While exact numbers have not been seen, there have been some view of their strength at play alongside their numbers. The informer said their last words. They also don't go by and use normal conventional technology, instead using things that seem to be made out of entirely organic matter. The informant added, Interesting anyway, I will be on my way then. May the force be with you. Obi-Wan replied, filing away all of the information given to him for later usage. And may the force be with you as well, Master Kenobi. The informant replied in kind. The Dark Side Cave, also known as the Cave of Evil, was a cave on Dagoba, containing a powerful Dark Side manifestation of the Force. Made during a long time ago, around 700 years and if we are being exact about it, then this cave was made 678 years ago, nearly 679 years ago. The Dark Jedi that had come to this planet eons ago, was a Melb Fassi, and the leader of a group of Dark Jedi during the Great Peace of the Republic. Through some historical records, long since lost but Anakin having restored from the Jedi archives that have long since been decaying, he was able to discover more about Dagoba in this cave. The group of Dark Jedi was pursued in all that time ago by a Jedi team. In a cave on Dagoba, 
he was confronted by Minch, who was eager to fight the humanoid and prove his mettle. The Pfassi mocked Minch calling him a small child and scolded him for his anger and weakness. Enraged, Minch defiantly replied size matters not, and attacked. The Dark Jedi quickly repulsed the attack, and replied that size indeed mattered. Apparently changing his form into hundreds of smaller incarnations of himself, the Dark Jedi enveloped Minch, who desperately lashed out with his lightsaber. When Minch recovered, the Dark Jedi was mortally injured, and told him he had potential as a Dark Jedi. His blood seeped into the cave floor as he died, and was the cause of the many dark side energies and phenomena that would occur in the same location, that became known as the Dark Side Cave many years later. You must know about the history of this cave, right Yoda? Anakin did not call Yoda as master, and would not be calling anyone as master anymore. Teacher maybe, but master never. Some knowledge, I do have. Yoda replied, having trouble seeing through this dark passage. You must also know of the term Dark Jedi, right? Anakin asked. I do. Yoda replied. A Dark Jedi, on the other hand, has much smaller ambitions. He, or she, thinks only of himself. He acts alone. The ultimate goal is not galactic conquest, but personal wealth and importance. Like a common thug or criminal, he revels in cruelty and selfishness. He preys upon the weak and vulnerable, spreading misery and suffering wherever he goes. Anakin said, reciting some lines about the nature of a Dark Jedi. Or at least that is how the Dark Jedi are seen as. Anakin added this finishing comment as the eeriness of the cave started to stir some strange emotions within Yoda. It is quite magical even, despite the dark, cold and quite frightening prospect of being unable to see just what is within the dark. Dark Jedi, also known as Fallen Jedi, were Force sensitives, frequently former Jedi, who chose to deny the light side of the Force or follow the dark side. Although Dark Jedi originally referred to a Jedi who had fallen to the dark side, it could also refer to uninitiated Force sensitives, who received no Jedi training, but began their careers under another Dark Jedi. Others were simply Dark Side users who did not follow the teachings of the Sith or other Dark Side organizations. In some cases, Dark Jedi also included artificial Force sensitives who served the Dark Side, such as the Reborn and the Shadow Troopers. The first Dark Jedi was believed to be Zender, who was the first member of the Jedi Order to fall. Other forerunners included Ajunta Paul and others who, after the Hundred Year Darkness, were exiled from Galactic Republic space and became the ancient progenitors of the Sith Lords. Ultimately, the title became something of a blanket term for Darksiders who could not be classified as belonging to any specific Darkside organization. Dark Jedi also became a term of note during the Great Sith War and the Jedi Civil War, where fallen Jedi served under the banners of Iksa Kun and the duel of Darth Revan and Darth Malak, respectively. Thousands of years later, Sith Lords such as Palpatine, would resurrect the term, with agents serving under him bearing the title. Those whom the Miraluka Jerek controlled came to be known as the Seven Dark Jedi. Fallen Jedi they are, lost to the dark side, but not Sith, Yoda spoke in turn, going over his own beliefs of what the Dark Jedi are. Tell me Yoda, what do you think of the light side of the Force? Anakin questioned, as he was currently the one doing the trial taking place. He is in complete control over the dark side energies here, slowly manipulating everything to explain things in a way that would push Yoda over an edge. The light side of the Force, also commonly known as the Ashlab by ancient Force sensitives on Tython, or simply the Force by the Jedi, was a method of using the Force, that entailed the devotion of oneself to the will of the Force, and was aligned with honesty, compassion, selflessness, self-knowledge and enlightenment, healing, benevolence, mercy, and self-sacrifice. Obviously, path of the light is the path of the right, Yoda said in jest, saying a joke to get off the negative emotions he may be feeling as of this moment. I see what you did there. I already mostly know about your view on this subject, but what I am really interested in is your view of the dark side of the Force, Anakin replied, urging Yoda to continue laying out his thoughts. The dark side of the Force, called Bogan or Boga by ancient Force sensitives on Tython, was a method of using the Force. Those who used the dark side were known as either Darksiders, Darkside Adepts, or Dark Jedi, when unaffiliated with a dark side organization such as the Sith. Unlike the Jedi, who used the light side of the Force, Darksiders drew power from raw emotions and feelings such as anger, hatred, greed, jealousy, fear, aggression, megalomania and unrestrained passion. The dark side those who used it, overridden an individual's character, consumed their souls is. Yoda responded, Interesting, but have you ever thought to stop and think about what the Force is as a whole, 
and how the nature of both the light and the dark side similarities. Anakin further questioned. Anakin continued with this line, not waiting for Yoda's answer. Submitting to the light side meant the death of the self, and sacrificing for the cosmic force, an aspect of the force that bound all things together, and communicated its will to all life under the aspect known as the living force, the energy of all life. What if I said that the light and dark sides were the two methods of using the force, whereas the force itself is detrimental to individuals, and thus should be removed from existence? Proponents of the light side rejected the dark side for its result of consuming life, where submission to either side the force is a betrayal of the self. Anakin finished. Deep within herself, Ahsoka could be seen meditating, but also being a sneaky person within the Jedi transport ship heading towards the Jedi Order's mission. What did that vision mean? Ahsoka thought to herself. She started to remember just what she was doing before she had gotten on board, and had sneakily gone around the Jedi's transport ship. In fact, there was many transport ships for the hundreds of Jedi, that were ready to fight for their order, and Ahsoka had just gotten on the correct ship she needed to be through luck. Or it is because of her acute sensitivity to the Force, that allowed her to so innately and quickly choose the correct ship. She had done no prior research into this beforehand, and had decided that this is her best course of action. It's for Anakin, yes. For Sky Guy Ahsoka thought to herself again, whilst also feeling some slight frustration that he wouldn't at least indulge her some more, for she was getting greedier. While Ahsoka's Jedi training, that never even happened, was meant to bring out the good side of her personality. She was also plagued by several more aggressive tendencies. When in combat, she displayed determination to win, similar to how Anakin's disposition, as she would also occasionally sulk when things didn't go her way. She was known to be quite aggressive in her postures and actions, willing to use terror and threats as a means to get information. Even though she obviously did not intend to follow through with any of these threats, Ahsoka adored being with her Anakin, and was proud of her position as his apprentice, even though she would also like to be something more. However, saving those thoughts, she also has this very strong capability within the Force. Since Ahsoka had not had her way, and had also been subject to some rather strange and frightening visions about Anakin, she decided that she would investigate things herself. Her first point of deduction needed to come from somewhere she wouldn't be allowed to go to, and that is towards Palpatine. Right now, she had grown a bit of confidence within her abilities, and believed that she would be able to at least have the power to face off against Sidious for a short, while enabling her the ability to retreat if need be. She isn't stupid, and knows that despite being the apprentice of the Chosen One, there is no way the short amount of time she had been training could compare with Palpatine's strength. Let alone the fact that Anakin was special in his training and ability to move through the ranks so quickly and become powerful more quickly, there is near no way she would become that powerful that quickly. So, she would only be coming along with the Jedi Order's transport ships so she could get the answers she wanted. Those visions again, she thought back to the visions she had seen about some kind of future. Most of the time when I see these visions they are about some alternate version of myself and Anakin or anyone else for that matter. This time it would seem that there is something more at stake than just looking into the hearts of others. Ahsoka still in the cramped space that she is could meditate even if not in a good position. Rifling through her memories, Ahsoka comes across the scene she saw during that vision. There she was, sitting down and doing some basic, routine meditative exercises using the Force, whilst also making sure to not trust the Force too much as well. No matter what she sees or hears, or whatever she senses she knows that the Force won't always be on her side. Or maybe it is, as it is with Anakin, because what she had seen was a lot of good and bad inadvertently happening to Anakin because of a lot of factors. Of course those factors seem to have been resisted by Anakin, but in general, the overall progression of what is happening within this universe or timeline, or whatever it would be called is still following some general path. Stars, space, and the great void known as nothingness is before her, with nothing but a weird spiraling thing at the center. In her vision, it was hazy. But she was able to make out the black dot at the center known as a black hole. The location of this black hole, she knows not but from her distance, or from what she assumed the distance was, the black hole is huge. Probably one of the largest black holes in existence. Light distorted around it alongside anything else that was made up of matter becoming a part of the monstrous construct. Even the force itself seemed to bend around it, 
Which was strange, for there is only one other thing that the Force would bend itself around like that. That thing being Anakin. Ahsoka didn't want to get closer, for she felt as if she would come to and end if she did. Even though it is a metaphorical dream, or vision coming from the Force itself, she had an innate fear for her existence. If she ever went closer to that thing, the distance away from it she is now seemed appropriate, where from that fear, she tried to get away as well. The scene changed, revealing something else other than the massive black hole at the center of everything. There she was, surrounded by what seemed to be the death of the Jedi, as they tried to go after Palpatine. And what was shown next is also the absolutely scale of the beings known as the Yuz and Von. Their ships ready, prepared for battle and seemingly going after what seemed to be the planet of Tatrine. Next was the show of lights and colors, resulting in the construction of the long-lost technological marvel known as the Star Forge. Going up in defense and producing things to go against the Yuz and Von, and fend off their attack against the Emperor. Finally, the last scene she had seen is that of a being made up of entirely black mass. It writhed, shifted and seemed to be alive with something appearing before Ahsoka's eyes and a mouth. You who are you? The voice resembled that of a woman, and the black mass shifted turning again into something else, revealing its true form. Why have you come here? A humanoid and barely female being with deeply sunken black eye sockets and tiny silver eyes, reminiscent of tiny stars at the bottom of a deep well. She had a long cascade of straw-like, honey blonde hair that reached to the ground, and a large, full at mouth that stretched from ear to ear, and contained needle-like teeth. Her arms were stubby, protruding no more than 10 centimeters from her shoulders, with hands that had long, writhing tentacles for fingers with suction cup tips. Her body was rigid and straight, and as she walked or ran towards Ahsoka, her legs rippled forward more than they swung. In addition, her body was enshrouded in mist, giving her an ethereal aspect to her already frightening appearance. You should not see me like this. I shall banish you. The woman's voice said as she reached out towards Ahsoka. But it was all for naught as Ahsoka returned to the real world. It was then that Ahsoka realized that there is something grand in scale going on that she needed to look into. She was told that the Force could not be trusted. At least not be trusted all of the time. But she had a feeling that resonated with her from the depths of her soul that this was something real. All of it is very real and could potentially happen. I will protect Anakin, and show that I am ready. What she was referring to, one could only guess. What in the name of the Emperor is this place? Men, five men to be exact, were walking within a place that seemed to lack a presence within the Force, despite it also being a living creature as well. They were a part of the Emperor and military forces, and had successfully boarded the Yuuzhan Vong's vessel. It was about time that they decide to send in some of the Space Marine sense to start wrecking havoc from within the ships. Maybe even try to take control of the ships if they could, but there is no chance they would be able to. Even with the Force, the sense could not be compared to really any other being that was naturally born with the Force themselves, meaning that they needed to work together a lot of the time to bring their Force abilities to their fullest. The insides of the ships was actually a bit creepy, but it is not like these five men have not been on expedition to places like this before. In fact, these five men, large and imposing as they are, were one of the many squadrons that happened to be deployed to fight against the huts on their adoptive home planet. I don't know, Captain, but upon the orders we received, I think that we should be careful. Who knows what kind of defense mechanisms are in place here? One of the men said, We also can't rely on the force as well, remember. That's right like the beings piloting this place. The ships as well are similarly made out of the same material. I remember hearing that the Yuz and Vong and their vessel do indeed actually have a connection to the force. But it is in another way. A way that we cannot detect. That is true. The captain replied as they went further into this ship, awaiting and being cautious for any potential attack on their beings. These men are actually within what is known as a Koro's Strona. World ships in galactic basic standard were immensely large, organically created spacefaring vessels that housed entire communities of the extra-galactic Yuuz and Vong, providing them with food and shelter. They also served as a staging ground for long battles. Similar in function to the reborn Emperor Palpatine's Eclipse-class Super Star Destroyers, a world ship was a transport, battleship and a psychological weapon all in one. Like all other Yuuz and Vong vehicles and vessels, the Koro's Strona, or world ship, was made of Yurik Coral. The Yurik Coral also formed symbiotic relationships with countless other organic materials to provide weapons, propulsion systems and defensive capabilities. More Lua served as a recycling system, as well as provided valuable life support to the vessel. A world ship had more in common with a planet than a starship, 
and, like most other Yuuzhan Vong bioengineered vessels, it did not appear to be a starship at all. Its main body was a disc-shaped bulk littered with hundreds of weapon projections and other protrusions. On the edges of the world ship were several large spiral arms, causing the ship to resemble a galaxy. In areas where the gravitational pull was weak, including the region between galaxies, the Koro's stroner extended membranous tendrils, called Outrider Ganglia. Each tendril was anchored by hundreds of coralscopers, which helped unfold the membrane. Once unfurled, the ganglia served as cosmic sails. World ships were protected by hundreds of Yarrick core emplacements that spat molten slag at enemy vessels. These ranged from starfighter-sized cannons to turbolaser-sized weapons, similar to those used by the New Republic. These magma weapons ranged from small openings, with the capability of blaster cannons, to large emitters which could shoot flaming rocks the size of small starships over great distances. The Koro Stroner's weapons were spaced sporadically and recharged slowly as new magma was produced, though they proved fantastically accurate despite their unconventional technology. Another weapon was the huge, tubular worm called the Dread Weapon, which extended from the bowels of the world ship. The Dread Weapon could be used to gather nutrients for the world ship to stay alive. The Goros Fen served a similar function. There are no defenses within these ships, other than the inhabitants themselves. But these five men didn't know that. Nor did they know they this place that they had entered through is uninhabited by those that are in control. Thus began their long search for someone or someones as they try to complete their mission. Whether this be through violent acts that would be the death of many of these life forms, or through some sort of peaceful negotiations, which obviously should be off the table at this point. However, while Anakin decided that looking for peace all of the time wasn't the answer, he also didn't want to have this off of the table. So obviously, the military had also been trained when it comes to negotiations. Wait. The captain hissed quietly as everyone started to conceal themselves as best they could for a being came right around the corner. Sloping, almost ridge-like forehead pointed ears, short, stub-like noses, making their face appear skull-like. Small blue sacks could be found under the eyes, grey skin, dressed in a deep-set black-blue armor. That was not connected to anything related to technology of this galaxy. This being stopped as if sensing something and decided to look around. But because the space marines were hidden, they remained unseen and undiscovered by the Yuuz and Vong soldier. Okay, let's go interesting. But have you ever thought to stop and think about what the Force is as a whole? And how the nature of both the light and the dark side similarities? Anakin further questioned Yoda, whom seemed to contemplate Anakin's words. Anakin continued with this line, not waiting for Yoda's answer. Submitting to the light side meant the death of the self, and sacrificing for the cosmic force, an aspect of the force that bound all things together, and communicated its will to all life under the aspect known as the living force, the energy of all life. What if I said that the light and dark sides were the two methods of using the force, whereas the force itself is detrimental to individuals, and thus should be removed from existence? Proponents of the light side rejected the dark side for its result of consuming life, where submission to either side the force is a betrayal of the self. Anakin finished. Anakin gave Yoda another undetermined amount of time, which should really be a few minutes but could be longer, to figure out and think on Anakin's view of the Force. One may wonder just what Anakin is trying to achieve through talking, communicating or discussing things with Yoda. One would also wonder why Anakin didn't immediately have Yoda face off against the dark side of Dagobah's dark side cave here. Let's see if my ability to change fate is a real thing, or not Anakin thought to himself as he watched Yoda think over his words. The Force is in all things however to deny is such, is detrimental itself, in on, it is. Yoda finally replied, remembering his own teachings, studies and experience with the Force. The Force has never led you astray, down a path that you wish not to take. Anakin questioned, obviously not going to receive an answer this time. He continued, Do you understand what I meant by my words? How I could come to that conclusion and as to how others could also see it that way? Your view, I see. However disagree with your assessment I do. Yoda responded, Simply not. It is enough to know the light of Jedi. Feel they must. The tension between the two sides of the Force in oneself and in the universe, one must. The largest group of proponents and teachers of the light side were the Jedi Order, who strove to maintain peace and justice throughout the galaxy. 
The Jedi were well aware of the dangers of the dark side of the Force, and were dedicated opponents of its use, as it represented corruption and a disregard for the natural order of the universe. So you do agree that balance is not with just one side, but both sides of the Force. Anakin was trying to further push what Yoda believed from him. This would give him a better idea on how he is going to test Yoda, for a lot has changed and he won't rely on faulty information that is probably no longer relevant, especially now so due to himself being so different, thus indirectly derailing a lot of things within the normal timeline. Way to go the light side of the force is, for the dark is corrupting. Yoda responded, still not giving up on the idea that without the dark, the light wouldn't exist. Have you ever heard of this phrase? There is no dark without the light, and vice versa. Anakin asks, no of this I do, but different the forces. Yoda replied, is it really? Anakin asked again, but this time it is more of a rhetorical question. Let's say that there is only the dark. In this manner, one would not be able to tell it is dark for all they know is the dark. Then what if it was light? One would only know it is what it was always like. The concept of light and dark exist as opposites and can only do so because there is something opposing them. The light side of the Force was aligned with happiness, joy, love and benevolence, or alternatively simply calmness, which some believed nurtured the light side and provided insight into its ethical uses. Anakin continued, It was generally concerned with the ideas of good, generosity, healing and wisdom as opposed to evil, harm and hasty judgment. In order to achieve harmony with the light side of the Force, its practitioners would often meditate to clear themselves of emotion, particularly negative emotions such as aggression, anger, and hatred, since these were shown to open a Jedi to the possibility of acceptance of the dark side. Anakin further explained, Predictably, this offered several contradictory instances, with some works favoring a calm, emotionless, and sometimes even outrightly unfeeling view of the light side, while others aligned it with positive emotions. Anakin finished, the the light side was treated as being both a form of impersonal intelligence and an essence of good. According to the self-aware interpretation, the light side was held to actively influence events to the degree that some Jedi thought of themselves as mere tools of the Force. Though this implied a lack of choice regarding an individual's fate, the Jedi, as leading proponents of the light side, insisted that it was, rather, the ultimate free will. This they explained as being because the Force, at least the light side did not compel anyone. A destiny could be accepted or spurned, and all choices along the way were free to make. At this point, it seemed as if Yoda is the one learning and Anakin is the one teaching, and it is true for Anakin would continue. Evil began in a time before recorded history, when magicians made themselves into kings and gods using the powers of the dark side of the false. The weak-minded have ever been ready to obey one who wields great power. Anakin started again. Those who learned the powers of the dark side were quick to exploit this weakness to make war. Again and again the dark side has surged forth, like a storm devouring whole worlds and entire star systems. Those who mastered dark power became dark power. Anakin continued. They unleashed destruction for no other reason than for selfish gain. They despoiled nations destroyed whole civilizations. Some of them. I am sure you would be ashamed to say, would Jedi. Anakin finished. No, never would the Jedi be like you say. Yoda denied this of course, but this is only natural for historic records are quite obscure, and no one truly knows what actually went on in decades long since past. Someone once said to me that the dark side of the Force is not evil, for evil is a word used by the ignorant and the weak. The dark side is about survival. It's about unleashing your inner power. It glorifies the strength of the individual. Anakin replied, not agreeing with Yoda or denying his disbelief. The difference between the dark and light sides appears to be in how force-sensitive beings feel aware of the opposing sides. The light side at times can be described as a flowing river. Soothing, constant, with hidden strength. In contrast, the dark side can be described as a roaring fire. Obviously powerful, seductive, and potentially dangerous. Anakin continued, While the light side represented the compassion and tranquility of all beings of the galaxy, the dark side focused on individual passion and strength. Again, while the light side is about maintaining the status quo, the dark side is about change and evolution. Anakin finished. Looking at the dark space they are in, Anakin decides that it is finally time for Yoda to face the dark side to truly see what it is. To confront whether his belief that the dark side is only evil, and to confront that the light side can be just as evil as well. 
I think it is time we move on from this subject, as discussion will get me nowhere anymore. What needs to happen to change your view will happen. Anakin said as he directed Yoda towards a light in the distance. It is there that you will begin your true voyage into the dark side. And how you come out is how you are meant to be. Or you can take my advice, and think for yourself. Be selfish. But not to the extent that it harms others. Good luck, or as most Force sensitives would say, may the Force be with you. Anakin finished. Yoda bowed a bit towards Anakin, before starting to walk over into the direction that would change a few things. Whether this actually changed the path of the Jedi or not depended on Yoda's choice now. Will I eventually be physically transformed? Palpatine remembered a conversation he had with his once master, Darth Plagueis, as Palpatine questioned his master. Into some aged, pale-skinned, raspy-voiced, yellow-eyed monster, you mean. So such as the one you see before you. Surely you are acquainted with the law. King Omen of Onderan, Darth Sion and Nihilus. But whether it will happen to you, I can't say. Plagueis said first before continuing. Know this, though, Sidious, that the power of the dark side does not debilitate the practitioner. So much as it debilitates those who lack it. The power of the dark side is an illness. No true Sith would ever wish to be cured of. Darth Plagueis finished his reply. Today. I bring you all here today to discuss some things. Some changes brought upon this now sovereign state now under my rule. How could I not consider my subjects when we are clearly in need of some proper unity among everyone? Palpatine called out to everyone within the Senate Hall. By now, the Senate is nothing but a formality. Just as it was before, now the only difference is that everyone knows it is a formality while they didn't realize so before. Great Emperor Palpatine, my lord, may I ask why you have brought us here today? While it is just all formality and most people don't hold any power or sway anymore, that didn't mean they are totally out of it yet. Meaning that they should be able to question and speak with Palpatine on matters for at least the next few days or so, due to them also having to be placated as well. After all, who in their right mind would accept the rule of Palpatine? The only reason being that they don't truly understand, know of his character and other factors like Palpatine's military strength and even influence with other wealthy and powerful individuals. Yes, how good of you to ask. I was just about to get to that Palpatine responded, making sure to remember the face of the person that had spoken up against him in a somewhat disrespectful tone. It still wouldn't be good to outright display his cruelty and focus the public's attention on other things as he has always been doing. Occupying the minds of others with the conflicts or tragedies of others is better, for it distracts them from what Palpatine is doing or about to do. I have had an encounter of sorts. An encounter with a mysterious species that simply go by the name of the Yuz and Vong, and they are a species that come from outside of the known galaxy. Palpatine said, alerting all of those within. While this meeting is not broadcasted, the a few remaining members were still there and didn't know about things like this. Again, Palpatine kept the Yuz and Vong a secret to all but a few. But now that they are here, there is no point in hiding them anymore. It may in fact be a good thing for him, for he could potentially rally the people against the xenophobic and slavery-based aliens. Everyone within the Senate building is of course confused, so information was sent over towards everyone, and soon enough people within the Galactic Republic would be aware of this new species. The Yuz and Vong and I have forged an alliance of sorts that will have both sides benefiting. By keeping the Emperor distracted, we will be able to start influencing and taking control of more systems again. Of course, Palpatine didn't go too in-depth with what his actual thought process is. However, it wouldn't be too hard to connect the dots that he is in fact using the Yuz and Vong instead of being an actual ally at this point in time. Some applause happened as Palpatine further explained some things, whilst simultaneously keeping some plans, ideas and thoughts out of the minds of the people here. That is all. The Senate meeting Palpatine held was now drawing to an end as information was given, some of his plans were also spoken, thus leading to the end. Thank you all for coming in such great times of need and distress, Palpatine's voice could be heard from within, where there were some figures gathered around in preparation for something. Within the darker parts of the Senate building, the Jedi, or more specifically a small group of Jedi that is composed of most of the Jedi High Council, had gathered. Of course, there was some exceptions to this, where Yoda is again seemingly nowhere to be found at this time, but is mostly unneeded as of this moment. Palpatine's muffled voice could still be heard as he received platitudes, and said various things related to some completely irrelevant matters. Mace, becoming the leader of this plan was currently in charge, and also prepared to go through with their plan. Master Windu, are you sure that this is a good decision? I have a bad feeling about this. 
Obi-Wan spoke up, relying on his instincts to know that whatever is going to happen is probably going to turn out wrong in some manner. Master Kenobi, I think that you should just trust in the Force and trust in my plan. Mace responded, making sure to ease the nerves of everyone here. It is not every day one faces off against a practitioner of the dark side, even if most of them have at least encountered someone that has dabbled in such activities. Sure, but I think that some caution must be practiced. Do you not find it strange that Darth Sidious had called a meeting here and today? Obi-Wan questioned Mace, as the others were doing their own thing before the oncoming storm. Hopefully, they would be able to take care of things before things go out of hand. That may be. However, this is probably the only chance we can catch him off guard. Mace responded, which is reasonable since while security is high, at this moment security measures are at the lowest. There had also been reports about Palpatine's apprentices not being around as well, meaning that he had probably tasked them to go somewhere else. Or, they could be in hiding, just waiting for us to come out and start an attack Obi-Wan thought to himself. Get ready everyone, Mace said, which prompted everyone to turn their attention back towards the podium where Palpatine is located. Most members of the Senate at this point had given up on a lot of things. And what is even more interesting to the Jedi, however, is this new species, and their threat to them and the Republic. They had not given up on the idea that the Republic is still alive and well, when it really isn't. The Republic had at one point of time been a good thing, but has slowly descended into what it is now. Of course, the Jedi would still be in denial at this point, even with their foresight abilities cleared up due to Anakin's actions, they are still stuck in their ways. This is one of the reasons Anakin is currently discussing and keeping Yoda away from everything that is going on right now. Yoda being the Grandmaster of the Jedi Order and proper leader, makes it all the easier if he switches to and sees things from Anakin's point of view. And that my friends, my comrades and people of the Galactic Republic is how we will finally deal with everything that is happening to us. I would request that you all now go off and start to take back control of some lost territories from those traitors. Palpatine was still going on, not finishing off his speech just yet. It seemed as if he was waiting for something to happen. But no one here could actually tell that Palpatine was like a praying mantis, awaiting its prey to come close enough for him to get his pasty hands around them. I think that is about it for now there should be no more things to discuss. And instead I believe we should all go back to what we were doing before I called you all here. Palpatine continued, no one else daring to speak up and talk. Palpatine hadn't even been in this position of power for long. Or he had been in this position of power for a long time without anyone knowing and he had already cowed most of his opposition. Obviously, they had heard of some of the things he had done already, including killing off the stand-in leaders for the Trade Federation. The Galactic Senate was slowly being changed and reorganized into something else. An Imperial Senate. The Imperial Senate or Imperial Congress would be the de jure legislative body of the Galactic Empire though in fact it would hold little real authority. Instead, it is slowly being transformed to mainly serve as an advisory body to Emperor Palpatine. The Imperial Senate is to be the successor to the Galactic Senate of the Republic, which its reformation is nearly complete. Palpatine thought to himself, whilst looking around the still nearly full Senate despite everything that has happened so far. Rather than risk directly seizing power and overthrowing the Senate, Palpatine subtly manipulated the Galactic Senate into voting incrementally more and more emergency powers to the Chinese chancellorship during the short Clone Wars. By the end of the conflict, Palpatine had gained near dictatorial powers. In fact, it could now already be considered the Imperial Senate as Palpatine issued a decree creating a new class of planetary governors and sector moths appointed directly by the Chancellorship to oversee all star systems in the Republic. A minority of senators protested this action, but Palpatine brushed their complaints aside. As everything was finishing off, a commotion is heard in multiple locations around the Senate Hall, revealing that the Jedi had somehow made their way in and trapped Palpatine within. Your dark rule is now over Sith. Mace's voice could be heard saying these words. His purple lightsaber blaring to life for all those to see and start to flee from this area, as they didn't want to get involved. In fact, most of these people may just send in some guards to come and help the Emperor Palpatine out. Dressed in red robe garbs, Palpatine's hood obscured most of his features, but his eyes were clear for all of those within the sea. Senate members started rushing out, with droids rushing in, but being dispatched by the Jedi that had come into the Senate building. Yes, how interesting, Palpatine said, which confused the Jedi whom had come here as they were expecting something different to come out of his mouth. Maybe even some surprise to show on his face as this attack is completely unknown. My apprentices should have a fine battle ahead of them, 
which will lead me to also having to show my own capabilities. Palpatine seemed to be speaking to himself at this moment, which lead to Jar Jar Binks and Furious Olin to come out of hiding and expose themselves to the Jedi as of this moment. It would seem that you are still outnumbered Sith. I would suggest that you surrender now, or else Mace continued, still being the leader in charge of this operation, unafraid of the new additions to the team. However, the Jedi here would soon be in for a surprise, as Palpatine is not as alone as one would think he is within the dark side of the Force. Some of the former members that used to be a part of Dooku's own Sith Assassins, were actually here as well, revealing themselves. And there seemed to be enough of them here to now outnumber the small amount of Jedi that came here specifically. Am I really that outnumbered now? Jedi Master Windu, I would suggest that you shall be the one to surrender. Palpatine cackled a bit and then continued. Who am I kidding? You all shall die here and today. It is foolish that you would believe I would have no way of defending myself in this instance. The Jedi and Sith would then go to battle, facing off against each other in a battle that would be extremely dangerous to both parties. Not that the Jedi would care about themselves, which is foolish, and not that Palpatine would care about his own subordinates if they unfortunately died. It had already happened before in the man known as Darth Maul, whom had been abandoned by his master before all of this happened. In fact, Obi-Wan would come across someone that he has some knowledge of while Mace would be heading towards the center to try and take care of Palpatine himself, as he does have the ability to face off against the enigmatic Sith Lord. Remember me, joining Obi-Wan, we see him facing off against Ventress previously under Dooku. But since his supposed death, most of the trained individuals under Dooku have come under Palpatine. But after Dooku's re-emergence, few had gone back to Dooku. However, Ventress is most definitely not one of the loyal ones. Right. Obi-Wan replied in kind, igniting his lightsaber and preparing himself for the offensive and powerful Ventress to begin her attack. Back within the Yuuz and Vong ship, the squadron of Emperor Marines were slowly making their way from the very outskirts of the living ship, making their way deeper within. Captain, I think that we have some more immediate problems right now. One of the men said as everyone further approached and traversed this place. This place is living another one of the men responded, for even though they couldn't sense this place through the force itself, they are still able to notice signs of some kind of biological creature, which this place is. It is as if the ship is breathing. What is the problem, soldier? The captain ignored the one rambling to himself and instead focused on what the other said. There are readings coming from our armors that this place is incredibly toxic. I don't think any living creature is supposed to be here, not even the Yuuz and Vong themselves. The soldier responded, That may be, but we have very little information on these beings, and from what we understand currently, they are highly varied in their capabilities. The captain replied. The soldier went silent, agreeing with what his captain had just said, and instead everyone still continued their trek through this toxic part of the ship. This may be a place where these beings dispose of their waste. The captain thought to himself going over the possibilities of such a thing. While most would be disgusted, the marines had been trained, and not only that, some of them used to be machines before their subsequent transformation into living creatures. That could be considered cyborgs more than just human. From the roof of the cavernous part of the ship they were traversing, there seemed to be some dangling bits and pieces that were illuminating their path. Despite this place being a theoretical dump, it would seem that the Yuuz and Vong don't even waste this resource and probably use it elsewhere instead of just disposing of it immediately. What are these things anyway? One of the men, curious in nature, reached up to grab hold of the tentacle-like thing. No, don't touch that dash, however. His comrade was too late to stop him as of the next moment everything seemingly started to go into the dumps. The tentacles started to come alive, wrapping around the men, trying to strangle them while they are decked out within their protective armor suits. Damn it. The captain exclaimed trying to break free of the tentacles, being successful just like the others were as well. But the tentacles still kept coming, as if there was no end in sight for them. Sorry, Captain. I will never, ever touch things ever again. The curious one spoke up, apologizing for his mistake. There is no time for that right now. We must get out of here before others come looking. I am assuming that the Yuuz and Vong may have been informed of what is happening here. The Captain swiped his hand in one direction, immediately causing a tentacle to implode. Move. The Captain ordered and the men directed by his actions and words, moved out of the area. Avoiding detection within a living ship like this is hard. 
But now things have become harder as they try to remain stealthy. We have probably been detected already the captain thought to himself, deciding that they should get things to calm down a bit, before deciding to go on a full out assault. Right on it. One of the men exclaimed as they started to move in the opposite direction of the hanging tentacle-like vines and dump area. Having arrived on Coruscant and well aware of the Jedi having already started to make their move, Ahsoka was on her own to investigate some things. Things in particular that relates to those visions she was receiving back on Tatooine. I don't want to get too involved. But I am sure Sky Guy wouldn't mind me helping the Jedi for a little bit, as well as Soka thought to herself. She had after all seen the death of a lot of Jedi, and subsequently didn't like what she saw. So she has decided that she will not only investigate things, but also semi-help the Jedi Order in their endeavor. Specifically, she would be saving some Jedi as much as she could instead of participating in their assault on Palpatine. Now where do I go to locate all of those hidden Jedi? Ahsoka was currently in the underworld of Coruscant, trying to find herself around this area is dangerous. Palpatine had still not taken any moves to investigate all of the criminal undergoings of Coruscant. Not that he needed or wanted to, but it would have been good for if Palpatine did investigate he would have discovered some oddities. And here I thought this place would be more of a dump Ahsoka again thought to herself, as the Coruscant underbelly was actually clean. Not nearly as clean as above, but it definitely has a higher standard of living than what she had expected. Shady corners and shady businesses abound. Out of everything else that is down here, Ahsoka really couldn't tell too much difference from what is above and below, other than a few small differences. The Coruscant Underworld, Lower Levels, Undercity, Underground, Underlevels, or Lower Coruscant, were terms used to describe the lowest regions of the city planet of Coruscant, laid with a mixture of ancient and forgotten ruins from the planet's prehistory, along with modern-looking, crime-ridden venues and clubs. It was completely orderly instead of being a place filled with crime or back deals and shady individuals. In fact, it seemed as if everything that was happening underneath is separate from everything that is happening above. Different regions and levels ranged from the Millie CD, such as the Uskri Entertainment District in 1313, should have been progressively worsening as one descended, ending in areas of unending darkness, populated solely by hypertrophied vermin and zombie-like devolved humanoids. The underworld streets should have been riddled with thugs, and the walls and streets were home to all manner of strange creatures. However, instead of all of this, while there are some remnants of such a place as described remaining, in place of that is kind of a city beneath a city. Most of the underworld rested more than a kilometer below the urban surface in city platforms. It was beneath some of the greatest skyscrapers in the galaxy and other closely spaced spectacular buildings of Coruscant, where few rays of light filtered through to the gloomy section known as the underworld. Lying hundreds of stories below the skyscraper pinnacles, Coruscant's urban canyon floors never saw the light of day. Due to its enclosure by larger buildings, air was trapped in the lower levels, creating a microclimate of which there were at least three layers. Trapped moisture contributed to rainstorms and convective wind patterns within the canyon floors. A realm of artificial illumination, the lower levels of the galaxy's largest city, were the only affordable areas for many of the planet's citizens. Rumbling with machines that served the elite above, its streets haunted by exploiters and thugs, and its walls riddled with vermin, Coruscant's underworld toughened the strong and consumed the weak. Coruscant's underlevels harbored a larger population than many star sectors, leaving millions beyond the protection of the world's security force. Local neighborhoods were at the mercy of hired thugs and extortionists. The toughest faces sometimes belonged to vigilantes, who chose to defend the people on their own land from criminals. Garbage was compressed into thick blocks and stored in the deeper levels of the underworld. Much machinery that satisfied the needs of the well-to-do surface dwellers were also kept in the depths of the underlevels, and so there was a constant sense of motion and unrest. Artificial lighting barely brightened the dark and sorrowful levels. The underlevels were home to various mutant species, including the Chthon, Coruscani Ogre, Juracrete Slugs, Hive Rats, Shadow Barnacles, Conduit Worm, Towson, and Granite Slugs, which often posed a threat to sentient beings. Walking up to someone that Ahsoka thought would know of the place she is looking for, she asked. I am looking for some people with strange abilities. Do you know where I could find some? If Ahsoka outright said Jedi, there was no way that she would remain safe down here. Not that she is safe down here anyway, but things seem more orderly than what she had expected. Strange abilities, eh? The hooded figure responded, looking at Ahsoka who likewise is also covered herself. You looking for the Jedi? 
The person seemed to know just what exactly Ahsoka is looking for. Huh. This definitely confused Ahsoka. So she quickly recovered from her confusion and decided to just follow her gut instinct. That this person has information. I yes. I want to know where the hidden Jedi are located. You aren't the only one looking for them around these parts. Lass. There are a lot of places within the Undercity for people to hide, especially for people like the Jedi. I would have left the planet by now if I were them. But it would seem that things are more complicated on the surface. Then it is down here. The hooded figure replied. Really? Ahsoka rhetorically asked before continuing. So do you know where they are? Or at least point me in the direction of where I could possibly find them. Secrets cost a price down here, especially secrets of this magnitude. However, since the big boss came around and changed everything here, protection for exiles like Jedi are a high priority or something like that. The hooded figure explained. Big boss. Where can I find this big boss? Ahsoka wanted to go straight to the top of the leadership here, knowing that dealing with pawns would probably get her nowhere. You want to meet the big boss. Are you new to this place? No one sees the boss, and most certainly someone whom is unknown. In fact, the big boss is probably the most mysterious person out of everyone down here. There is someone you could meet though, and that is the big boss's second in command. He is the one that takes care of most things down here. Or at least he is some sort of stand-in figure for the big boss. The hooded man seemed to fear this big boss. Right, so where can I find him? Ahsoka decided to use a little bit of persuasion through the force, which is successful. You can go this way. The hooded figure would then proceed to tell Ahsoka everything he knew, from certain locations to people and places that she should avoid, and most of all the importance of the lore of the Undercity. Someone had come down here and completely changed the landscape a few years ago making this place a proper place to survive and thrive within. Despite the formation of the Galactic Republic in 25,000 years ago, life in the underlevels was left unchanged by the new galactic government. Millennia after millennia during the Old Republic era, the Undercity stayed the same. During the Great Galactic War, food shortages caused riots in the underlevels. During the waning days of the Galactic Republic period, while the wealth and marvel of Coruscant gleamed on its exterior level, the underworld below degenerated even further, since the Republic was in decline. It served as a refuge for scum, petty crooks, as well as drug dealers, the poor gone bad, and other outlaws. Even the highest of the underlevels would have fell into ruin and disrepair. By the time of the Nabu Crisis, and the Clone Wars, if the mysterious big boss had not come. Seedy nightclubs, overlooked gambling corners, and trashy cantinas were actually areas of some of the higher sections of these run-down nether levels. The lowest levels of the underworld had such an unbelievable crime rate, that many areas were locked down by order of the government. These poor communities of desperate beggars and violent people, were isolated from the rest of society by enormous, impenetrable blast doors. Again, this changed when the big boss started to take over and change everything from the inside out. Not that the government on Coruscant would acknowledge such efforts, and instead it had become a community effort with everyone underneath to start help the reformation of the Undercity. Lower class immigrants who came to Coruscant, expecting to be living in the prosperity of the surface life, were all gradually sunken into the subterranean realms. Self-made neighborhood lookouts would often gain some small territory over their group of companions, and lesser, if lower ranks could at all be possible, thus occasionally creating a tight-knit and durable community who might have even withstood hoodlum fights and minor attacks. Usually though, once these vigilantes acquired weapons to protect their turf or began engaging in violence, even if in self-defense, there was always a great chance their strengthening community would collapse to eventual criminal influences. The big boss had made significant enough changes to everything happening in the Undercity, that he had become somewhat of a revered figure. No longer did people have to fear things like what was said above, even more so by the fact that the Undercity had kind of formed its own separate government of sorts. Coruscant, or the surface level of Coruscant, tried to take this down, but had remained largely unsuccessful, leading to the development of the Undercity at this point of prosperity. This was really not what I was expecting, Ahsoka thought to herself as she traveled deeper within the Undercity of Coruscant. Having gathered all of the information she needed to finally start to traverse and safely do so to find the leader, and then the hidden Jedi exiles. Jabitha, we are going to have to borrow you for a bit. Is that okay with you? It was Barris who asked the enigmatic living ship this question. Jabitha doesn't mind. Is Papa coming along with us? Jabitha sent the message telepathically, 
While Jabitha didn't telepathically say anything else to the three getting on board, and instead Barris, Shark and Xana started up the engines as they prepared and left Tatooine, heading in the direction of the Galactic Empire. Really why did the little one even go again? Xana was a bit frustrated, not that she hasn't already started to integrate herself into the small group of people already. Well the Force is kind of doing things. And because of this Ahsoka was able to pick up on this and receive visions of some kind. Barris gave a short explanation on the matter, for what felt like the hundredth time as Xana complained about it. Right. Xana replied, sitting down as the girls entered space and started zooming past several stops and points, heading straight towards their destination in mind. It should be a few hours yet before we arrive. Shuck said as she is probably the best pilot amongst the three of them on board right now. Isla stayed behind for obvious reasons, whilst Eve, otherwise known as the daughter, said something about not getting involved, because it would affect the galaxy and universe in negative ways or something like that. Eve was after all affected by the teachings of her father before her, and decided to head his words, even when she could see that Anakin himself is in complete control, or near complete control of himself within the Force. What exactly are we planning to do anyway? Help the Jedi? Xana asked, as she is disinclined to helping the Jedi right now, or even ever. We are just going to Coruscant to stop Ahsoka from doing anything stupid, and then dragging her all the way back to Tatooine. Hopefully by then, Arnie is done with whatever he is doing right now. Barris explained. Right, Xana replied. Fear not. I think that there is something going on at a grander scale, and that we are just missing the point. Shark intervened and added her own thoughts on the situation. I am sure, but it doesn't feel like it is of any good. Xana replied. Only time will tell now. Shark responded herself. Ha! Huh. Voices are heard, with labored breadth and an assortment of fast movements indicative of the intense battle happening. The Jedi and Sith with their respective lightsabers were going at it. Ugh. More voices were heard, as while being force sensitive is fun. And all, there is a lot left to be desired from the duties one has as a Jedi. Die Jedi. Again, multiple voices were saying an array of things and sometimes grunts, moans of pain, and a variety of noises were being made. Some of those noises produces by the force sensitive beings themselves, and some of those noises coming from their lightsabers. Not today, Sith. Deflections, parries and clashes were happening frequently within the Senate building, soon to be called and reformed into the Imperial Senate. The Senate building, also known as the Senate Rotunda, Senate Tower, Convocation Center, or Senate Dome, was the building on Coruscant in the center of the Senate District which served as the seat of the Galactic Senate from the end of the Great Sith War until the end of the Old Republic, also serving as the seat of the Imperial Senate during the Galactic Empire, with the Grand Convocation Chamber at its heart. The designers claimed that any weapon capable of destroying the chamber would also have to be powerful enough to destroy the entire planet, making the facility invulnerable against sabotage or orbital bombardment. A massive drum-shaped building boasting a shield-shaped dome with a diameter of more than two kilometers. The Senate building was built some time 4,000 years ago, following the duel between Jedi Master Vodo Siask Bars and Sith Lord Ixakan in the old Senate Hall. On Coruscant, new structures were typically erected on top of older buildings, eliminating the need for demolition. The ancient meeting hall of the Galactic Senate served as the foundations of the new Senate Tower. Located in the heart of the Senate District, the building was situated at the end of a large, flat concourse known as the Avenue of the Core Founders. This area was lined with tall, impressionistic humanoid statues, each representing a founder from each of the core worlds. Surrounded by the Senate Plaza, several parks such as the Gardens of Equality and Justice, served as meeting places near to the Rotunda. Adorning the front of the building were two narrow towers. One of these structures contained the primary office of the Supreme Chancellor during the Galactic Republic. The Summit Chamber's design was antiquated by the administration of Chancellor Finis Valorum, and offered a wide view of the capital. Following the election of Chancellor Palpatine, the former representative of Naboo ordered the construction of the Republic Executive Building and moved his primary working office to a brand new suite there. Entrance to the Rotunda was gained after passing through the ceremonial entryway known as the Great Door. Adorned with the Great Seal of the Republic and the sigils of the Thousand Worlds, the doors were open to all who might enter as symbolic of the Republic, as the iconography emblazoning the Jura Steel. Directly beyond the Great Door was the large atrium of the Senate. This grand, circular chamber was lined with statues of the Republic's greatest heroes and politicians, as well as members of the Jedi Order. The atrium continued on deeper into the building where a long, 
two-story hall granted access to several first-level embassies and conference rooms. Among the room's tower pillars, senators and diplomats gathered and conversed with one another, before proceeding on into the Grand Convocation Chamber, just beyond the chamber's far door. Occupying the majority of the building's central mass was the cavernous Grand Convocation Chamber, a tiered chamber sometimes referred to as the Senate Arena. The slightly sloping walls of the funnel-shaped room were lined with repulsorpods arranged in concentric patterns from floor to ceiling, which soared over a hundred meters high. The center of the vast chamber was dominated by a podium used by the Supreme Chancellor, the Vice Chair and the Senior Administrative Aide to coordinate the sessions. The chamber contained a total of 1024 repulsorpods, which could be used by delegations from member systems and large voting blocks. When a senator or representative wished to address the body, they were able to detach their pod from its magnetic berth and move out into the open space of the chamber on an automated path. From there, their address would echo throughout the room, translated into hundreds of different languages instantaneously, and piped into the other pods for ease of understanding. Small hovercoms constantly hovered around the chamber, recording the words of the speakers, and broadcasting them onto the ceiling-mounted vid screens to allow the congregation to view up close visuals of the orator. Because sessions tended to grow long and last into the night, natural light and air was not used to fill the room. Instead, an artificial glow kept the room lit so as to diminish the senator's sense of time. Directly beneath the convocation chamber was a series of rooms known as the Chancellery Secretariat, a set of offices used by the Chancellor and his aides while at the Senate building. At the heart of the Secretariat was the Holding Office, located directly below the Senate chamber and home to the Chancellor's podium when it was not in use. Before the start of a session of the Congress, the Chancellor and his aides would board the podium, and the ceiling would dilate, and the hydraulics driving the chamber would raise it into arena. A turbo lift was also installed under the Chancellor's seat, able to evacuate him from the podium, without having to lower it. Access to the chamber was granted through a small antechamber where the ceremonial blue-robed Senate guards stood at attention. The upper tiers of repulsorpods of the Senate chamber were each assigned a permanent delegation. These senators represented large voting blocks in the Senate, or held long tenures in the Republic, such as the representatives of the core worlds. These delegations were afforded permanent wedge-shaped offices, which included a multi-room preparation chamber adjoined to the delegation's platform, and a separate, larger set of chambers which stretched to the outer edge of the building, and served as a place for each delegation's countless aides to toil endlessly without need of travel. These offices were separated from each other by the sloping, canyon-like Grand Concourse, a long corridor that ringed the entire convocation chamber on each level. The black tile floor of the bridges and walkways that made up the concourse was punctuated by the towering silver impressionistic statues that lined it, similar to those found on the avenue of the core founders. Private turbo lifts lined the walls of the concourse, conveying senators to and from their offices, connecting them with the rest of the building. Security in the building was monitored from the main security center deep in the heart of the building. Senate guards protected the Senate chamber as well as delegation offices throughout the building, while members of the Coruscant Security Force patrolled the halls, which were otherwise open to the public. Communications throughout the complex were handled by the Senate Communications Center, which was responsible not only for broadcasting the Senate proceedings throughout the building and the galaxy, but for screening all incoming transmissions to senators and representatives. While each delegation pod in the chamber had privacy buffers under normal circumstances to prevent eavesdropping during private conversations, Supreme Chancellor Palpatine had this function disabled during the Clone Wars in an effort to increase security. Many storefronts and restaurants occupied the Senate building, allowing senators and their staff to shop and eat without leaving the complex. The Dining Commons was a formal eating establishment popular during the Clone Wars, while others preferred more casual eateries. Below the Senate Rotunda was the Senate Commercial District, wherein the Senate Commerce Hall and Galactic Trade Center were located. Everything within is meant to stand as a testament to the Galactic Republic. But things actually look much different now with the ongoing conflict between the Jedi and the Sith here in today. Jedi Master Windu, how nice of you to join me. Palpatine spoke, as he watched his opponent come closer to him, whilst his apprentices had already joined the fray, in trying to kill more Jedi. Your day of judgment has come Sith. Mace responded, his lightsaber ignited as the two masters through the Force, were now ready to face each other in deadly combat. Palpatine proceeded to bring out his very own lightsaber, that he doesn't bring out very often or even use at all. I am quite the old man now, as you can see. I would appreciate it if you go easy on an old man such as myself. 
Palpatine mocked. May leaped into the air, using the force and lunged down towards Palpatine, whom is on center platform. The Yuzhun Vong and the squadron on the ship known as a Koro Strona. Additional defense came from the world ship's cargo and troop holds, which could transport more than 5,000 warriors, along with Koroskopers and planetary vehicles. Due to the vehicle's size, the Koro Strona could transport a small Yuzhen Vong army. A Yuzhen Vong worldship lived for an average of 500 years or more. However, they could live up to twice that long as the Banu Maya proves. When a worldship started too near the end of its life cycle, it would develop color variations on its Dovan basils, and it would grow myogens in its corridors. Where are we now? One of the men within the squadron asked as they were passing through another area, going deeper into the living ship. From the scans, the data suggests that we have finally made our way into the main section of the living ship here. Above us should be an entire colony of those Yu's and Vong beings. Another replied with the statistics and analysis of the situation. They were in the bowels of the living ship right now. Underneath the normal area a living being would be able to inhabit. The only reason they are able stay down here is because they can make use of the life support systems of their armor suits. Alongside the empowerment given to them through the Sky Seed implants, and even the viral factor introduced to everyone on the Emperor to fill in the gaps. So those beings are above us. What should we do next then? Another asks unsure of the next course of action. They are supposed to try and take control of this word ship, as it would get in the way of the battle to come. The Emperor has collected a lot of information from their in-depth look into this place, and thankfully, none of the Yu's and Vong had found them so far. The Emperor's basic set of rules to follow in this situation would be to try and minimize any harm. That may be down to civilians. Even if their enemies may not necessarily care enough that the Emperor shows their people and and mercy. This is a decision that a lot of people can follow and abide, is one should treat others the way they are to be treated. Of course, there are some exceptions sometimes but most of the time one would follow that rule. And to follow this, the Emperor and military would not target civilians or innocent people at all. When it comes to conflicts, what the squadron here can do is try to make sure they are able to peacefully annex the current leaders within this living ship. Then, they would take the people as prisoners of war. Not that they would do anything unto with the captured subjects or anything like that. We should not be harming the civilians at all, and instead we need to find a way to get to the main control deck. If there even is some sort of main control deck, but going by this ship design, the scans indicate that there should be some form or method that we would be able to commandeer this place. Hopefully we also don't have to face off against everyone within as well, for that would truly be tragic. The captain said as they kept traversing, trying to identify a place that they would be able to burst through. Okay. Yes, sir. Let's do it. The men answered in turn their own replies, with one being silent and only nodding. The captain took it upon himself to start leading them through this undergrowth of the living ship. This way then, we are almost there, captain. Once we reach the point the scanners indicate, we should be able to start taking control of this ship, and then have these people as hostages. The Yu's and Vong do not need to know that we won't actually hurt their people. The member that is the diagnostics expert said, Good idea, soldier. The captain nodded along, liking the idea as it was a bluff, but a good bluff, and should be effective. That is unless the Yu's and Vong decide to not heed their words once they take control of the living ship. Having gone into the underbelly and exploring this place, Ahsoka has finally made her way to another place in particular. Making her way through the depths was much more of a nice experience than she had expected of course. What with there being some sort of entire world underneath the world above and all. Skyscrapers towered above the highest level on Coruscant, level 5127 upon which laid the galactic city. But under the surface structures the levels of Coruscant descended down all the way to level 1, which was deemed uninhabitable. The various levels of Coruscant were accessible by huge portals, that also served as ventilation shafts. Covered by the surface structures, sunlight did not reach the lower levels, leaving them in a perpetual state of darkness illuminated only by artificial lights for thousands of years. Under city dwellers often had to breathe toxic fumes from millennia of urbanization, while wealthy citizens in the upper levels had access to rich and filtered air. Influential crime families operated in the lower levels of Coruscant, which were patrolled by the Underworld Police Division of the Coruscant Security Force. Very little is known of the Coruscant under levels in the pre-Republic era. In 100,000 BBY, the lowest 50 levels of the planet-wide Ecumenopolis had been fully built over the entire surface. During this period, all native non-sentient species presumably became extinct, with the exception of the Thransil, 
which began to evolve with the new city, and the hawk bat, which stayed the same. Around that time, the big brain Kalumi visited the world and dismissed Coruscant as a primitive failure, despite the presence of the planet-wide city. Over the following millennia, the lower levels became the domain of criminals and vagrants. The bottom 50 levels that made up the underworld were buried under levels of juracrete and buildings. Several mutant species developed around this period, including the humanoid Chthon and the Corridagules. In fact, around five years ago, Asher Corder along with his associates attempted to euthanize the Coruscant underworld along with the entire planet itself with the Infant of Shah. The destruction of the Galactic Capital was hoped to be followed by the destruction of the Galactic Republic. However, their attempts to use the Infant were thwarted by Zam were Cell, Django Fett and Jarl Poof. This resulted in the deaths of Asher, all his comrades, and Jarl. One thing's for sure however, and that is at the very lowest levels of the city, were rumored to hold ancient secrets. What Ahsoka would be going to find out for herself. Entering another building, which seemed to have a multitude of buildings on top of it itself, alongside various other alien species from young to old. One could mistake this place for some sort of hub. It is a hub after all, and disconnected from the main government from above world of Coruscant and their higher levels. Ahsoka, covered up and making sure she is disguised headed into the building and saw many things happening. Sometimes there seemed to be people of varying species trying to gain help, which they would be successful in doing. A community had been built during a short period of time here in the Undercity, where this community is a very strong and united one. What is strange for Ahsoka however is how the way they act with each other, like it is some sort of family. The concept of the Mafia also existed here, whereupon it is also set up like that kind of environment as well. Excuse me. Ahsoka politely interrupted a woman, whom is dressed in a business suit and is of relative beauty whilst commanding some level of respect within this place. Yes, it was a human woman, and she replied with a questioning tone. I wanted to know where to find the big boss Ahsoka was starting to find it a little funny, that someone would even refer to themselves as the big boss. I just hope that this big boss isn't actually as big as I think he may be Ahsoka thought to herself, having a funny image pop up into her head. And who are you? The woman asked. I am just someone that comes from a far off place. Looking for some exiled people, Ahsoka replied, implying why she is here without actually saying anything that would give her away. Not that she is a Jedi herself, but with how abundant and active this place is, she could only assume that there may be some form of agents from whoever knows we're hiding within here. That wasn't the question, but I guess I understand what you want. I need to confirm if you are the exiles a lie or not, for everyone that comes here seeking refuge is protected. The woman replied, her authoritative energy beaming as of this moment. I need a name. Something that should be easily recognizable and deemed as an ally. From the top of her head, there was a few names that could help in this situation. And while there may be a few Jedi that know about her specifically, she hadn't been on the big screen unlike the others. After all, most of the others had their own marriage with Anakin while she was too young herself. Thus meaning that she is most likely only known to a few, for she was also quite isolated within the Jedi as well. Anakin, Ahsoka said, thinking that saying Anakin's last name would bring too much attention to herself. Not that Anakin's name isn't already widely heard about everywhere, but the difference is that most people only really have the Skywalker name or Emperor at the forefront of their minds when it comes to Anakin. Thus meaning his first name would be both significant enough, alongside also possibly giving her enough leeway to get to help the Jedi exiles. Okay, is that all? The woman asked. That is all, Ahsoka replied, and the human woman walked off going towards another area. Ahsoka used a force ability to enhance and focus her hearing capabilities, so she could tell what the woman is going to say, to whomever she may say it to. The general gist of what happened next was the woman speaking to someone on a communication device, which lead to some other things being spoken about. Specifically, the person on the other side seemed to want to know what Ahsoka looked like. The woman described her appearance, which seemed to be more than enough for the person on the other side to accept her. The woman came back after speaking to whoever was on the other side and said, They are willing to allow you to come to them. Good. I want to see them as soon as possible. Ahsoka totally forgot about the matter of seeing the big boss. You also said something about wanting to see the big boss, didn't you? The woman asked again. I, I did Ahsoka is unsure of where this might be heading towards. Unfortunately that isn't possible right now, as he is out at the moment. For some reason Ahsoka felt that the big boss has been out for a longer time than for a moment. 
That is too bad. Maybe some other time then Ahsoka was now more concerned with the Jedi exiles now, and getting them to safety. Even more so because of her visions that seemed to predict not only the demise of the Jedi, but also the demise of a lot of other innocent people as well. Right this way then, I will be your guide. The human woman said, as she started to make her way out with Ahsoka following closely behind. Something is wrong Ahsoka looked around and noticed that there is some people that are following herself and the human woman. Of course there seem to be some that are acting as protection, whilst there may be others here with more nefarious purposes, and somehow managed to overhear the conversation between herself and the woman. Either way, there seem to be a lot of interesting interested parties involved in this situation. What Ahsoka didn't know about the situation as well, is that she is also being followed by her comrades from the Emperor. They are hot on her heels that she even did that well of a job covering her tracks, and it wasn't like the others aren't able to track her using the Force either. This zone is not off limits for stuff like that. Joining the Jedi and Sith within the Senate Hall and building, one would notice that there seemed be a few people whom have died. Both the Jedi and the Sith were doing their jobs here, but there also seemed to be an overwhelming amount of Sith, so obviously the Jedi are probably going to lose. As more and more of the numbers dwindle, there is just no way for people to handle the situation at hand. While the battle seemed to be going on for hours, in reality, it was only a short amount of time that had passed. However, at least half an hour had gone by for things to start looking so desperate for the Jedi. Many lightsaber forms are being used alongside the assistance through the Force as well. One particular duel to keep an eye on is between Jedi Master Mace Windu and the Sith Lord, Darth Sidious. There is also another duel of importance, just like all of them are, and that is the fight between Jedi Master Obi-Wan Kenobi and the somewhat confusing Sith Apprentice, Ventress. Focusing in on Mace and Palpatine, Palpatine targeted more than just Windu. He immediately helped out, or really just wanted to go after the Jedi, instead of helping the other Sith. Force lightning abound, the electricity that poured out of Palpatine's hands, managed to cause pain to all of those that got in his way. Jedi and Sith alike, for his power is unlimited power, Sidious spoke his infamous line as he caused untold destruction to the building, not caring for the lives or damage he is causing within. This recklessness allowed Windu to take a step back from the situation, and rather his energy. He did not stagnate over the years and got stronger, especially since he was training Anakin, allowing him to still be kept on his toes. Looking around, Mace discovers that there seems to be some reinforcements coming from Palpatine's side, and there isn't anyone coming from all of the Jedi for they are elsewhere doing other things. This includes integrating themselves with the Jedi exiles, and slowly moving them off of the planet and towards their new refuge in the Emperor. Other tasks may include technical stuff as well, including even stealth missions to try and extract information from the systems of Palpatine's data. The lightning show came to an end as Palpatine taking out his lightsaber again started to go into a frenzied mode of attack against Mace. More and more Jedi were starting to be killed off, as there is little to no room to escape the pursuit of both the droids and the Sith, hunting them down like they were their prey. Their hatred, anger and other negative emotions fueled them in their desire to take them down. Mace had to once engage Palpatine as he seemed to have some sort of unnatural drive and energy, powering his physical form. We need to retreat. This isn't working, Mace thought to himself before giving the order. Everyone retreat, get out of here and then meet back up at the gathering spot. The Jedi in turn hearing this started to try making their way out of there, not wanting to die like the others. For even if the Jedi preach peace and death, that still doesn't mean that they want to die after all, and die right now, especially in a battle they are clearly losing. The Sith also responded in kind, making sure to make the escaping effort harder for the Jedi. Cowardice is the way of the Jedi, it would seem. Palpatine taunted Mace as he also distracted him using the Force, so he could get out of there as well. Retreating the Jedi within the Senate building have now dwindled in numbers, meaning that it would make it all the more easier for Palpatine to slay them all. Very good, very good, Palpatine said aloud, as the Sith and his minions had wreak havoc and destruction. Looking around, there were a few dead Sith, or at the very least Dark Side apprentices and initiates. But on the other hand, there was a lot more deaths on the Jedi side, for they not only brought Master here to die in this ambush, but also brought many of them to die as well. What makes Sidious upset however, is that it seemed like none of the people he wanted to make sure are taken care of, didn't become taken care of. Mace Windu, Obi-Wan Kenobi, Deepa Balaba, and a few others as the attack commenced, then subsequently finished. 
My apprentices and assassins, you all have much to do so I suggest that you all start moving towards those jobs. The Sith are not done in their work just yet. Palpatine cackled seeing some of them were burnt by his force lightning, but was still so obedient to himself. He reveled in the power he held, more so now because he can be open about it, and not worry about such things. Of course, now that the Emperor and the Yuuzhan Vong are distracted, he can also start getting to work on doing other things as well. Like taking over the rest of the free galaxy, bringing them all under his control. And you, Sidious pointed towards another Sith assassin. Bring in all of the senators back here, and all of the droids here will not clean up, but instead leave the bodies on the ground. Palpatine wanted to send a message after all. The Sith and Dark Side initiates all had their own things to do. Of course Palpatine has more than just Sith assassins at his disposal. Palpatine adopted some of the old Sith tactics. Sith Inquisitors, a class of powerful force wielders within the reconstituted Sith Empire but now also under his own galactic empire, operating primarily within the upper echelons and political circles. In contrast to their counterparts, the Sith warriors, Inquisitors specialized in force abilities as opposed to martial might, and many would devote much time to researching new skills to survive in the cutthroat Sith political environment. Few acolytes succeeded in becoming Inquisitors. However, those that did prove to be the most determined. On the battlefield, Inquisitors were a spectacle to behold, channeling vast amounts of dark side force energy to create massive storms of force lightning, or draining the life force of enemies to feed themselves and their allies. However, most Inquisitors preferred a more manipulative operating style, being masters of exploiting both enemies and allies to further their own agendas. The Inquisitor experimented with forbidden powers to not only survive in the cutthroat environment, but to excel and seize authority. The most formidable Inquisitors dared to explore unorthodox practices by investigating the enigmas of the past, and by unlocking new powers for themselves. Due to their manipulative genius, Inquisitors were skilled at exploiting both their enemies and their allies to further their own personal agendas. Regardless of potential, few acolytes succeeded in facing the rigorous trials to become Sith Inquisitors. Only the most determined acolytes attained such an achievement, but these Sith were often the ones to watch. Though their skills were varied and many, Sith Inquisitors were most feared for their ability to channel the energy of the Force, making them a spectacle to behold on the battlefield. Channeling this Force energy, Inquisitors were capable of draining the life from their enemies, and using it to feed themselves and their allies, and those who have experienced the sensation of the Inquisitor's Force Lightning and survived forever, recoil from the crackling sound of electricity. The clothing choices of Sith Inquisitors were often very calculated, with their elaborate robes designed to both illustrate their sophisticated tastes and desire for political domination, but also being practical and flexible to facilitate their stunning acrobatic movements in combat. Some Inquisitors had been known to take this desire for personal expression to the absolute limit, favoring attire designed to inspire sheer terror in those they come into contact with. Sith Inquisitors often favored double-bladed lightsabers, or saber staffs, in combat. In addition to wielding such an unorthodox weapon, Sith Inquisitors often utilize much more esoteric and customized models of such armament, especially in contrast to the more technical and pragmatic weapons favored by Sith warriors, featuring such details as exposed crystal chambers, or artificially generated force lightning running through the hilt. Expertise in conducting force energies, further allows Inquisitors to draw upon the life essence of themselves and others. This energy could be channeled to bolster their powers, harm their foes, and even to reinvigorate their allies. Inquisitors fought with unlimited fury to create a storm of destruction, and Inquisitors' skills with a lightsaber were equally impressive. Often wielding a double-bladed lightsaber, Inquisitors used quick, garful, and lethal maneuvers to strike their enemies down with astonishing speed. Whether the Inquisitor wielded a lightsaber with lightning-sharp attacks, or just force lightning itself, it was always a dazzling display of deadly energy. Then Palpatine recreated the specializations, just so that he would have an easier time administering the whole empire he has reorganized. The Inquisitors either became assassins, whom he has with him today or the sorcerers. The specialization of sorcerer offered the greatest level of raw force ability, as these adepts drew their power from the darkest corners of the force, unleashing volatile energies that could wreak utter devastation against enemies. In addition to this, sorcerers were capable of healing and bolstering their allies with these same abilities. With the very air around them crackling with energy, powerful sorcerers had a reputation for torturous retaliations against those foolish enough to get in their way. Whereas sorcerers focused on raw power, 
Seth assassins preferred a subtler approach. Speed and deception were their tools of the trade, relying on stealth tactics to infiltrate enemy ranks and remove high-profile targets. Even in open battle, assassins were utterly deadly, relying on both tactical awareness and mind tricks to assault enemies both physically and mentally, manipulating a confrontation to ensure their side maintains the upper hand. While highly skilled with the Saber Staff, their weapon of choice for both offense and defense, assassins could channel the force just as easily. Sidious went really far back to bring these terms back, which resulted in him diversifying his forces even more so, but without sacrificing much, if anything at all. The senators were brought back into the Senate Hall, some still having not fled from the scene completely, and instead staying behind to see what has happened. The Senate will now be reformed as the Imperial Senate. Palpatine spoke to everyone, so they all knew of his power, authority, and wouldn't question it as such. He did this on purpose, luring the Jedi here, setting up the trap, not just to try and kill them, but to also re-establish his authority over his subjects as well. The Imperial Senate differed somewhat from its Republican forebear. Whereas the Galactic Senate had held both legislative and executive power, the Imperial Senate held only legislative power. Though most of this power was in the hands of the Emperor, as he was the overall ultimate authority. Despite such, the Imperial Senate still held limited judicial authority, enough to try high-ranking officials in the Empire, and, possibly, handle cases tied into the Supreme Court. The Emperor allowed the Senate to provide him counsel in enacting new laws. It also had nominal oversight of the Imperial bureaucracy, and worked on the Imperial budget. However, the Emperor made it clear that his judgments would be final. Imperial decrees would be issued without debates, court proceedings, or senatorial overrides. The Emperor could also call and dismiss the Senate at will. The Senate could also pass amendments to the Imperial Charter, and apparently had at least nominal oversight of the Imperial military. The day-to-day -day head of the Senate was no longer the Vice Chair, but the Grand Vizier as President of the Senate. The Senate was, at least in theory, responsible for choosing a new Emperor upon the death or abdication of the current holder of the throne. As Palpatine had no intention of ever dying or abdicating, this power was merely a formality. Within the Undercity, instead of rejoining Ahsoka and her small journey, we instead take a look at the fleeing Jedi as they rejoin up with the others, whom are taking them off of the planet. Or at least trying to get as many of these people off of the planet as possible. That was not good. Obi-Wan spoke, as the remainder of the Jedi High Council all stood here in another location, undisclosed. Exile was a form of punishment used by numerous cultures and sentient species across the galaxy, in which the punished were banished from the society issuing the punishment, rarely ever to return. This form of punishment was known to be practiced by the Jedi Order against members who went against the will of the Order, or turned to the dark side. Not all cases of exile were a form of punishment, as any being could place themselves in a self-imposed exile for a wrong they perceived they had done, removing themselves from society to keep them from wronging another again, or for failing a task they had believed they should have accomplished. It may be poetic justice that the Jedi would suffer the same fate as those of whom they also would exile as well. Ahsoka would definitely look at this and sympathize with them, but also at the same time because of her ability to see into that alternate timeline, she would probably feel a little bit good at this as well. For the visions she experienced felt as if they really happened to her. No, it was not good at all. Jedi Master Deepa Balaba responded as everyone had grim looks on their faces. After witnessing what they did, it did little for their morale, and it did little for other things as well. Specifically, their ability to sense things through the Force made it extremely hard on them to try and steal themselves. Just as Yoda may feel the deaths of millions from so far away, there is also other Jedi members that while not as strong within the Force, would still be able to feel the deaths of dozens of people, especially since they were right next to them. Horrific indeed. How close are we to taking everyone off of the planet? Mace asks. We would be close, but there is a problem. Obi-Wan replied. Problem. Mace asked again, wanting Obi-Wan to further continue. Instead, another Jedi Master spoke instead. There seems to be people flocking towards the Jedi exiles, as while most of the Galactic Empire wants the Jedi captured or killed, the people on the other hand, want to use the Jedi to escape the Empire, and get into the Emperor. It was Jedi Master Adi Gallia, a female Thalothian, revered Jedi Master of the High Council. Gallia was naturally an exceptionally skilled member of the Order, who completed several notable assignments during her service to the galaxy. So the people don't even see us as protectors anymore. Darth Sidious has done his job well. Obi-Wan added his own thoughts. Even Peel, 
a Force-sensitive male Lannic Jedi Master who served on the Jedi Council, considered brusque, bellicose, and even gruff, Master Peel was nonetheless respected for his immense courage spoke next. Yes, people seem to not appreciate our efforts. Plo Koon, a Keldor male from the planet Doran who became a Jedi Master and a lifetime member of the Jedi High Council spoke. That doesn't matter now. What matters is how we are supposed to transport all of these people after all. They didn't have much help elsewhere, and were supposed to be here undercover. Thankfully, they had not revealed that a lot of the Jedi had come here, so that they could once and for all try and take down Palpatine. I don't know. This was not a very leader-like thing to say from Mace in this situation, but even looking into the Force didn't grant any answers. As if this path was not expected or something, and as such, they had no guidance from the Force, even if they still have its assistance. Ahsoka followed after the human woman, being cautious as she traveled through the undercity of Coruscant. There seemed to be this malignant aura within the Force, but at the same time there is also this chaotic peacefulness to this place as well, with which the Undercity is underlined with. How much longer do we have to go? Ahsoka asked as they kept passing through areas that she would otherwise feel uneasy about. Don't worry. Since you have been identified as an ally of the Jedi Exiles, you are being taken to their current place of residence. The woman responded with a small smile etched on her face. Okay, if you say so, Ahsoka replied as they continued down the kind of cleaned up passageways of the Coruscant Undercity. After a while, Ahsoka and the human lady stopped at a specific door hatch, and those whom were a following seemed to have lost the both of them. This is it. Welcome, the human lady said, and once the door opened, Ahsoka was exposed to a multitude of individuals. That happened to be within a group known as the Jedi Order. No one seemed to know that she was coming, as there was no one to check, and everyone seemed incredibly busy. I'll be on my way then. The human lady then left Ahsoka, the door closing behind her, and allowing Ahsoka to finally once again see a few unfamiliar and maybe familiar faces. This way, a voice called out, and Ahsoka could hear that voice from a bit a ways away. The Jedi High Council have come back from their mission. It would also seem that while Ahsoka got here, so too did the Jedi that escaped as well. Well, I am sure Master Plo Koon would not be expecting me, or anyone else for that matter. But it shouldn't matter. I need to inform everyone to leave, but from what I can tell, Ahsoka thought to herself as she watched Jedi leaving and coming. But overall people seemed intent in leaving Coruscant. From the scant amount of information she gathered from conversation, the problem seems to lay in that some of the people of the Republic wanted to leave as well. But with very strict border control in place by Palpatine, there is just no way to leave normally, and possibly relocate themselves somewhere else. The people are suffering and because the Jedi Order is still the Jedi Order, people wish to either use them or rely on them for some level of help and assistance. At least what I have been taught seems to be happening. A live example I guess. Ahsoka thought to herself, contemplating the Force, life and her own relation to it all. Come on. I heard that they have been defeated. Another voice called out. What? Of course not everyone could hear the conversation. But Ahsoka is able to rely on her senses and the Force to be able to do so. She started to follow after them, once discovering that they are headed towards another area. The Undercity had provided the Jedi Order exiles here a lot of room, with which they could safely, or presumably safely stay within. Knowing Palpatine however, one should assume that he knows more than what he lets on. For now, I will go check on the Council members and see what they plan to do next. If need be, I will show myself and suggest that everyone leaves Coruscant immediately. Ahsoka thought to herself as she remembered the visions, still clear within her mind as they were, certainly put her slightly on edge, as the time is seemingly drawing nearer and nearer to such an occurrence. All of the Jedi, here, lined up perfectly with her own vision and her own sensory abilities, all pointed in the direction of things ending in the bad route. The buildings seemingly split off into districts that contained the Jedi within, whether that be Jedi whom are actually a part of the main Jedi forces, or a part of other sections and sectors the Jedi can become a part of. Few Jedi Guardians, many Consulars and probably many Sentinels spread throughout. The members Ahsoka was following seemed to be a small group of Jedi Knights, whom were unfortunately left behind on Coruscant, along with all of the others here. A Jedi Guardian was the name given to one of the three distinct branches of Jedi, the other two being Jedi Consular and Jedi Sentinel. 
The Jedi Guardian's skills and talents lay in battle, a light side mirror of the Sith warrior. Their role in the Jedi Order had remained largely consistent throughout its history, but was first written down by the Guardian Jedi Ace Crick Sunburus in the text, The Jedi Path, a manual for students of the Force. A Jedi Consular was the title of one of three distinct schools of thought, which a member of the Jedi Order could decide to study under following their ascension to the rank of Jedi Knight, the other two being Jedi Guardian and Jedi Sentinel. Led by the Council of Reconciliation, the Consulars sought diplomatic measures in spreading peace and harmony across the Galactic Republic. Refraining from drawing their lightsabers, many Consulars wielded green lightsabers. Except as a measure of last resort, Consulars spent a great deal of time studying the mysteries of the Force. A Consular's role in the Jedi Order, had remained largely consistent throughout its history, but was first written down by the consular Jedi Seer Sabla Mandibu in the text, The Jedi Path, a manual for students of the Force. Jedi Sentinel was the name given to one of the three distinct schools of thought of the Jedi, that sought a balance between the two other branches, the Consulars and the Guardians. While they possessed considerable combat skills and had somewhat extensive knowledge of the Force, Sentinels blended both schools of teaching, and amplified them with a series of non-Force skills such as in the fields of security, computers, stealth techniques, demolitions, repair, or medicine. These skills tended to take the forefront in their middle road approach to problems. While a guardian might bash down a locked door and a consular might simply knock, a sentinel would instead use equipment available or ingenuity to pick the lock. While the role of the sentinels within the Jedi Order had remained largely consistent throughout its history, the branch of study was first documented by the Sentinel Jedi recruiter Morich Galley in the text, The Jedi Path, a manual for students of the Force. All of these paths were of great importance for the Jedi Order, but what is most needed now are Jedi Guardians, whom have started to decrease as time moved on. The various conflicts even before now reduced numbers, especially with the short-lived conflict known as the Clone Wars. So, what do we do now? Obi-Wan asked as everyone was still in session deciding what to do next. Right now, they are aware of the unfortunate circumstances that are in with the people of the Republic, wanting to use them to escape the Galactic Empire and Palpatine's evil rule. What most here probably didn't fully understand is why they would so willingly decide to trade one Emperor for another. Going to Anakin from under Palpatine didn't seem all that logical, or at least it didn't seem that way to the Jedi. No one has any ideas. Mace asked as he is also out of ideas for the current situation as well. While Dooku is distracting a lot of Palpatine's military efforts elsewhere right now, it would seem that the Jedi still stood no chance, unless they all went in and sacrificed themselves just to kill one man. Even then, there is no telling whether or not Palpatine would be killed off by the Jedi, and even then again, there is no telling how things would go after that. From the current stand or point of things, the Jedi have full-heartedly rushed in with a minimalistic plan of action, fully believing that they would be victorious. Mace would also be lying if he said he wasn't slightly influenced over the years by Anakin, and his supposed impulsiveness up till his point in leaving, also influenced in that he didn't wish to stay on Tatooine or within the Emperor any longer, as there seemed to be some tension between some of the more religiously zealous Jedi, against what is going on over there. With Dooku out there and helping them, but the Jedi failing here, it only meant that Palpatine had an idea or a plan in case of an event like this. Obviously, from the point of things now, Palpatine is still struggling as well, due to some of the other factions in the galaxy at large. One such being the Emperor, which from what Dooku understands from what Palpatine said within the Senate building, the Emperor is now being attacked by some unknown species or race known as the Yuuzhan Vong. So even if the Emperor is a protected place, people also shouldn't go there as well. For that place was now being attacked by another foreign entity. Mace and others would probably keep this information to themselves, as even though they may have reservations, they also sense through the Force that the Emperor is the safest place for anyone right now, especially in the current times. Does anyone have any idea about what these Yu's and Vong may be about then? Mace asks, turning the subject in another direction to give everyone some time to think on their own situation, but also at the same time asking for opinions on what Emperor Palpatine spoke about. I don't know much, but from what I overheard, they seem to be somehow connected to that planet myself, and Anakin traveled to for his first official mission as a Jedi Knight. Obi-Wan said, which drew the attention of everyone. Obi-Wan would then go on to explain things about the mission back then, 
and how Anakin may be more knowledgeable about it than him. Which made everyone start to think that the Yuuzhan Vong attacking the Emperor is actually deeper than what is first thought up of or initially connected to. Right. We can ask the Emperor and Emperor about it then once we head back, Mace finished the conversation here. Thinking everyone has already had more than enough time to gather their thoughts. Mace definitely has come to a decision already. But he still wished to hear what everyone else has to say. Jedi Master Deeper Balaba spoke next. I believe that we should stay and fight. I concur. It was Ada Gallia that also spoke up here, agreeing with what Master Balaba had just suggested. May I know the reason? Mace asked. We must put an end to the Sith Lord once and for all. Leaving now would be a waste, and it would be best for the civilians to escape first as well. Master Balaba said before continuing, One lose should not constitute all of us fleeing with our tails behind our legs, and instead we should try again, and this time be successful. She speaks some truth. While the lose is great to make up for such a lose, we may need to sacrifice a lot more if we wait any longer. Master Gallia backed up Balaba's decision. I do believe that this sounds like a reasonable option however. What are we to do if we fail again? I believe it would be better if we round up our troops together and then make a stand which should reduce the risk to all lives involved. We are supposed to be the protectors of the galaxy, not the executioners. While taking Darth Sidious and killing him is the right option, we should stop and regroup for now, to make sure the after effects and fallout are managed skillfully. Of course, it was Obi-Wan whom suggested this approach that is full of his character and personality, that of patience. Mace was about to speak next to make the final decision, after everyone gave their thoughts and opinions, but is however interrupted by an intruder. Wait, the voice exclaimed, and coming inside of their current meeting place was a somewhat tall figure. At least when comparing the female with the height of an average human that is, as she seems to be around 1.83 meters tall. The figure took off her hood to reveal that the figure is in fact a young Tigruta girl, that a few if not all of them here should recognize. Ahsoka, the first to notice and say this name is of course Jedi Master Plo Koon. Hi! Ahsoka replied seeing all of the attention now on her. So you are done then? Eve asked as Anakin reappeared within the Sky Palace throne room. You were waiting for me. Anakin replied, asking a question of his own, finally noticing that there seemed to be a problem with his connection to the girls. Specifically, his connection is telling him that they are currently not on Tatooine or even within the Emperor and are instead near or on Coruscant. Eve, with grace, is easily able to brush off Anakin's teasing tone and also notice that Anakin has noticed everyone seems to have gone. They have gone to Coruscant to retrieve the little Togruta girl, she said. Really now? And why is that? Anakin asks, I don't know exactly, but what I do know is that I am supposed to be having some sort of time alone with you. Eve at this point seemed to hold her composure well enough, but Anakin could easily tell her current emotions as well as she knows that he can tell. Anakin took a second to go inwards to discover that things within the galaxy have livened up a bit. First there seemed to be the most preeminent threat of the Yuuz and Vong, and then the Jedi going towards Coruscant with Ahsoka following along. Which lead to Barriss, Shark and Xana going after her to make sure she doesn't get into any trouble. I guess I'm free as of this moment great then. Eve moved forward and tentatively held out her hand towards Anakin, whom took her by the hand, and the two of them started to go on whatever they are going on. Which should be something similar to a date of sorts as Eve is slowly getting used to things in this way. The world and galaxy at large has changed physically over a lot of time, but fundamentally the galaxy has remained similar to the past from her memories. The two would spend some time in each other's company, with Eve slowly becoming more and more enchanted with the world as it is. For everything within the Emperor is both in line with the Force, yet at the same this there is dissonance created to make sure people are disconnected from the Force at the same time. In fact, a lot of the ambient energies within the Force that the people are subconsciously using is being directed in Anakin's direction. Once it reaches Anakin, it starts to shift and transform, slowly becoming something and nothing all at the same time. It is very hard to describe just what is going on here. Eve thought to herself as she took notice of absolutely any and everything she could see. The balance on the planet of Tatooine seemed to be near perfect if it isn't already perfect. 
Eve would know, especially once her brother's powers were transferred over towards herself, making her probably the second most imbalanced person within the Force, second only to Anakin. Even then, there is almost no way to sense Anakin as well through the Force, because of the special sands of time material collected from her former home. Even then, once again, Anakin would have been able to escape most if not everyone's sense within the Force, just by his sheer control anyway. So how are you enjoying yourself so far? Anakin had been connecting with the fleets in hut space, sometimes having one of his many thought processes access and take control of some of the lesser ships. Doing so, he was able to help out a few times himself even thought he is so far away. I am pleased Eve responded, still coming to grips with the situation and being unsure of how to deal with her current emotions. Usually she would represent the light side of the force, but as soon as Anakin landed within the domain of her family, she started to have selfish thoughts about him. Which is when the Force decided to throw her a curved ball, and make sure she knows that it has deciding to make her connect to the Chosen One in a more intimate manner. So, what is the nature of our relationship? Am I to be like all of the others? Eve asked, seemingly trying to angle something. What do you wish for this to be? Anakin asked in return. Eve had no answer right now, or at least she has an answer but is unsure of whether or not Anakin would reciprocate in kind. I want more. Eve has only had one relationship so far, that being with Anakin in her long, long life. Forced to never be able to even touch another person, or be touched by another unless they were her family members really made her very shy. When it comes to such contact, Eve has gotten better, enough so that she would hold Anakin's hand and accept stuff like hugs from him or the other girls. However, she would still be disinclined to accept such things from others outside of this group. In fact, the Force is still very much connected to her. And while she is now able to disconnect herself and be able to do more things than she could before, that still doesn't mean it is everything. You must understand what that means, right? Anakin asked again having come to his own decision in relation to their relationship. I think I do. Eve seemed, and this made Anakin take the next logical step to make sure she does understand. Stopping, Anakin holds both of Eve's hands and tells her, You may close your eyes. Eve, although confused, has an immense sense of trust in Anakin, especially in the knowledge she constantly got from the Dyad. Eve closed her eyes and awaited for what was to happen next. And it was in this moment that she felt something touch her lips. In this moment, it seemed as if the world, no the galaxy came to a halt, as she experienced something she has not ever done. A new experience indeed, and the feeling flowing through the bond between the two of them, she could tell exactly how he felt to her proposition. Well, I wasn't expecting this Eve thought to herself, before she started to respond in kind, fully enjoying the experience. Yoda, a force-sensitive male being of a mysterious species, was one of the most legendary, renowned and powerful Jedi Masters in galactic history. He was known for his legendary wisdom, mastery of the Force, and skills in lightsaber combat. Yoda served as a member of the Jedi High Council in the last centuries of the Galactic Republic, and as Grand Master oversaw the Jedi Order before, during, and after the devastating Clone Wars. Following the First Battle of Geonosis, Yoda held the title of Master of the Order in addition to that of Grand Master. In his centuries of service to the galaxy and the Force, Grand Master Yoda had a hand in the training of nearly all the Jedi in the Order including such luminaries as Obi-Wan Kenobi, Kai Adi Mundi and Oppo Rancisis, all of whom had come to serve on the Jedi Council along with him. Standing about 66 centimeters tall, Yoda was a male member of a mysterious species, details of which he did not reveal. Yoda served as a member of the Jedi Order for centuries, eventually gaining a seat on the Jedi High Council, before reigning as the Grand Master of the Jedi. He had exceptional skills in lightsaber combat, Having mastered all forms and stances of lightsaber combat, except the vapid subset of Form Vi, he had mastered the original Form Vi variant known as Jio, but known for being particularly accomplished in Form IV, often employing the acrobatic techniques of the form. Many considered him a sword master and the greatest duelist in the Jedi Order, even surpassing Mace Windu and Count Dooku. Though arguably the Order's greatest master of the Force and most skilled warrior, Yoda believed most firmly in the importance of instructing younger generations, and never missed an opportunity to ensure his students learn from their experiences. At heart, the diminutive Jedi Master was a teacher. Indeed, he instructed nearly all the Jedi in the Order, to some extent, during his reign as Grand Master. Though Yoda was, arguably, the most highly force-attuned member of the Order, he was not flawless. 
It was partially due to his failure to recognize that Supreme Chancellor Palpatine was actually responsible for the outbreak of the Clone Wars, and was in fact the Sith Lord Darth Sidious, that the Republic was overthrown and the Jedi Order decimated. To be Jedi is to face the truth and choose. Give off light, or darkness, Padawan. Be a candle, or the night, Padawan. But choose. Yoda's voice echoed in the void he was within, as he was trying to understand what is happening. A trial of being old is this. Remembering which thing one has said into which young is. Yoda started to hear himself, saying words with which he has trouble remembering. Yoda is now getting on in life after all, and would soon enough become old enough to where he would unfortunately die. Or, as Yoda would like to put it, by becoming one with the Force. Master Yoda. Do you think it will really come to war? Palpatine appeared before Yoda, as he was asked once again within Palpatine's previous place of office, and a meeting was taking place. Yoda also remembers what he said next. He hung to himself before saying, The dark side clouds everything. Impossible to see, the future is. Again Yoda is brought somewhere else again, whereupon he is having a conversation with Jedi Master Mace Windu. Blind we are, if creation of this clone army, we could not see. Yoda said, I think it is time we inform the Senate that our ability to use the Force has diminished. Mace suggested to him at the time, but only the Dark Lords of the Sith know of our weakness. If informed, the Senate is multiply, our adversaries will. Yoda of course denied the request, for his logic is reasonable, but who would have thought that it would also be another something leading to the downfall of the Republic and Jedi Order overall. The Shroud of the Dark Side has fallen. A voice spoke right next to Yoda's ears, and as he turned around he was faced with another him. Darker, the coming storm grows. I fear the dark cloud of the Sith shrouds us all. This time Yoda was now receiving memories from a situation that hadn't happened at all, but could have really happened within the next few years, if things went according to the will of the Force. No, now we do that guide the creation of the clones from the beginning, Dooku did. Han, our enemy created an army for us. Yoda said first upon discovering something out. If this was known, public confidence in the war effort, the Jedi, and the Republic would vanish. There would be mass chaos. Mace replied, cover up this discovery we must. No one, not even the Chancellor, may know. Valiant men the clones have proven to be. Saved my life and yours they have many times. Believe in them we must. Win the war swiftly we must, before our enemies' designs reach completion, whatever they may be. Yoda made the final decision. What? Yoda thought to himself as he watched himself further doom the Republic and the Jedi Order. Yoda then started to watch the rise of the Sith Lord known as Darth Vader, and as he went into the Jedi Temple, he absolutely destroyed all of those within. The children, the adults and everything else in between. Yoda watches the clones' armies that would have, no, should have been with the Jedi in their fight against the Separatists turn on the Jedi at the very end, which resulted in all of the Jedi or near all of the Jedi dying off. Yoda learnt the entirety of another timeline, whereupon he discovered a lot of things that could have or should have happened. From Anakin and Padme in this other timeline, and Anakin's subsequent fall to the dark side which the Jedi did nothing to help. Even Anakin's Padawan learner, Ahsoka Tano, would have left the Order, further putting a dent in Anakin's fragile psyche. Premonitions premonitions Yoda saw himself with another version of Anakin, speaking face to face and alone with each other. Vision Yoda spoke. These visions you have, I have pain, suffering death. Vision Anakin replied. Yourself you speak of, or someone you know? Vision Yoda asked. Someone. Vision Anakin replied after some hesitation. Close to you. Vision Yoda asked. Yes. Vision Anakin responded. Careful you must be when sensing the future Anakin. The fear of loss is a path to the dark side. Vision Yoda said. I won't let these visions come true, Master Yoda. Vision Anakin said. Death is a natural part of life. Rejoice for all those around you who transform into the Force. Mourn them do not, miss them do not. Attachment leads to jealousy, the shadow of greed, that is. While Yoda's advice here is sound, there is also the underlying problems vision Anakin has built up over the years. Yoda himself could feel it, sense it and know about it. The Jedi had not done well to see the signs, and even if they did, they would still fail due to the way they handle things like this. What must I do, Master Yoda? Vision Anakin asked. Train yourself to let go of everything you fear to lose Vision Yoda said. Unfortunately, Yoda at this point knew that this would not end well in the end. While right, he is also wrong and the mistakes of the Jedi against not only Anakin, but towards others as well, would eventually result in what he started to see next. Pain, suffering and death. Wait. 
Ahsoka called out as she entered the room all of the Jedi were within, talking about several things and also discussing what they should do next. Ahsoka, the first to notice and say this name is of course Jedi Master Plo Koon. Hi Ahsoka replied seeing all of the attention now on her. Why are you here? Obi-Wan asked, confused just as much as everyone else here that is within. All of the Jedi are also now interested as to why the girl would come here all of a sudden, as they are also aware of whom she is associated with. Ahsoka, seeing her chance starts to explain. I think no I believe wholeheartedly that the Jedi should leave this planet immediately. And when I mean immediately, I mean as soon as possible in any instance which includes right now. Or at least Ahsoka tried to explain it properly but inevitably failed. Slow down there Padawan, Balaba said. I am no Padawan, and I haven't been for a long time anyway. I am not a Jedi, and I am most certainly not young anymore. Ahsoka was frustrated and allowed some of her emotions to come out here, but in a controlled manner. We know that. I am sure Master Balaba knows this as well, but forgive her assumption that you are still a learner. Are you not? Mace apologized and redirected the conversation, asking a question instead. I am in fact, not a learner anymore. I am quite the quick study, and Sky Guy is a good enough teacher as well. Ahsoka seemed proud of saying this. Some of the Jedi within snickered a little from discovering that Ahsoka has given the mighty Emperor an Emperor and chosen one such a nickname. Right. You have come here because... Mace asked again, further steering the topic of conversation back to what is important. Right? Right. The Jedi should leave because I have received visions through the Force about the imminent death of everyone here, and possibly the rest of the Jedi Order. That stays on Coruscant. There is more to it than that, but for now the Jedi should leave. All of you should leave, and at the very least not stay here. Ahsoka explained a bit better this time, but it still left the Jedi within this building with more questions than answers. Why should we believe in what you say? The Force is a mysterious force of the universe, and as such, there is no telling if what you have sensed is even going to come true. Visions can be more than just seeing the future, are you sure that your training is over? This time it was Jedi Master Adi Gallia whom spoke, with Master Deepa Balaba, seemingly agreeing with her head nodding up and down. You are questioning my abilities. Ahsoka didn't seem that angry, but she definitely felt some type of way for being looked down upon, because of a combination of things. One of which likely includes her status as someone whom isn't even an adult, which would be changing within the coming week, but even more so due to the fact that she isn't a Jedi. Biases are strong after all, even within the Jedi Order, where they would see others that practice the Force, not in their specific way to be bad, or at the very least consider them unorthodox. I think that is enough. Is there any proof or evidence that could help you back up these visions of yours? Mace trusted in the Force just like any other. But usually it is meant to be and stay as a force that indirectly interacts with the galaxy. Most of the time it is the people within that creates change. Whether that be for the good or bad. This is where Ahsoka failed to present anything. I, I don't have anything but. That shouldn't mean that you would discount my warning. Right. Ahsoka said. I am afraid that if you have no way of proving anything. Mace shook his head and started onto another subject. Where Ahsoka fails here. But is still left within to hear the conversation. We will be staying. Looking into the Force, and using his own special abilities of foresight, Mace couldn't see anything to help him with this decision. So he could only make the choice based on his own experience, taking in what others have said and decided to stay. While Obi-Wan's suggestion of leaving is also taken into consideration, there is also no way of knowing whether or not we would be able to have another chance like this. My senses within the Force seem to be blocked, and I have no way of knowing anything. I am sure all of you can feel the darkness as well. But Master Windu, leaving the planet is Dash Ahsoka tried to continue even referring to Mace with the title of Master out of respect of him being her teacher's, Anakin's pervious teacher. I think that will be enough from you now. Your warning has been taken into consideration, but if I and the others have no evidence of such a thing. Mace again shook his head indicating that he was not going to continue the conversation. Ahsoka was then escorted out as she has failed. Damn it. She cursed, now finding herself in an unfortunate position of having failed. However, failure is only normal in life. But this failure needed to be overcome somehow. And this is exactly when she started to hear a voice within her mind. You alright there? It is seemingly Anakin communicating through the Force Dyad. Something that he has refrained from doing due to what this would do between the two of them, further strengthening such feelings. 
but it would seem that Anakin is either becoming less and less caring towards such things, or is otherwise worried about Ahsoka enough to ask of her current state of being. What? Ahsoka was confused, looking around before noticing that this is coming through the bond the two share. You you Ahsoka definitely was going on our emotional rollercoaster now. Enough of that. Are you alright? Anakin sent the message again, redirecting Ahsoka's thoughts and helping her refocus herself within the here and now. Yee yeah, yeah Ahsoka replied mentally. I noticed you couldn't convince them, but I am willing to help here. What say you? However, there is also going to be some punishment for you just running off like this. I am also sure by now that Xana, Barris, and Shark have arrived on Coruscant as well. Anakin asked and informed her. WH what again? Ahsoka is surprised that they would chase after her. Well, I am not really surprised Ahsoka thought to herself. I can help you. Want it? Anakin again coaxed Ahsoka as she still hasn't accepted his proposition. In fact, Anakin doesn't mind helping to save some more Jedi. But with him being so far away, and not being able to just directly teleport there puts a hamper on his plans. Or at least it would be that way if he didn't continue to develop Coruscant's Undercity into what it is today. He is the big boss after all of course I want your help here. Ahsoka replied telepathically. Then the deal is struck then. Anakin replied himself with a small amount of maniacal laughter echoing in the background of Ahsoka's mind, which most certainly raised her suspicions about just what Anakin has in mind. Palpatine has a long and vast history within the galaxy. Known also by his Sith name Darth Sidious or simply as the Emperor, was a Force-sensitive human male, who served as the last Supreme Chancellor of the Galactic Republic, and the first Emperor of the Galactic Empire. A Dark Lord of the Sith in the Order of the Sith Lords, recorded by history as the most successful who had ever lived, his deeds resulted in overthrow the Ancient Republic, and the Noble Jedi Order from within. Noted for his sadistic and self-serving intentions just as well as his ability to conceal them, Palpatine impacted the galaxy perhaps more than any other single individual, and it is likely that his impact on history, for good or ill, was immeasurable. Born 67 years ago on the planet Naboo to the aristocratic house Palpatine, Palpatine discovered the Sith at a young age as a collector of dark side artifacts. 44 years ago, he met Hago Damask, a new womb businessman who was in reality the Sith Lord Darth Plagueis. Under Plague's manipulation, Palpatine killed his father and pledged himself to his new master's dark side teachings as Darth Sidious. Palpatine lived a double life for many years, serving an untarnished career as Naboo's ambassador in the Galactic Senate, while learning from his master and training a young Zabrak. As the Sith assassin Darth Maul, Plagueis and Sidious, both exceptionally skilled and powerful in the Force, were able to conceal their identities from the Jedi for decades. As Plagueis privately searched for the key to eternal life, Sidious manipulated galactic politics, culminating in the blockade of Naboo by the Trade Federation. In the wake of the political crisis, the Galactic Senate voted to elect him as Supreme Chancellor, and around the same time, in accordance with Bane's Rule of Two, Sidious murdered Plagueis, and usurped the role of Sith Master. As Chancellor of the Republic and Dark Lord of the Sith, Palpatine orchestrated the outbreak of the devastating Clone Wars, ten years after the Naboo Crisis. He himself headed both the Galactic Republic and, secretly, the Confederacy of Independent Systems. The public leader of this splinter faction was former Jedi Master Count Dooku, Sidious's second apprentice as Darth Tyrannus, in the wake of Maul's presumed death on Naboo. As billions perished in the war, the vast majority of Republic citizens rallied behind Chancellor Palpatine, giving him enough support to amend the Galactic Constitution in the name of security and transfer most of the Senate's executive authority to his own office. Which having explained all of this, we have caught up to what is considered current history as of this moment and a basic overview of what Palpatine has mainly accomplished. There are other smaller things, things that wouldn't be considered much at all as well. It is without a doubt that Chief Palpatine, known as Darth Sidious to many now as well, is a grand schemer, orchestrator of the highest levels and echelons within the development and history of the galaxy at large. Your heartless, ambitious, arrogant, insidious, and without shame or empathy. More, you're a murderer. Palpatine's Sith Master, Plagueis had once said to him, and Palpatine would agree wholeheartedly, if only in secret to himself. That is, through his own nature, Palpatine, alias Darth Sidious, seemed evil incarnate. He would insistently make that clear, however, that he did not believe himself to be evil, but simply beyond common morality, calling evil a label we all put on those who threaten us. Aside from his opinion on morality, he believed himself to be the embodiment of darkness and the living incarnation of the dark side of the Force, and, after the death of his body, he saw himself as pure energy, 
or simply the dark side itself. He was instinctively treacherous, betraying and killing numerous beings who trusted him, such as Vida Kim and Darth Plagueis. Since his youth, Palpatine's main goal had always been nothing less than the acquisition of absolute power. In this personal quest, he showed that he was patient, arrogant, vastly intelligent, and an incredible actor. Despite his innate nature, he was able to play the part of a good and honest politician for decades. Even the Jedi Council was taken in by his facade. His skill at subterfuge was sufficient to even convince Darth Plagueis, upon the latter's revelation that he was a Sith, that he knew little of that order when he in fact, had sought to join the Sith, long before he met the Dark Lord. As both Senator of Naboo and Supreme Chancellor of the Galactic Republic, he appeared as an unassuming, tea-drinking old man, almost grandfatherly, with elegant robes. With his cheery demeanor, trademark smile, and a reputation for being a kind and modest man from Naboo, he won the hearts of billions during the Clone Wars, promising to bring justice to a government mired in corruption and chaos. This served to hide his true motives behind a perfect disguise, in order to gain acceptance from his new empire. The Emperor's popularity was such that Vader, before killing Palpatine, even pondered the possibility that the Empire would be horrified at the Emperor's impending death, with several citizens of the Empire even considering him to be a demigod. Much in the same manner the people of the Emperor did for Anakin, but it is much, much more worse with them considering Anakin a divine being and god. Once again, within the Undercity, one could see in a specific and hidden part of the Undercity, that the Jedi Order and their members are hiding away, in wait, waiting for their opportunity to strike back against the Sith Menace. The Sith Menace, on the other hand, may have some plans yet for the Jedi underneath, for while the Undercity is protected, that doesn't mean it can afford the same level of security those within the Emperor have. The Undercity, whilst still the Undercity, also should not be considered the same as it was before. Within one of the closed-off alleyways, if one took a closer look, they would identify that there is a hooded figure that seems suspicious, and most certainly shady. Tell me, I want to know. The shady figure asked another, as they were using the Force to telekinetically uphold a struggling person. The struggling person seemed to be a Jedi, an alien Jedi of some kind, and looked to be somewhere closer to a Jedi Padawan, for they have the signature Jedi braid. E please, I know nothing of what you speak of. The Jedi Padawan replied, but the other person seemed intent on wanting to get some more information. The shady individual clenched their fists and started to choke the Jedi out, slowly killing the poor Padawan but one should not fear as the Padawan is already an adult. In fact, most of the Jedi Padawans are adults, meaning that it takes a large amount of time to elevate themselves past the Padawan position. Speak, or die. The shady figure let his hold go, but made sure that the Jedi Padawan didn't try to escape. Once he does let go of them through the Force, I dash the Jedi Padawan coughed trying to regain their breath from the encounter. I, I have heard that they are either planning to leave or stay and try to combat the Sith here. It would seem this Jedi Padawan was not very loyal, but who is when their life is on the line and their limits are tested. Good. Unfortunately, your usefulness has come to an end. The shady cloaked figure then ignited a lightsaber, red in color, indicating that they are in truth a Sith. Ugly weight dash. The Jedi Padawan was going to plead or at the very least fight back, but it is all for naught as they were not powerful enough. The Sith struck the Jedi Padawan down, loping their head from their shoulders, and watched in grim satisfaction. The cloaked figure disengaged from the situation, making sure to start burning the corpse to hide his deed. He can't allow the Jedi to know that the Sith have infiltrated their hidey hole, now could they? Walking out of the dark alleyway, the Sith started to blend into the crowd hiding their Force signature within the Force. An ability learned and tempered through their training with their master, and with their face covered, none would even be able to identify the individual. Walking and winding themselves through the streets of the Undercity section reserved and hidden away just for the Jedi Order and their members. The Sith would leave through another passage completely unaccounted for when entering a building that is completely abandoned, and no Jedi reside within. Entering the special tunnel way allowed the Sith to come across another person, another being whom used to go by the name Jar Jar Binks. Now, they may further be known as Darth Imabas. Yasa Dun the Joba. Jar Jar asked his compatriot that had just come in. Yes, 
The other Sith pulled down their cloak, revealing that it was in fact the other Sith apprentice under Darth Sidious, Ferris Olin. Good. The master will be pleased. Nessa ready to commence the attack? Jar Jar spoke, indicating to another area that has a holographic projector. It showed the entirety of the place the Jedi resided within. The structural supports and beams, alongside many points that glowed red. Thessa Bomba has been put in place. Jar Jar continued as he pointed towards different locations. This indicated that there would be some bombs ready to explode and come down on the poor, poor Jedi within. I have discovered the Jedi would either leave or stay. Either way, we must do the plan faster and accelerate the progress. Is it all done? Ferris asked Jar Jar, whom seemed a bit distracted, which always increased Ferris's hate of his fellow apprentice. He could not wait to actually end him, as his annoyance was starting to get on his nerves more and more. It is only thanks to his Jedi training that he had the patience to deal with him, for his Sith training wanted him to end his fellow Sith apprentice. The other apprentices are in place as well. No need to worry, as Nessa has done the plan perfectly. Even Jar Jar didn't believe himself. But it was not like Ferris had a greater understanding that Jar Jar is usually clumsy. For it does not matter that he had become a Sith apprentice, and learning under possibly the greatest, if not most powerful Sith of all time, Darth Sidious. They are not apprentices. Remember your position and station, you buffon. They are simple assassins that are meant to follow the will of our master, and the will of ourselves as well. Ferris got frustrated and berated Jar Jar. However, Jar Jar was not someone whom easily got angry. No, one had to start mentioning his idiotic and clumsy nature, to get a rise out of him properly. Jar Jar seemed entirely against the things that have happened from the past, and would most certainly hate it. If someone even mentioned him by his previous name of Jar Jar Binks, the failure. Whatever Jar Jar responded, looking back towards the holographic projector, showing the imminent destruction of the Jedi underneath Coruscant. The red blips and bleeps continued to show locations of importance, especially everywhere the Jedi would be going to sleep and reside. Going to eat or otherwise anything else the Jedi like participating in. Although he was from the mid-rim instead of the core worlds, Palpatine primarily spoke galactic basic standard, with a Coruscanti accent during his time as Senator, representing Naboo and a Supreme Chancellor. He also spoke with a Coruscanti accent, while assuming the identity of Darth Sidious, and later while acting as the Galactic Emperor, although his voice differed slightly, in that it uttered a guttural, slightly rasping element. After the exposure of himself, and the attack of Dooku on himself, he created a new image of himself, that of a pitiful victim of a random act of violence. He had been left after the attack with the appearance of a gnarled, ancient man with pale skin, and searing, sickly yellow eyes. He wore a heavy duck cloak, which gave him the appearance of being a simple individual to hide his force abilities, and carried a glossy black cane, leaning heavily on it to create an illusion of weakness. His acts as a loving politician and later a helpless victim, served only to bolster his true persona, that of Sidious. The Dark Lord was a highly manipulative, Machiavellian, exploitative and seductive megalomaniac, easily bending others to his will in his quest for Sith supremacy and ultimate power. A megalomaniac, Sidious identified his own essence with the very blackness of space, even going so far as to declare himself the ultimate personification of the dark side. His desire for absolute power was such that he even had extragalactic aims regarding his rule, seeking to dominate the entire universe. He would have the means to do so too. If Anakin was the original alongside Anakin also going forward to have his son, Luke Skywalker also join Palpatine in their goals of wanting to dominate the universe. Unfortunately for Palpatine, that would not be coming true. Sidious also displayed traits of psychopathy, including extreme sadism and cruelty, taking considerable pleasure in the suffering and deaths of others. In fact, he was known to cultivate life forms for the sole purpose of eventually killing them. An example of this being his cultivation of that Sith assassin he exploited and turned into a slave of his will to attack Anakin during his trials. His sadism was such that, when murdering his master, Darth Plagueis in his sleep, he paused occasionally to mock Plagueis for being manipulated by him and revel in Plague's pain before continuing. His sadistic inclinations may have had roots from his father, Kasinga Palpatine, where a penchant for violence was one of the few things the two men had in common. He also had absolutely no qualms with destroying his own forces, in order to defeat his enemies. Enough of his psychopathic nature had been unveiled to the subjects of the Empire, 
that several members of the imperial hierarchy viewed him as having delusions of grandeur. Some of his officers dismissed these claims as figures of speech. Some also believed him to have been simply installed as a puppet ruler. Even as a child, Palpatine was demonstrated to be manipulative, rebellious, and self-centered. This is especially evident by his frequent breaking of various rules and social norms, knowing full well that his father, whom he hated, would simply pay off the authorities to make the problem disappear. When he accidentally killed two pedestrians whilst recklessly driving a speeder, Palpatine was more concerned with the matter of becoming a professional racer rather than the accident he caused. It is unclear how much of Palpatine's personality he inherited from his father, who himself was said to be cruel, power-hungry, and exceptionally arrogant. Although possessed of an insatiable hunger for power, he honestly believed a Sith government would be best for the galaxy and in time came to regard himself as something of a savior. When Palpatine compared his rule to others, even when clearly the Emperor was and is working better, over what is considered better, Palpatine would still say that it is imperfect. It is true that it is, and Anakin wouldn't deny this fact just as every government has problems. With Palpatine, however, he would notice flaws and do nothing to really stop such things, and rely solely on his power within the Force or his control over others to keep everything in line. He implied that only when the Sith had control over the galaxy can there be any peace at all. He viewed all sentient beings bereft of the Force as inferiors, likening them to children floundering about aimlessly, ignorant of their own shortcomings, and incapable of fulfilling their aspirations. As articulated in The Weakness of Inferiors, Sidious considered the wise and powerful, specifically Force Sensitives, as responsible for providing guidance for such lesser entities in order to allow for a thriving civilization. Seeing no one wiser nor more powerful than himself, he deemed only himself as worthy of realizing this philosophy, and thus endeavored to control the galaxy forever. Despite his megalomaniacal nature, Sidious was capable of acknowledging his mistakes. Although he desired immortality and to rule the galaxy for all time, he nonetheless anticipated the possibility that he would die, and in some cases, was even willing to risk his own life, if it meant ensuring someone would turn to the dark side as a result of their killing him or testing someone's loyalty. This willingness to be killed was especially evident in his interactions with those that he wished to bring to his side. This behavior had been demonstrated as early as shortly before he massacred his own family, where he, upon getting confirmation from his father, that the latter hated him to such an extent, that he wished to kill the former from the start. Told Kasinga that the latter had better start now. Palpatine is a prolific author. His notes on political and military sciences became popular texts, and his theories on these subjects were taught at universities throughout the galaxy. Sidious, largely free from the work of governance due to the system of governorship he had set up during the war, began devoting some effort towards writing what he intended to be the seminal work on the dark side of the Force. Palpatine was a known patron of the arts, attending the opera whenever able and surrounding himself with unique statuary and decorative antiques. Many of these statues served as convenient hiding places to stash Sidious's various Sith artifacts and lightsabers. Much of his spare time was spent at his private retreat on Naboo, a luxuriously decorated estate where he went for relaxation, meditation, or to hold meetings with his most trusted staff, which unfortunately he is unable to access anymore, for it was given over towards the Emperor, further fueling Palpatine's anger against the Emperor and its current Emperor, Anakin Skywalker. He had also developed a taste for chocolate, with gracious government mix being his personal favorite. The Emperor's squadron within the Yuuzhan Von ship had finally decided what they should do next. We will take over the ship and try to take these people as hostages, otherwise they will die. The captain said to his team, knowing that it would be better to kill them if they are unable to submit to their demands. Yes, okay. The men replied with differing replies, where all of them started to move towards the R that is most likely to be the command area. While being right underneath the Yuuzhan Vong peoples that are living just above them as they have figured out this ship is in fact a colonial ship, with which their people resided within. While many would think of this as dangerous, the Yuuz and Vong on the other hand, did not because they have full confidence in their own biological technologies, alongside their own people's abilities. The section they were within could be considered just underneath the main area the Yuuz and Vong peoples resided within. Of course, it was like they were hiding within the floor underneath their house, which is a very accurate comparison to the current situation. Those things, or tentacles, or whatever they were that the group encountered within the outer layers of the ship, were apparent here as well. Strangely, for some reason it was underneath the ship as well, which lead to them considering the possibility that these things are in actuality much more than what meets the eyes. 
From the readings the squadron received from above, there should be thousands of yous and vong above, that are not just settlers of the species, but also trained individuals as well. Other readings indicated that certain drugs were circulated into the world ship's interior, which infused its incumbents with a sense of purpose and belonging, in order to prevent them suffering mental breakdowns resulting from the stresses of a long journey across space to the promised land. Again, this is not affecting these men within, due to their advanced genetic manipulation, force training, and their advanced power armor keeping them protected from such things. Even after being exposed in any other way, their extra genetically modified and implants would work against the drugs being circulated throughout making sure to avoid the tendrils, for they would not only alert the living ship and the use and vong of their presence, but also because of its connection to whatever sewage system is in place. While the synth marines didn't have to worry or have a care about dirty things before due to their previous machine nature, they began to develop things like disgust for things like that, especially since gaining these biological functions as well, not that they absolutely hated everything that came along with being like this due to their now enhanced connection to their creator, Anakin Skywalker. Continuously moving, one of the squad's members was keeping an eye out and watching their senses, determining whether or not they are at the right place. The analysis abilities of their suits were powerful, but specialization is a thing, meaning that everyone has their own role to play. Likewise leading to squads having people skilled in certain areas coming together and forming a squad. Not only that, but there is also a process of trying to match up and pair those that are compatible with another through character, personality, goals and other things that come along as well. Of course, people could always have the freedom to choose something else for themselves, completely free in being able to decide for themselves about what they want or not. Move. We are almost there. The analysis said, having finally gotten a proper location for them to burst through and take control of the ship, otherwise okay. Go. Heading towards the location, the captain looked upwards as the analysis pointed towards the spot they should be prepared to go through. By now, the Yu's Hen Vong should be alerted of their presence, for they were unable to dodge or avoid the tendrils in their way at this point. Right here, we are going to go up, and then we should immediately disable those within. If they are non-compliant, then we have every right to destroy them, then and there. Roger. 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 You got to stop that habit man. The captain sighted as he looked towards one of his men. What? I can't get rid of it, especially since it is something that was engraved into my coding before the transfer. It has become a distinct part of myself. The one that was still a bit glitchy due to the transfer process. Kept this way of response, and it would come up every now and then. Not that it even mattered all too much. Okay. On the count of 3-1, the captain started. 2-3. One of the more aggressive and very active members called out, before bursting through the floor that was extremely hardened and protected heading upwards. Damn it. Follow after him. Go, go, go. The captain again called out, as while this may reflect on his ability to lead there are also times people within the military act like this. Especially those that are especially influenced by the chemicals streaming through their system making them more aggressive and sometimes even disobedient. Of course, they would be completely obedient to the Emperor, but this is not here and now. The men followed after the first, and there seemed to a massive amount of conflict for when they came through the lights had been turned off. This made it all the more harder for people to see, unless the Yu's and Vong had a way to blast through the fog of darkness, which they did. But, the Emperor and men as well had a way to see through the darkness as well, indicating that they are currently facing off against many, many people. The Yu's and Vong had a strange weapon, capable of using multiple and varied attack methods, and one of the most important was its spitting venom or more likely poison attack. Amphistaffs were genetically engineered serpentine creatures that served as the primary anti-personnel weapons of the Yu's and Vong. This is exactly the weapon the squad had to face off against, as they were sprayed down from every possible angle. It was like the Yu's and Vong were in wait after they had exposed themselves. Not that they would give up now, for the damage is minimal to their armor. It was like acid, slowly working its way against the very resistant and advanced materials. That went into enhancing the marines' power armor. In exchange, the squad started to rely on their very own weaponry, which consisted of energy weapons that were much more advanced than the average blaster. Die. Palpatine was a skilled manipulator and strategist, having orchestrated countless events in the galaxy including the Naboo and Separatist crises, as well as the Clone Wars, in order to secure a position of power, which largely went according to plan. In the rare times that something occurred during those events that he did not initially plan for, 
he usually took the setback into account and reworked his plan to succeed regardless. This trait of improvisation was especially evident with Queen Amidala's successful arrival on Coruscant during the Naboo Crisis, which forced him to rework his plan from using Amidala as a martyr and drawing out the crisis long enough to consolidate power, to instead having Amidala act as a witness to the events of the Trade Federation occupation to dethrone then-Supreme Chancellor Finis Valorum. Upon his ascension to Galactic Emperor, he modified his transmissions via hologram to appear several times bigger than himself to the extent that the only part of him that actually appeared in his transmissions was his head. This was done for two reasons. The first was to intimidate his subordinates, and the second was as a means to easily hide aspects occurring in the room from subordinates that he did not wish for them to know prior to his ascension and reorganization of the Galactic Empire. However, Palpatine utilized holographic communications the standard way, both in his public persona and as Sidious. Despite his exceptional skills in lightsaber combat and his mastery of the dark side, Sidious was no less susceptible to fear, one of the primary emotions of the dark side than any other Sith. Sidious could fake fear easily, which lead to him also easily convincing, and having the young, incumbent Jar Jar Binks come under his command. Who would have thought the Buffin had the capability to use the Force and be protected by it in such a manner? Of course, the Force wasn't actually protecting Jar Jar, but instead it was Jar Jar instinctively using the Force to his advantage to combat his innate clumsiness and his vacuity. Since Palpatine was in no position to reveal his Sith identity until the right time, he was forced to refrain from using his Force powers to protect himself while in an extremely dangerous situation that presented considerable risk to his life. Fear ultimately proved to be the Emperor's Achilles heel, as it caused him to constantly plot and devise schemes against his enemies, which ultimately would have led to the creation of the Rebel Alliance, and the eventual downfall of his empire. In this timeline however, Palpatine feared Anakin Skywalker more so than he did before. What he represented, his power and his position within life, which lead to him doing things that are stupid, hindering his abilities within the Force, but also from properly advancing his plans. Despite his status as pure evil, he did have reservations towards certain actions. The Emperor would have been ashamed to use such tactics as illusions calculated to break someone emotionally. Palpatine is a person deeply flawed, so much so that one shouldn't even consider as a person, but an animal that should be slaughtered. Even then, Palpatine shouldn't be considered even that for even animals are better than him. Since his youth, Darth Sidious was focused only on the acquisition of power and wore the identity of Palpatine like a mask in order to advance his career and reach a position of power in the Republic. As a young man and ambassador at large for Naboo, he evidently found it useful to make it appear that he was in an amorous mood when it suited him, for he was known to the people closest to him, such as Vida Kim and Kim Mandoriana as a ladies' man. Always focused on the grand plan and the takeover of the Republic, Palpatine appeared, in his words, always eager to make friends using flirtation as a tool to advance his agenda of gaining political power. As Galactic Emperor, Palpatine surrounded himself with concubines at the Imperial Court, and at least one of them claimed to have been, at the very least, physically involved with him. In fact, most who claimed intimacy with the Emperor did so out of a desire to position themselves as power brokers. The legal details of a potential Emperor's wedding were specifically included in Imperial law, and in fact specified that the bride would forfeit her rights and become the groom's property. The reason for this is probably something to do with Anakin, with Anakin having many brides, wives and lovers himself. Anakin has everything that Palpatine wants or wanted, but Palpatine himself may not even consider what Anakin has to be something he wants, other than his power and position. The lovers may just be an extra to him in the grand scheme of things. The dark side of the Force is a pathway to many abilities. Some considered to be unnatural, is a phrase Palpatine would use in description of the dark side, or even his own abilities. Trained to perfection by Darth Plagueis, Darth Sidious was considered by many to be the most powerful Sith Lord in the entire history of the Sith Order, something he himself firmly believed. Additionally, he was the only Sith Lord in a thousand years to achieve the ultimate goal of the Sith, to eradicate the Jedi Order and bring the galaxy under the rule of the Sith. He was also considered the one Force user to have successfully tamed the dark side of the Force, exceeding even that of Ulic Keldroma. Of course, just because he is a Sith Lord that did Sith things the best, didn't mean he is the most powerful Force sensitive ever. Even before him, there are beings that could be considered more powerful than Palpatine, like the existence of the one's family that included the daughter, the son and the father. 
Then there are other individuals that could be considered more powerful as well, for example Darth Revan. However, that doesn't mean any of these people managed to do anything similar to what Palpatine has accomplished. After all, all, except that blasted, infernal emperor and emperor. Palpatine thought to himself very often, constantly comparing himself to Anakin, his powers, abilities, status, loved ones, loved, respected and possibly even feared by the people all at the same time. To Palpatine, Anakin has everything or at least it looks like he does. And even more so he barely had any really powerful adversaries to go up against him. The only possible candidates being himself, the Jedi Order or some unknown factor like the Yuuz and Vong. At least I can take solace in the fact that I have at least reached the same level as that despicable being. Palpatine thought to himself often as well, which began after his ascension as Emperor of the Galactic Empire. Within Hut space, the Emperor and armies alongside the Yuuz and Vong armies were hard at it as they were trying to trump against each other's forces. At first, it seemed as if the Yuuz and Vong were managing to forge a path forward as their living biological ships managed to start beating out some of the advancing smaller ships of the Emperor. Over time, however, one could tell that more and more, that the Yuuz and Vong were starting to be on the losing end. Their aggression in trying to absolutely destroy every single piece of tech from the Emperor made sure that their progress is slowed. General Grievous had taken it upon himself to see this battle, this skirmish between the two sides right to the end, and it most certainly is nearing its end. Much debris could be seen floating out in the vast expanse known as space, going from place to place. Emperor and fighters zoomed past such debris, still continuing to push back the alien menace known as the Yuuz and Vong. The Yuuz and Vong, on the other hand, had a hard time now that most of their more aggressive vessels are being pushed back. Not that the Emperor hasn't suffered losses themselves, leading to the Yuuz and Vong being one of the forces having down some of the most damage to the Emperor's forces since ever. What one has to take into account however is the fact that the Emperor is within hut space, alongside having taken and used their armies in use of this battle. So most of the things created by the Emperor has taken a back seat, and instead most of the losses can be considered to have come from the hut's wealth instead. Some of the ships used by the Yuuz and Vong were already starting to be categorized and taken into their laboratories for study, as soon as the Emperor could their hands on such things. The Yoriket, referred to as a Karolskapa, was the Yuuz and Vong version of a starfighter. The Mayad Rock warship was a Yuuz and Vong bio-engineered capital starship, and the rough analog to an Imperial-class star destroyer. The Core Chok was a battleship analog used by the Yuuz and Vong. Yorick Stronger were bio-ships used by the Yuuz and Vong that resembled asteroids. The Yorick Vek assault cruiser was an assault cruiser used by the extragalactic Yuuz and Vong. The A Vek Yilyunu was a type of Yuuz and Vong capital ship, designed to deploy a large force of the alien fighter craft known as Karolskapas, and various referred to as a carrier analog, fighter carrier, or skip carrier. Then there were the various other ships, that the scientists and engineers under the Emperor used the Yuuz and Vong language they had decoded to make best use of their current biological technology. Discovering the names of the ships, their functions and capabilities, furthering their own knowledge, and allowing an evolution of many things within their own knowledge. Explosions occurred, results from the aftermath of the battle, as it was also still raging on as well. There was no telling when the Yuuz and Vong would go into retreat already. The Yuuz and Vong hadn't even brought their full forces, fully aware that hut space is the least guarded place within the Emperor borders. One of the main reason the Yuuz and Vong attacked this place is exactly because of this. But even with bringing a considerable chunk of their developed forces, they were still losing, and on the verge of a lose overall. Ships zoomed through space, and as it is usually hard to perceive things within space, obviously they were relying heavily on other sources of light, for example, the massive ships throughout the area. For the Emperor, their ships are avoiding one ship in particular, the world ship that contains some of their soldiers within, especially since they are unable to receive any signals or messages from within, only knowing that they are still alive and well. The world ship acted as more than just a colonial transport ship, alongside being a semi-military base with various facilities within, to keep their species alive. One of the main reasons of bringing this ship is due to the need to hurry up and colonize a planet already. Most of the things under their control is not enough for them to start on a mass scale, gathering an army to invade the galaxy. Grievous knew of this as well, due to the level of information he has access to. He is able to know that the Yuuz and Vong should not be ready for another few years now. In fact, they shouldn't even be a thing until around 40 years from now, give or take a few years. Anyway, 
That world ship that the Emperor and Synth Marine Squadron have entered is a way to finally end the battle once and for all. Well, maybe not once and for all overall, but for now it would make the Yuuz and Vong take a step back, consider their next steps carefully. If one could describe the scene, then it would be chaos. Chaos is thriving as of this moment whereupon the delicate balance of all things that are good and evil, have come to a standstill. The Emperor, the Yu and Vong, and absolutely everyone and everything else, have been slightly influenced in this direction. Of course, no one knows exactly that they are being influenced as small and insignificant as it is. Even those that aren't directly influenced, like Anakin would still be unable to tell or link it back, because Anakin's powers have progressed to a point that it becomes something within the background, especially with everything else that is going on distracting him. Back towards the battle taking place, Grievous did finally receive some form of communication from the squadron upon the Yuuz and Vong living workshop. Sir, they those on the living ship sir they, say that they have successfully taken it over, and it is slowly towards our area. They say they can't control it, and it seems like they can't make it off on time as well. One of the information officers told Grievous as he adopted a grave look on his face. Shoot the ship down, Grievous ordered, with some hesitating due to the order given. E, but, sir, no buts. The men on board can be revived, don't forget that. As for their people within, you have received information that they wouldn't stop, haven't you? Now do as I say, take the ship down. Grievous is entirely prepared to do so. Also knowing that those men would be receiving their very own newly cultivated bodies as well. Instances of this have happened before, in the event a marine was to die. Their soul and consciousness is luckily saved by Anakin, as long as their connection isn't severed. What are you waiting for? Do it now. This scared everyone into action, as the next second they started to blast the ship having relayed what they were doing to the men on board. Their responses varied, with one even going as far to say that they were tiring of the body they were given, saying that they wished to be a woman instead. It was possible to do this after all, and the process of choosing one's body wasn't easy as well, especially since they were just robots with souls and no gender before. The Yuuz and Vong ship exploded as it was charging towards the Emperor and Hut fleet trying to take them down with them. The ship is of course stopped and explodes before reaching them, whereupon the Emperor would probably get next to none in terms of data from the leftover living ship. The Jedi were staying, and there is nothing Ahsoka could do about it. Or at least that is one of the options within her thoughts, otherwise she would be still trying to tell them to leave already. Ahsoka had also stopped and stayed to meet up with the other three coming her way, Xana, Barris, and Shark. Out of the three of them, Ahsoka was most worried about what Barris would say. But it was Xana that seemed the angriest at her. The four of them now are walking throughout the entirety of the Jedi Exile District underneath prepared to do what they are going to do to save them. Why do I have to save some stupid Jedi? Xana asked this question. That was supposed to be rhetorical. However, that is because Arnie said so. Barris nodded her head here, as if everything Anakin says is her very own will. Arnie, Arnie didn't say to save them. It is this pipsqueak here that said to do it. He is just following along with her visions. Xana pointed towards Ahsoka, whom is in fact taller than her, but still called her small anyway. Her, huh, I am tall now. Ahsoka indicated pointing towards the differences between herself and the others. Specifically towards how she is taller than both Barris and Xana now. But in comparison with Shark, she is still considered shorter. After all, Shark is a great 1.9 meters tall. Which is of course including her crowed head, symbolic of their species of Togruta. Shark came to a stop. Something is wrong. She sensed something is off, as they were planning to further along their plans of making sure the Jedi left. It would seem that something is going to go wrong. Or something has already gone wrong, and they are too late to stop it. The other three stopped looking towards Shark, waiting for her to continue what she meant, and as Shark started, there is most certainly something wrong. How do you guys not sense the stillness in the force? It is dash she is interrupted by an explosion. Explosion after explosion, causing rubble and debris from various undercity buildings, whether they be ruins or now in ruins, started to cause massive amounts of panic. The Jedi started to try and see what was going on, as the place above themselves started to collapse, leading to the roof starting to fall, and squash many of the Jedi underneath the metal. The four girls started to go into action, just as the Jedi walking these streets also went into action as well, to make sure to save as many people as they could. Xana was grumbling along the way as well, for she didn't or doesn't like what she is doing, but would do so anyway. At Anakin's request, it would seem like she would do anything, 
making her not far off from the way Barris acted. Instead, Xana and Barris were two sides of the same coin, where one is supposedly good, but harbors strange obsessive desires. That isn't too bad, she keeps hidden from Anakin. Not that he doesn't already know anyway. Then there is Xana, whom doesn't hide away those things, and openly shares her desire to have him to herself, but accepting the situation as such anyway. Those that were not already married to him at this point, were going to officiate things anyway. Moving to the side, Barris saves a Jedi Padawan, whom was struggling to keep afloat a metal pipe from falling onto themselves. Xana is saving people as well, but in a much more aggressive manner. Whilst Shark gathered the Jedi whom recognized her, and had them follow her instructions. Whilst Ahsoka's task is to do some little help here and there, but to focus on getting to a specific location that is of importance. I need to hurry. Ahsoka started to get flash upon flashes of her visions, and they started to overlap with reality, and she felt powerless to it all. Of course, she knew that with them here, they are making a hug difference to the people dying. But it isn't enough. I got to get to that thing. She screamed internally, moving as fast as she could. Xana was aggressively saving people, but stumbled across a rather interesting sight. As buildings collapsed and the root of the Undercity started to crumble, she saw whom is the likely suspect to this event taking place, and they are most certainly not hiding their presence at all. You there, she called out towards the hooded individual. This individual turned around, their own red lightsaber ignited and ready for combat having just slain multiple Jedi in front of themselves. Interesting, it was a male voice. Xana ignited her own lightsaber, and its blaring red light was significantly different from the other. You are making me look bad with my beloved, so you are unfortunately going to have to die. Xana stated this as matter of fact, and as she said so, other red lightsabers appeared out of the darkness with several other Sith coming out as well. She stared at them all, ready for the fight to come. Leaping into the air, Xana starts her attack, unafraid of her multiple opponents. Destruction, chaos and death. All things happening as of this moment as Ahsoka makes her way past the Jedi Exile's current place of residence being attacked and heads to other areas. Specifically to another area that goes even further down, deeper into the abyss of the Undercity. How does he even have the time to set up something like that anyway? Here of all places as well. Right underneath everyone's noses Ahsoka thought to herself about Anakin, whom had told her of how he could help. It is now that everyone would need it as well. With Dooku now in orbit of Coruscant, having taken forces to distract a lot of the military Palpatine has access to, and paving their way forward towards here, she believed that this was their chance to convince the Jedi to leave for now, retreat and regather themselves if they really wanted to. That plan came crashing down as soon as the rest of the Undercity section the Jedi was staying in came crashing down as well. Ahsoka was now away from the area everyone else is at and she had been receiving some message, telepathically through the diet from the others. They had discovered that they could do this. Through using Anakin as the medium they also could talk to each other as they could him. Going deeper and deeper down, Ahsoka would not be pleased that she is within an area that seems to reek within the Force. Reek of the dark side of the Force, whereupon she is trying to discover the device set up here on Coruscant. The teleportation device that was set up everywhere within the Emperor, known as the Stargate, is also set up here as well. I really do want to know just how he managed to do this. He is too mysterious sometimes Ahsoka thought to herself again, not running out of breath, for she has trained to a certain level in physical fitness. Passing by several people that seem to have been mutated or changed in many ways, toxic gas in the air and poisonous substances at seemingly every corner, she even started to wonder why he would set it up here of all places. Of course, she is just complaining internally, but now that she is here, she can open up and activate the Stargate, allowing Anakin and however else that has access to come through. Above Ahsoka, way above herself, there is a fight going on in space around Coruscant and its system. Dooku is taking care of and distracting the fleets, but as he does so he starts to consider what he is feeling through the Force. A warning of some sort Dooku thought to himself, sensing some sort of dissonance within the Force, warning him of some incoming and impeding threat. I want the armies to start trying to deploy on the planet immediately. Dooku commanded, and the droids he is accompanied by obliged these orders. The stark difference between the armies of the Emperor and everyone else, is that their droids are not living. Some could say they are unliving, something akin to the undead, but not the same as they are artificial. Dooku's small army for now is enough to hold off against all of the current forces of Palpatine's before anyone else gets here to back them up. It would be an hour or so from now that others would start appearing. But for Dooku, 
that feeling was telling him otherwise. Ships were fighting within space, Doku's artificial intelligence controlled ships alongside living pilots as well. Doku had taken to trying to recruit people who are skilled enough for the job, and he was successful in doing so. However, that meant there would be more death and destruction to those that decide to join up and start a rebellion against the Emperor. Even more so, there is something of greater significance for Dooku, and that is the fact he wants to now help Anakin in doing more than what he is doing now. Dooku didn't just come here to put up with the Jedi and their backward ways, nor did he help just from the sense of duty one feels towards protecting life as a whole. No, he is doing this in hopes of not only help the Jedi and the Republic, but merging these two things into the Emperor in itself. Sir, there have been reports that the Emperor have won their battle against the unknown force of individuals known as the Yuuzhan Von. After winning, it seems like the forces have gone back to deal with any rebellious factors within Hut space, and then there are the Yuuzhan Von whom are heading this way. A living being, a human came up to Dooku and explained, giving a report. Is that so? Dooku asked a rhetorical question. Yes, sir. The information's officer answered anyway. Thinking to himself, Doku started to delve into the force to see whether or not this means anything to him at all. What he finds is the same feeling he was having in this instance, a warning that there is more bloodshed and pain to come. We will stay. Doku decided, not wanting to retreat as of this moment, and deciding that this needs to be done. Doku not only wants his revenge against his master, but also wants to help Anakin as well, for he has done things for him unintentionally but also shown him things that he may have been blind to before. He berated himself at those times, for while he mocked the Jedi and the Republic, he too was also in the same position as them as well. He was also being used by the Sith Lord for their own purposes. And while Dooku most certainly could see where Sidious was coming from before, now now, Dooku didn't consider himself a Sith anymore. But nor did he consider himself a Jedi either, for now he will be with the Emperor. It is there that there is proper things for Force Sensitives, but for everyone, for the common person, their health, their safety is put above everything else. Something that Palpatine didn't value not one bit. But it seemed, and evidence pointed towards Anakin caring a lot about these people. So much so, that he would go on to create droids to do things considered potentially lethal. But of course, he also wasn't about to just restrict what people could do as well. There is some sort of balance within the Emperor and that Dooku finds himself at peace with, but at the same time that peace is only given because of his passion to create it. Thus, he stays here now, believing and knowing that if even he dies, doing everything within his power to make sure that Anakin and the Emperor consumes the Republic, Empire and whatever else under itself. It is only through them, that Dooku believes that things can be done right. Only through Anakin. Where are you going? Xana called out as she saw a few of the Sith leave, either not wanting to get involved in fighting her, or believing that only a few would be enough to put a stop to her. You are a Sith. One of the four sensitives under Palpatine asked, their faces covered, hidden behind a veil. Maybe, maybe not. However, I am here for another purpose today, and that is to make sure that I either save these Jedi from death, or prevent you guys from killing them. Which would mean I would have to use some lethal force. Believe me when I say this, but you guys would have at least stood a small chance against me if you all stayed. But now Xana is taunting them, and as they are confused, it would only further increase whatever negative feelings they are having right now against the Jedi. Xana wanted to redirect that attention onto herself. So be it. One of the Sith said, going in for the kill, striking against Xana with all of their might, but only failing in the end. Xana easily managed to surprise the Sith, striking out herself and landing a blow that immediately decapitated the person. You guys are relatively untrained and only rely on the power of the dark side. How quaint. Xana smiled a beautiful smile, enchanting as it is, but for the Sith around are angry, not feeling anything else, designed to hate. One after the other, the Sith worked in unison to try and strike Xana down, but she was easily able to manipulate the flow of the battle. Her lightsaber flashing red and orange, further demonstrating just how powerful her abilities are when it comes to lightsaber combat. You guys are laughably easy. Were you guys just born yesterday? She raised an eyebrow in a taunt, making sure that they remained trying to strike her down, so she could strike them down in return. Die. I'll kill you. Many voices of these beings, both masculine and feminine in nature, tried to strike her down. And when Xana started to sense their actual strength, it is no wonder that they are able to kill the Jedi. Their level of strength physically is way above the norm, and it is through her own abilities and her connection through the Dyad she is able to deal with their combined physical prowess. 
You guys don't seem so smart. But where did your power come from is what I want to know. She looked towards the fallen Sith, and could perceive a few things that are out of place. Their skin seems too pale. Alongside all of that rotten stuff they are decomposing already Xana. Not to get distracted killed another Sith, finally coming to a conclusion about these beings in front of her. You all of you are failed projects, Hazana said aloud, which went to further anger them all. They had not learned after all, so they only further used their hate, inborn pain and all sorts of other things to try and take her down. I am no failure. I am alive and living and everything else dash. One of the people called out, but was interrupted as they started to cough up blood. Or something that looked like blood anyway, as from their nose, eyes, mouth and ears. Abomination Sidious is truly something else. Xana said this, but she at one point may have been similar to such a man. While Xana is dealing with the revelation, working even faster to kill them off, on the other hand, it is Barris that is the one helping heal and rejuvenate those that have been crushed or hurt in any manner. She is a healer after all, and her skill set, talent comes in line with those qualities. Stay still. Most of the time, Barris wasn't the most skilled or powerful within the group of Force Sensitives, but comparing her with others is something else. The person she spoke to did as she commanded, as she was successfully healing the woman. Her wounds dissipating into nothingness, as if it she wasn't injured in the first place. That will do for now. You will still feel weak however, as I can't just magically create blood for you to get your system working at full capacity. I would suggest trying to find somewhere to hide. Barris explained to the woman. The woman in turn nodded her head. Thank you Dash she coughed a little but stood up with a little effort and started to head in another direction. Seemingly going towards somewhere important, but that isn't what Barris is focused on. She is instead sensing her surroundings to make sure there is no one else around. That needs her immediately help. I wanted to go with Ahsoka to meet up with Arnie. She pouted internally, knowing about the Stargate underneath Coruscant, as it was explained to everyone. Jedi. A voice was heard, and the swinging of a lightsaber was also heard, before Barris ignited her own in defense. Who are you? Barris turned around to now face off her opponent. Oh, is is that you, Barris? The voice seemed familiar, and once getting a closer look, Barris identified the person properly. Ferris Olin. While all of the chaos is going on, the remnants of the Jedi High Council were woken up to the disturbance as well. What is going on? Mace got up, as he and the rest of the Council were discussing how they would be going about things from here on out. Rushing outside, along with everyone else that would be surprised to discover that the refuge for the Jedi exiles is no longer a refuge, but a war zone. The view before them was total destruction of the housing district they were within, even more so when they started to hear distinct explosions off in the distance. Everything started to crumble down on top of them. They all started to go off, using the force in multiple ways to either dodge or help others doge, and evade the wreckage falling on top of themselves. More explosions could be heard off from the distance, as the Jedi High Council started to collect themselves, having been trapped in. A groan is heard. Where am I? It was Obi-Wan whom got up after the disastrous fall of the ceiling, leading to him identifying that there seemed to be a few other Jedi near him as well. Not only were the Jedi High Council now trapped under some debris, there also seemed to be some other Jedi Knights and Padawans, that just so happened to be in the area as well, that is trapped. Where are we, you mean? Mace's voice was heard next, as some of the debris over towards Obi-Wan's left is pushed aside to reveal Mace had nearly been crushed trying to protect one of the Jedi Padawans in the area. Their abilities probably not good enough to handle what was happening next. We need to get through this it would seem that what Taino said is of some significance. Mace said as he helped the Padawan get back to their feet, and headed towards Obi-Wan, alongside the rest of the Jedi High Council members. You mean? Obi-Wan questioned, the others curious as well. We should have heeded her warning. It would seem like we have been traced back to here and discovered. It is either that, or the Sith Lord, Darth Sidious already knew of us coming here, and had already discovered this place long before us coming here. Mace explained, going over what he thought is the most probable explanation for what has just happened. Right. So we should get to work on the debris then. I am afraid of what Palpatine has planned for us then, if he has gone this far already. Obi-Wan said, with the others nodding their heads in agreement. The Jedi started to become coordinated, buried under a large amount of wreckage, needing to rely on each other to pull through and get out of this mess. The Undercity wasn't exactly the best constructed place for one to live in, even more so when it comes to defenses against attacks like this. 
While a lot of changes has been made, it isn't like anyone had the capabilities to change the entire infrastructure of the place to make it better. Not even Anakin could do so quietly, and would have needed to be open about the reformations underneath. If he were to do something like that, it was hard enough trying to make a Stargate underneath, whilst leaving it unpowered and disconnected from the normal network that linked up all of the Emperor's teleportation devices. Whilst the Jedi High Council, along with some others were dealing with their new circumstances, Shakti was the one on the outside of such debris, trying to make contact with those on the other side. Well, and here I thought that I would be able to get here on time Shark thought to herself, extending her senses beyond herself and getting a general idea of just what was happening behind the fallen wreckage and debris before her. This was the location the Jedi High Council was given to talk and discuss things about what to do next, already set up this way due to the Jedi Exiles having some time to do so. Looking around, Shark could identify that there seemed to be a lot of rubble blocking her path, and the Jedi's path from reaching each other. Not that they even knew she is here after all. And who would? No. I need to get them out already and then start to evacuate a lot of the Jedi off of the planet already. Arnie should be coming anytime soon enough, and he will take care of Palpatine, while we deal with the rescue process. Shark rethought to herself, as she went over what is supposed to happen, or what is going to happen. For, if nothing is done to help the Jedi in this instance, there is a very high possibility that a lot of them would die in this encounter. The Force itself was trying to fix the timeline in her indirect way, trying to make sure things still go in the direction at once. However, things were not going perfectly, and in a response to delay the inevitable, trying to rush it is only making it come faster. Relying on the Force is sort of a double-edged sword, for while in general it won't and can't really do anything, it does have influence over those that use it. Especially those that are powerful within the Force, as their wills are directed even more so powerfully by it. There is a reason why the original Anakin Skywalker turned to the dark side. It has more to do with the Force, then just him being subjugated and enslaved as a child, then to the Jedi, finally being enslaved by the Sith under Palpatine. It was all the purpose of the Force after all, and his creation was a reaction against what Palpatine, or more like his former master tried to do, thus leading to the creation of Anakin and the subsequent fall of the Jedi Order, then rise of the Sith under Palpatine. Hello Shark tried to see first if anyone would be able to communicate with her through normal means. While some things hadn't changed in the Undercity, the fact that it was hard to rely on communication devices is still present, so any form of normal communication is restricted or cut off completely. There was some movement, and then some sound could just be heard by her. Who is it? It is me, Shark T. Shark called back, making sure to project her voice through the voice, so that they may hear her. Master Shark T. The voice, muffled as it was, Shark could identify as Mace Windu. Is that you Windu? I have come to get you guys out of here and leave Coruscant. Shark explained herself. We are not leaving here, and instead once we get out we are heading back towards Palpatine once and for all. Mace replied, still his voice muffled. Sighing, Shark decided that it would be easier to just explain some things once they got out of there first. Okay, let me help you guys out. But first Dash Shark was interrupted however, as there seemed to be some few extra persons surrounding her now. They were the same or different Sith individuals that Xana have come across, meaning that Shark is now in for some trouble. Who are you? One of the Sith asked, their voice sickly and downtrodden. Shark didn't reply, but spoke once more to the Jedi within the rubble. I am sorry, but it seems like there are some individuals outside with me now getting in my way. You guys get to work on this place, and I will deal with them. There was no response back, other than a faint sound of the Jedi within the rubble, getting to work on moving the massive wreck. Whilst they were doing so, Shark turned her attention towards her new opponents. It is good that I have some opponents. I needed to know just how much I have improved for sparing with Arnie doesn't give me a clear enough answer. Seeing how fast I defeat the lot of you however what she said is true, but at the same time it is a taunt against her opponents. The Sith didn't respond and instead just went in for the kill, trying to make sure they kill every Jedi they see made all the more easier by their physical capabilities. In one swift, sweeping motion with her own lightsaber, Shark managed to twirl and commit to killing many of them. That was easy, she thought to herself, 
but didn't allow herself to get too distracted and focused on making sure to be rid of her current opponents as fast as she can. After all, more and more are coming and making their way over towards this area. She sensed it, maybe I would appreciate some help. Not that Should is unable to deal with this herself, but it would make it easier if the Jedi would hurry up and get out already. Palpatine, within the Jedi Temple is enjoying himself as it is today that things would or should be going accordingly with his plans. Everything is now going back on track. Sidious thought to himself going over all of the events that has happened so far, and his rise to his current position within this life. Sire, there seems to have been a problem with the Yuz and Vong fleets. They are making their way back over here after being defeated by the Emperor. But reports have also shown that the Emperor has a lot of their fleet as well. A person entered, bowed and made sure to be as respectful and fearful as possible when facing Palpatine. Everything is proceeding as I have foreseen. Palpatine said this line to himself rather than the person whom had entered. You may leave and send a message out towards my people, my empire. That we are on the verge of a new age. Palpatine wants to cement his rule and has been doing so through the use of many assassins, clones made and being used by him for short periods of time to take care of the leaders in positions that go against him. It hadn't even been that long now, since he had sent them out to deal with both the Jedi and his other problems, and they are already having results. Yes, sire, this person seemed to be an ass kisser, but their ability to please Palpatine was and is at an all-time high. After the reporter came and left, Palpatine was left alone again to watch Coruscant as the sun sets right into the night. Its beauty not exactly unparalleled, but definitely one of the most beautiful things to view within the known galaxy. Palpatine's face, old, wrinkled and deathly pale, screamed of his state of abomination. His entire presence screamed his totality within the Force, for he imagines himself to be and is the dark side of the Force. I am the dark side of the Force. I am evil in Incarnate. I am darkness. Palpatine reinforced within himself that he is the embodiment of evil and the dark side of the Force. You know what? I haven't meditated in quite a while so maybe I should check Palpatine left his thoughts there before settling himself down within the Jedi Temple. Delving deep within the Force, Palpatine intended to make sure his connection and declaration of being the new and improved embodiment of the dark side was still there. However what is this? What is surprising to Sidious? is that his presence within the Force had somehow been diminished, somehow making him something and someone that isn't all that powerful. What Sidious didn't realize, however, is that he is being taken on a trip down into his subconscious and within the Force itself. It seems like it had something to show him, and Sidious had no way to go against such a pull. Are you still with me, Plague Ace? Yes, I detect that you are, though barely. I actually thought you would die on Sojin, and you would have if the hut hadn't tipped you off to Varuna's scheme. And yet that also turned out for the best, if it's any consolation. I'm being honest when I say that I could not have succeeded without you. But now I've no need for Palpatine said as he was brought back to a memory of his past self, overlooking his dead mentor's grave. I have more to do what the risk of discovery might not allow me to do, while I execute the rest of the grand plan. Growing an army, fomenting rebellion and fabricating intergalactic war, quarreling the Jedi and catching them unawares rest easy in your grave, Plagueis. In the end, I will be proclaimed Emperor. The Sith will have had their revenge, and I will rule the galaxy. Sidious finished wrapped around the dark side, however Palpatine is brought back to that same darkness, before him a figure so grand and mighty that he couldn't hope to compare himself to. Who are you? Sidious called out, readying himself, shooting lightning at this dark figure that caused him to feel immense fear. I am your nihility. The dark figure spoke back, before a massive force is felt and ripped right through Sidious's defenses, picking him and then crushing him beneath the weight of the Porsche. No. Yoda, more than ever started to feel he was doing something wrong, and upon reflection, he noticed things he could do better. Throughout his many years of being alive, and practicing, teaching and understanding the Force alongside all of the many aspects that come under the light, Yoda has never before been confronted in a such a manner in regards to the teachings of the Jedi. The Jedi Code, his own interactions with others, whether potentially like this or not, is still something of importance. At least it is so for himself, as he can see now the wrongs and the rights done by the Jedi Order. To his students, the elfin luminary Yoda could appear as either very strict or like a grandfatherly figure, testing them to mental and physical extremes one moment, and showing warmth the next. Students often strongly disagreed with him at first, but gradually came to understand his attitudes. Among his colleagues on the Jedi High Council, he was known to have a penchant for mischief and practical jokes. To all of the young Jedi, 
He was the humble Yoda, who offered enlightened leadership, and epitomized the ideals of the Jedi Order, a grand master of that august body. He was widely known as a sage instructor. Yoda saw many things, and he believed all of these things to be true in the manner that they would have happened. No, that they have happened, but just not in whatever facet of reality he was currently in. Although Yoda was a strict and firm leader, he deeply cared for the Jedi Order. He would have been willing to sacrifice a chance to win and neutralize Dooku by saving Anakin and Kenobi when Dooku unleashed an attack that would have killed them. Yoda saw himself also greatly grieved Anakin Skywalker's fall and Order 66, killing almost all Jedi to the point of falling to his knees. This, a fact that he lamented over in this other lifetime for a very long time, so much so that he would do nothing for the rest of his life, believing that everything would be fixed, and it would but the mentality that Yoda held as of this moment and in his future moments, alternate moments all pointed towards him being someone akin to when good men do nothing, evil prevails. He was also willing to acknowledge whenever he was proven wrong, as shown by how he humbly apologized to Jin, when the latter proved his unique wisdom was beneficial, as he had acquired the ability to retain identity, for having doubted him, and acknowledged that he was a great Jedi, despite a body of evidence to the contrary, which included famous names such as Ulic Keldroma, Os Willem, and Revan, Yoda was largely a traditionalist in his belief that a Jedi who was seduced by the dark side of the Force would be forever condemned to walk in darkness. Which is another thing that he started to reflect upon whatever this delve into that Dagobah dark side cave has got him going on. It was during the Clone Wars. However, he originally believed that no Jedi was beyond redemption and forgiveness. Even after Count Dooku betrayed the Republic and the Jedi by committing numerous atrocities as the Sith Lord Darth Tyrannus, Yoda once tried to persuade his former student to let go of the dark side and return to the ways of the Jedi, and very nearly succeeded in redeeming Dooku. Even as Quinlan Vo slipped further into the dark side's embrace, Yoda had faith that the disturbed young Jedi Master would find his way back to the light side of the Force. Unlike Dooku, Vos vindicated Yoda's belief in redemption. Yoda would watch himself become a traditionalist in Jedi views over many instances, and his arbitrary judgments to also be flawed. However, Yoda's failure to redeem Dooku, as well as his inability to prevent the rise of the Galactic Empire, left the Grand Master more jaded than ever. In addition to the fall of the Republic, the Jedi Order was pushed to the brink of extinction by the fallen Jedi Knight Anakin Skywalker, whose fall to the dark side turned him into the Sith Lord Darth Vader. Having failed to protect all that he cared for, Yoda would have become disillusioned in many ways, and sought to kill the two Sith Lords at first. The chance at redemption for those who embraced the dark side was no longer an option as far as Yoda was concerned. Yoda saw himself still do nothing even at this point of conviction, which only meant that he is someone that is either unwilling or unable to do anything. Powerless, without purpose. What else is he supposed to do but retreat here to Dagobah? Throughout his exile on Dagobah, the tyranny of the Empire and the Sith, hunt for the Jedi during the Great Jedi Purge embittered Yoda, to the point where he lost all faith in the idea of redemption. In his exile, Yoda held no interest in being involved with the rest of the galaxy, seeing himself as more of a watcher of the events which unfolded during the Empire's rule. Before his foreseen death, he would have warned Vader's son, Luke Skywalker, that when a person falls to the dark side, their destiny would forever be dominated by darkness Yoda spoke an unusual version of basic. He tended to place verbs, especially auxiliaries after the object and subject, an example of Yoda's speech pattern. When 900 years old you reach, look as good you will not. Most agreed that this pattern of speech was convoluted, and while it seems as though others of his species, like Yaddle, had the same penchant for rearranging sentences, not all of them did, like Vandertokka. As suggested, Anakin at one point had pointed out that Yoda purposefully chose to speak like this, so that people would have to listen attentively to what he said. Of course, he said this exactly to Yoda, whom didn't agree or disagree to that notion. Some other, less important factors that make up Yoda is that he walked with the aid of a cane later in life, although he was capable of throwing it aside and moving nimbly while using the force. One of his canes was a gift from the Wookiees. His rare Gaima cane contained nutrients that could sustain him were he to chew on it. He also used a hover chair for moving around the temple quickly and more efficiently. Another item unique to Master Yoda was a blissel, an instrument similar to a pan flute which he wore around his neck while on Dagoba. During the short Clone Wars, he would often make use of a kybik given to him by a Wulwurika princess from Kashyyyk as a gift. 
Yoda also had a unique crest that adorned his quarters. Yoda's origins were secretive, and he never revealed his home world to anyone. Right now, Yoda is on a path of serious self-reflection, whilst Anakin had left him here to do so. What is it exactly that I am supposed to discover here again? Yoda thought to himself, being brought even more so to other parts or timelines, futures or whatever manner of differences there are and could be. Yoda was not just shown the possibilities of the first, but others that could turn out worse, even being shown the flaws of the Jedi from the past as well. Of course, for contrast Yoda is even brought over to the dark side of the Force, where they have cookies Yoda saw the Sith for who they are, their evil, their potential, but also saw Sith that are not exactly the bright and shining examples of what the Sith are as well. Everything shown to Yoda is done so to make sure he understands everything about the Force and its nature of duality. The final and last place Yoda is brought to is a place that could be said to be the start of the Jedi and the Sith. In the light, there is a darkness and in the darkness, a light. It is the way with us all. Be a prisoner of neither Bogan nor Ashla. Strive to live in balance. As Titan itself teaches us, it is dangerous to do otherwise. And the danger is there always. A voice spoke, and Yoda turned around to see a human man speak to him. Delving deep into the Undercity, we once again rejoin Ahsoka as she has finally made her way through the depths and into the place she is supposed to be at. A place that would allow her to hopefully get the help that she wanted. But at the same time she is feeling anxious as well. What I saw in the visions, Ahsoka thought to herself, feeling a bit off about the entire situation. Of course, what she felt most anxious about was the first and last visions she had gotten, which the first included a mysterious black hole of some kind that she felt immense existential fear from. Whilst the other, I think it may be best to not think about that right now, and focus on the immediate problem. She thought to herself, sensing that something is both right and wrong about her current circumstance. Looking around, she noticed that there are markings of several things, indicating that there was or is in the area she is in now. She can also sense that she has actually been followed as well, which definitely stumped her as she was sure she wasn't but it would seem that she is wrong. Who are you? Come out now. Ahsoka called out, as she also spotted the Stargate covered up behind some kind of specialized cloak. Many figures came out from the darkness, which from Ahsoka's perspective, was not as dark as it would be to others. Her eyesight enhanced pierced right through the darkness, and allowed her to get a better look of those that are now surrounding her. I warn you all now. Turn back now, and you shall not face my wrath. Ahsoka said this in a steely cold voice, making sure that her point is heard loud and clear. None of them answered, and instead just straight went in for the kill. Ahsoka, prepared had her very own lightsabers ignited, come to life, and start to defend herself against these abominations. Within the Force itself, they are dying and are not meant to be, giving off a similar vibe to the living droids from the Emperor, where their midi-chlorians are starting to decay at a very rapid pace. Fighting, dodging and making sure to do all she could, Ahsoka started to wonder just who these people belonged to. Ahsoka was no stranger to killing at this point, and has done so a few times before, but out of everyone, she could probably be considered the one with the least deaths on her record. Thus, every time she struck one of the Sith abominations down, she visibly cringed just a little, for it was something she isn't too entirely used to or liked. However, in a lot of instances now, she has done so before, and knew why it had to be done as well. After a few minutes, some movement could be felt by everyone, as the fighting stopped for a bit. What came next was a stampede of some kind, whereupon many other beings appeared out of the darkness, and started a rampage of their own, attacking any and everyone around. Ahsoka took this distraction and ignited the Stargate switch, reigniting and empowering it to come to life. Yes, but also no, she thought to herself as she gazed around herself to see one abomination fight another. The Sith versus these other creatures of the Undercity, evolved or devolved beings gone through horrific changes through living down here for so long. Ahsoka killed these as well, but only as they came for the Sith abominations seemed to be having a hard time themselves dealing with this. Blood and gore everywhere, Ahsoka made a barrier so she wouldn't get dirty herself. I at the very least want to be presentable before Sky Guy after all she may have thought to herself but would never openly admit this if she is asked about it. More and more death, and as the gate came online, many of the inhabitants, plus the Sith abominations, also seem to have felt something coming through the portal. No one exactly stopped what they are doing at the moment, 
but definitely they all prepare to flee as soon as possible. There were even a few smart ones that decided to leave the area as soon as possible. Things have claimed down, now leading to everyone still alive either being rounded up, captured and taken to Palpatine, or they have been in hiding. Not all of the Jedi were killed down in the Undercity, instead being brought back to Palpatine, taken prisoner for some more nefarious purposes. Look at you all, here before me, humbled and most certainly scared. Are you all not? Palpatine's voice traveled throughout the Jedi Temple as he gazed at his various disciples and Jedi prisoners. Unfortunately for Palpatine, or fortunate to those of you that goes against him, again depending on perspective, there just so happened to be no one of great importance among the captives. No Jedi High Council members, or any of their special helpers that come from the Emperor. Laughing manically to himself, in full show to all of those captured within the Jedi Temple, Palpatine couldn't help himself. What brings him the greatest of joys is different from the joys of others, even when he is supposedly not finished in his game plans right now. Your Jedi compatriots have no choice now but to willingly come here and surrender themselves, said Palpatine. But obviously there is more to his plan, than just capturing a few Jedi and then leading the rats out of their hidey hole. The other Sith within also joined in Palpatine's humorous mood, laughing themselves, coughing and hacking up blood for not all of his creations are of actuality. Unfortunately, not many of Darth Sidious's experiments would get to live very long, for many of them would die within either hours or days to come. Their sole purpose in life to serve their Dark Lord, Darth Sidious, and carry out his will and orders even at the deterioration of their own lives. Now, we wait. Palpatine said, looking towards the Jedi, his subordinate units, and his apprentices. A lot of his military forces have had to diverge from their current expeditions upon noticing that their core planet of Coruscant is under siege by Dooku and a small fleet. Of course, Sidious didn't worry too much, especially when he has received news that the Yuuz and Vong are also coming this way. They are after all the key to his success in foiling, stopping and harming the military might of the Emperor, whilst the Galactic Empire remains unharmed and ready to strike out against all those that go against him. Thankfully, I also have contacts within Hut space as well. The Emperor may control them like a puppet state, but they are foolish to believe that they are able to stop any and all dissent from within. Sidious thought to himself, believing that the Huts right now should be creating more of an uproar, most likely trying to take back their own stolen territories with whatever forces they may have built up since their subjugation. What a wonderful ally they are useful puppets. They are Palpatine never really cares about allies and stuff like that, preferring that he rules over them all. And once he is able to do so, he would immediately annex the hearts and place himself in power. Stop right there. Release those Jedi. Sith. Mace entered the building, alongside a few others as well. Meaning that a few other Jedi Masters from the Jedi High Council, alongside Shakti as well. Other Jedi that were not captured, killed or otherwise missing in action, have been shipped off of the planet already and headed towards the Emperor. How nice of you to join us, Jedi Master Windu. And look, you brought along your friends as well, and what is this? Palpatine moves his vision over towards Shark. Is the Emperor getting involved as well? Is the Emperor and Emperor allying themselves with the renegade criminals of the Galactic Empire? Sidious is obviously taking advantage of the situation to its fullest, where on full display, he has set up multiple ways to broadcast what is happening. He needs to fabricate evidence of the Emperor standing up against the Galactic Empire and thus allowing him to take full advantage of his position of power, easily being able to persuade and probably blackmail others into his service against the Emperor if need be. But the emotional fallout should be significant enough as within the Galactic Empire. Sidious is the one in control of the media, allowing him to portray things any which way he would like it to. Even if his citizens and people don't trust him, they wouldn't know any better anyway. Don't worry, Sheev Palpatine, as your end is near, said Shark, making sure that even though heard, she used specific words that could be taken in any way possible. She is after all another empress within the Emperor, and any actions she takes could harm the reputation of the Skywalker household in some manner. Not that it would matter much within the Emperor, but instead matter a lot for those outside of it, as its reputation would be of utmost importance to draw and pull in those from the outside in. And how do you mean that? Sidious asked, slightly irritated that his full name was used, but didn't show it. That is enough of your games, Sith Lord Darth Sidious. The Jedi Order will destroy you and all you stand for, freeing the Republic, 
Mace declared, with all of the other Jedi ready, prepared to jump into action. Is that so? Sidious looked around, seeing that it is true the few Jedi that had come were surrounding them. Have you not learned by now? As he said this, guards, droids and more Sith abominations appeared from the shadows, further cornering the Jedi in the Jedi Temple. Surrounded, Mace didn't seem worried, nor did any of the others as well. The captured Jedi at the middle stand trial here today. But it would seem that their criminal buddies have decided to crash the hearing. Palpatine still making use of such deceit, made sure to continue the facade for the people. Do the Jedi not realize that they are over? That they are nothing more than child kidnapping criminals that has done more harm than good. Maybe a long time ago, their methods were of use to the Republic. But it is obvious that they have proven to be useless. Why continue and allow these tyrants to continue as they are? Sidious played it up. But at the same time his words were and are correct, showing multiple articles by media, both under and not under his control, indicating how the treatment of the Jedi has led to many disastrous things, including the failures with multiple individuals, like the Sith of old as well. Why wouldn't Palpatine use this to advantage? The Jedi are but a gateway to the wrong, old ways of the Sith that are destructive. My way is the way of the future. Sidious didn't want an actual rebellion against just yet, especially with all the troubles cropping up within the galaxy. Having had enough, Mace called out. Release them now, Sith. Threatening me, the great and imperious Emperor of the Galactic Republic, is this the way of the Jedi? Through fear and violence, Palpatine is also slowly losing his patience as well, and would much rather get to the killing on time already. Palpatine has learned that both fear and respect are the best tools to use in positions of power like his own. He may also be loath to admit that he got this idea from Anakin Skywalker, as he originally was using just fear to fuel his sovereignty. All right, that is enough. Palpatine whispered to himself, before doing a small signal, immediately cutting off the transmission signal throughout the Galactic Empire. Now, it is time for the Jedi to die. But it is most unfortunate that the Grandmaster, Yoda, is not here as well. That would complete my dreams and then some. Palpatine motioned with his hands, building up electricity within the palms of his hands, before firing out against Mace once again. Shackling with maid glee, Sidious continued to pour down on Mace. But Mace is able to defend against this, and this prompted the Jedi to move. Getting into action, a flurry of movement is seen and heard, if from the normal perspective and point of view that is. Obi-Wan is presented with another opportunity to go up against the Sith Lady, whom seems to have taken an interest in him. Alongside him is Shark, whom has also had an interesting experience with Ventress as well. Miss me. Ventress questioned as everything started to go down once and again, with a flurry of things going on in the background. No her. Obi-Wan asked Shark. Yes. Shark answered. You two seem to want me. Is there something you would like from me? I am afraid that I cannot give away anything. Ventress ignited her own lightsabers, prepared to fight to the death. Obi-Wan ignited his own as well, prepared as well to die for the Jedi. Try and keep her alive. Shark said all of a sudden, which surprised Obi-Wan. Why? It is preferably that we return her to her proper home, possibly locking her up for some rehabilitation. Shark explained a little. Once someone's gone to the dark side, Obi-Wan at this point wasn't someone whom believed in redemption, especially more so that Yoda doesn't. No arguing right now. We should be taking care of our problem. No lethally as possible. Shark ignited her own lightsaber, prepared to face off against her same opponent. She had sort of drew with long ago. A battle, duel, long hard and fought, happened not only with Ventress being outnumbered by Obi-Wan and Shark, but also elsewhere as well. How do you like this? Palpatine stopped his chain lightning as Mace finally had some room to breath. You will be stopped. You must feel it now or maybe you don't for even I am unable to as well. But it is there and it's coming. Mace said taunting Sidious with the sense of assurance of his words. What could you ever mean? Is it your Grandmaster, Yoda? I think not. I have felt it in the Force itself, as he will not be joining me here, and is instead having another battle of his own. While Palpatine is no future seeing power, he does have some level of insight for things. And what do you know? Mace questioned ready in a stance to face off against whom is potentially one of the most dangerous Sith in existence. I know that the Grandmaster will be having a hard time, but you know how the Force is. With the Jedi, your abilities are weak and meaningless, whilst for I, the embodiment of the dark and all that is evil within the galaxy, if not the universe is powerful and meaningful. 
All the fighting now is meaningless, for in the end, it is only I that shall remain the winner. Palpatine finished, before pulling out a lightsaber of his own, ready to fight against Mace. You are extremely cocky, Sidious. What makes you think you are to be victorious? What deludes you as such? Mace asks, also playing on the emotions of his opponent, just as Sidious is trying to do the same to him. I am very well aware of your plans, Windu. It will not work against me. Palpatine waited for his opponent to launch his attack. So be it. Mace was finished with his talking, and instead delved in trying to go for the killing blow, but relied on whatever emotions Palpatine may be feeling during this duel to empower himself. All around, death, destruction and chaos is rampant, further illustrating that those with great power also inherit great responsibility. Not in the sense that they may be tied down and restricted, but may be restrained in their approach to everything they do. Jedi and Sith alike are dying left and right, for none or either side spared the massacre against their sworn enemy. The Jedi Temple, desecrated and the Sith Temple containing the Nexus underneath, started to come online again, for Palpatine has brought it back to life. Some small sparks remained, leading to Sidious taking advantage of such a thing to empower himself, quite literally. He is much more powerful here, on Coruscant, than he would be anywhere else. It is unlikely he would try to escape either, for his best chance at survival also comes from the revived dark side nexus underneath. In time, I shall be victorious. And that concludes this episode. If you enjoyed it, I'd seriously love it if you guys could leave a like on the video as it genuinely helps out so much, and it keeps me going, plus it takes only one second. That said, have a wonderful day. See you in the next one.